Section 1 of The Life of Mozart, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Life of Mozart, Volume 2, by Otto Jan. French Opera, Part 1. Mozart and his mother left Mannheim on March 14th and arrived in Paris on the 23rd, after a journey of nine days and a half. We thought we should never get through it, writes Wolfgang, March 24th, 1778, and I never in my life was so tired. You can imagine what it was to leave Mannheim and all our dear good friends there and to be obliged to exist for ten days without a single soul even to speak to. God be praised, however, we are now at our journey's end. I am in hopes that, with his help, all will go well. Today we mean to take a fiac and go to call on Grimm and Wendling. Early tomorrow I shall go to the electoral minister, Herr von Sickingen, who is a great connoisseur and lover of music, and to whom I have letters of introduction from Herr von Jemmingen and Herr Cannabich. Leopold Mozart was full of hope concerning this visit to Paris, and believed that Wolfgang could not fail to gain fame and, as a consequence, money in the French capital. He remembered the brilliant reception which had been given to him and his children fourteen years before, and he was convinced that a like support would be accorded to the youth who had fulfilled his early promise to a degree that to an intelligent observer must appear even more wonderful than his precocious performances as a child he counted upon the support and assistance of many distinguished and influential persons whose favor they had already experienced and more especially on the tried friendship of grimm who had formerly given them the benefit of all his knowledge and power and with whom they had continued in connection ever since grimm had lately passed through salzburg with two friends and was pleased to hear his amadeo as he called wolfgang he chanced to arrive at augsburg on the evening of wolfgang's concert there and was present at it without making himself known since he was in haste and had heard that wolfgang was on his way to paris leopold mozart who placed great confidence in grimm's friendship and experience had made no secret to him of his precarious position in salzburg and of how greatly wolfgang was in need of support he commended his son entirely to grimm's favor april sixth seventeen seventy eight i recommend you most emphatically to endeavor by childlike confidence to merit or rather to preserve the favor love and friendship of the baron von grimm to take counsel with him on every point and to do nothing hastily or from impulse in all things be careful of your own interests which are those of us all life in paris is very different from life in germany and the french ways of expressing oneself politely of introducing oneself of craving patronage etc are quite peculiar so much so that baron von grimm used always to instruct me as to what i should say and how i should express myself be sure you tell him with my best compliments that i have reminded you of this and he will tell you that i am right but clever as he was leopold mozart had miscalculated on several points he did not reflect that grimm had grown older more indolent and more stately and that even formerly a tact and obsequiousness had been required in order to turn the great man's friendship to account which natural as they were to himself his son never did and never would acquire he had not sufficiently realized that the attention of the public is far more easily attracted by what is strange and wonderful than by the greatest intellectual and artistic endowments 
this was peculiarly the case in paris where interest in musical performances only mounted to enthusiasm when some unusual circumstance accompanied them true such enthusiasm was at its height at the time of mozart's visit but his father could not see that this very fact was against a young man who had so little of the art of ingratiating himself with others to us it must ever appear as an extraordinary coincidence that mozart fresh from mannheim and the efforts there being made for the establishment of a national german opera should have come to paris at the very height of the struggle between italian opera and the french opera as reformed by gluck a struggle which appeared to be on the point of being fought out in neither case did his strong feelings on the subject tempt him to take an active part he maintained the attitude of a neutral observer in preparation for the tasks to which he might be appointed if we are clearly to apprehend the musical situation we must remind ourselves in order of the circumstances which had brought it about jean baptiste de lully sixteen thirty three to sixteen eighty seven a native of florence had gained such distinction by his violin playing and ballet music that in sixteen fifty two he was appointed Kapellmeister by Louis the Fourteenth, and in sixteen seventy two he received full power to establish and direct the Academie Royale de Musique. Not only was he the founder of this still existing institution, but he established by its means the grand opera in France. Faithful to the traditions of his birthplace, Florence, he kept in view the first attempts which had been made in italy to revive ancient tragedy in opera as in italy so in paris operatic performances were originally designed for court festivals lully's privilege consisted in his being allowed to give public representations of operas even of those which had been produced at court était représenté devant nous they were preceded by ballets in which the connection of the action was indicated by vocal scenes but the singing was quite subordinate to the long succession of dances in which the distinguished part of the audience and even the king himself took part dances therefore became an essential ingredient of the opera and it was the task of the poet and the composers to give them appropriate connection with the plot to this day as is well known the ballet is the special prerogative of the grand opera at paris it was not less important to maintain the reputation of the most brilliant court in the world by means of variety and magnificence of scenery costumes machinery etc in this respect also the grand opera has kept true to its traditions but whilst in italy the musical and especially the vocal element of the opera had always the upper hand in paris the dramatic element held its ground with good success it was the easier for lully to found a national opera in paris since he found a poet ready to hand in quinon who had the genius to clothe his mythological subjects in the dramatic and poetical dress of his own day to us indeed his productions seem far apart from the spirit of ancient tragedy and more rhetorical and epigrammatic than poetical in their conception but his operas or rather tragedies express truly the spirit of the age and they became more distinctively national in proportion as the reign of louis the fourteenth came to be considered as the golden age of france it was lully's task to give musical expression to the national spirit and in this he succeeded to the admiration of his contemporaries and of posterity his music is closely connected with those first attempts in italy we find none of the set forms of the later opera seria 
no regular airy, no duets, no ensembles. The words are, for the most part, simply rendered in recitative. There is sometimes a figured bass accompaniment, but even then it is not the free movement of Italian recitative, but is much more precisely apportioned, and the harmonies of the accompaniment change more frequently. When the sentiment becomes rather more elevated, a sort of compromise is effected between recitative and song. The words are rendered with a declamatory spoken accent, and not only are they strictly in time, but the harmonies are so arranged that a full orchestral chord is given to every note of the song. The melodies are therefore limited in every respect, the phrases are generally too small in compass to be well carried out, and hang loosely together without any proper design. It was difficult to develop an elaborate musical form out of such elements as these. Independent songs occur seldom, and then only in the most precise of forms, tending generally to dance melodies, airs. When several voices unite, they alternate with each other, or, if they sing together, note follows note, with only exceptionally real ensemble passages. The choruses are formed by a simple harmony in several parts, the soprano not being always appointed to give the melody. The orchestra, except in the dance music, has seldom any independent significance but simply gives the full harmony to every note of the bass. Instrumental effect is seldom aimed at, and the different instruments are only occasionally employed singly. Lully's merit chiefly consists in his having accentuated his music in a manner which suited the French language, and also in his having succeeded in throwing a certain amount of characteristic pathos into some of his passages. It is comprehensible that, at first, musical cultivation being in its infancy, this quality should be most readily felt and acknowledged. But in every art, and especially in music, it is the fate of individual characteristics to become the soonest incomprehensible, and therefore unpleasing. For this reason, the reaction against Lully's music attacked just this mode of treating the text. It was considered monotonous, tiresome, and heavy, and the isolated significant phrases, having lost their power to please, were compared with the plain song, plain chant, of church psalmody. The delivery of the vocalists, male and female, is described as dreadful, monotonous droning alternating with violent shrieks and exaggerated accent, erlo francesi. Notwithstanding all this, Lully's operas held undisputed possession of the stage during his life, and even after his death, a sure proof that his success was not merely the result of the favor personally accorded to him. The composers whose operas found favor after his such as Campra, Colas, Desmarais, Blamont, and Moray, are of less importance historically, because they all copied his manner. Any part of their works which pointed to the influence of the opera seria, as it was being formed in the Neapolitan school, was rejected by the national vanity. Jean-Philippe Raymond, 1683 to 1764, came to Paris from the provinces as an established musician in 1721. He succeeded by his force of character and the powerful protection of the farmer-general, La Poplinière, in placing his operas on a level with those of Lully in the public estimation. When he produced his Hippolyte et Arisi in 1732, he was met by the most determined opposition on the part of Lully's supporters, but the very decided success of his acknowledged masterpiece, Castore Pollux, in 1737, placed him, if not above Lully, certainly on an equality with him during the remainder of his career. 
his opponents became gradually reconciled to his supremacy and acknowledged that french music had not been essentially altered by rameau only developed and perfected and there can be no question that this was the case before rameau had produced any operas he had made his reputation as an organist and instrumental composer and more especially as the founder of a theory of harmony on this latter point his operas also show considerable progress the harmonic treatment is rich and varied though sometimes the straining after novelty and effect leads to affectation and over elaboration rameau's accompaniments are free and independent the orchestra is used with striking effect by means of variety of tone coloring in the instruments as well as of independent subjects which serve to accent the details rameau's employment of the orchestra shows a marked improvement not only on lully but even on italian opera as then existing in the same way we find the choruses released from the fetters of strict thorough bass and the parts moving freely and expressively in the lyrical portions of the opera much is evidently due to the advance in the art of solo singing both rhythm and melody move more freely and embellishment is not wholly wanting but rameau has not avowedly adopted the italian style although he spent a short part of his youth in italy the accepted forms of italian opera are entirely disregarded both in the choruses and solos the slow uniform progress of lully's operas becomes freer and more animated in rameau's the dramatic expression has more energy and life and the music has more of individual coloring but the foundation remains the same is the case with the treatment of the dialogue it is still severe stately recitative-like singing in varied measure but rameau's harmonic art is displayed in his incomparably greater power of expression rameau's opera notwithstanding its independent invention and advance in artistic feeling is the natural development of lully's principles not a revolution against them it was debated at the time with much warmth whether rameau's peculiarities were to be accepted as improvements or to be looked upon as injudicious attempts at novelty the points which then excited the liveliest interest now seem to us most trivial but the main fact is not to be denied that rameau by the efforts of his own genius constructed a national French opera upon the foundations laid by Lully, and that the further development of the grand opera proceeded along the lines laid down by him. Not only can the framework and design of these early operas be recognized in the grand opera of the present day, but French dramatic music, spite of many transformations betrays its relationship with the early masters in many peculiarities of melody rhythm and harmony a sure proof that national feeling lies at the root of the traditions the well-wishers of the national french opera were right in settling their disputes about lully and Raymond by the recognition of them both for both alike were threatened by a formidable eruption of italian taste which now so completely governed the remainder of europe that france could not fail to be in some measure affected by it in august seventeen fifty two a company of italian singers came to paris under the direction of a certain bambini and having received permission to represent comic operas intermezzi in the hall of the grand opera were called les bouffons their first representation of pergolisi's serva padrona was a failure but subsequently it was applauded with enthusiasm the chief singers of the company manelli and anna tonelli were highly esteemed both for their singing and acting 
although they did not reach to the highest level of Italian opera. The others were indifferent, but they were Italian throats, Italian ways of singing and acting, which lent all their powers to the interpretation of opera buffa, with its polished, pleasing form, simply and easily grasped harmonies and sustained melodies. They found in Paris an appreciative audience, and very soon even the Parisian orchestra, where the conductor beat time audibly, while the Italian conductor only directed from the clavier, was described, in comparison to the Italian, as a company of uneducated musicians, whose great aim was to make as much noise as possible. The supporters of the National School of Music naturally took up arms against the Italian enthusiasts, and so arose the well-known struggle between the coin du roi nationalists and the coin de la reine italians grimm who always manifested great interest in musical matters had become acquainted with italian opera in germany and afterwards in paris where he took up his abode in seventeen forty nine his intercourse with Rousseau and other sympathetic friends increased his partiality for it. His burlesque of Le Petit Prophète de Bombich Broda, 1753, which foretold in the biblical prophetic style the downfall of good taste if Paris were not converted to Italian music, proved a powerful ally to Italian music. He was joined by Diderot, who, like all the encyclopedists, was personally antagonistic to Raymond on account of his attack on the Encyclopédie. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who in his De Vins du Village had shown the delighted public how far the treasures of the Italian opera could be turned to good account in the French through all the weight of his influence into the scale of the Buffonis not content with mercilessly exposing the shortcomings of the French opera, he undertook to prove that the French language was unfitted for composition, and French music altogether an impossibility. The enraged musicians threatened to punish this daring outrage on the nation with horsewhipping, assassination, or even the Bastille, but a flood of angry discussion was all that actually resulted. Those, however, whose interests were attacked, especially the proprietors and singers of the opera house, took such measures as obliged the Italian singers to quit Paris in March 1754. It may well be wondered at that men like Rousseau and Diderot, who upheld simplicity and nature as the true canons of art, should have evinced a preference for Italian music for though doubtless the Italian style was grounded originally on the nature of music, it had already become conventional, and far removed from what the philosophers called natural. At the same time, it must be remembered that their partiality always turned in the direction of opera buffa, which sought from its commencement to free itself from the conventional restraint of opera Syria. Then, too, the musical element, as distinguished from the poetical or dramatic, had always been the foundation of Italian opera, and an opposition directed against the French opera, with its poetical and dramatic proclivities, would be sure to uphold the purely musical development of the Italians, even though the exaggerations into which it was carried might be displeasing to the philosophers. The influence of the Buffons survived their departure. The Comédie Italienne, aux Italiennes, produced Italian comedies in masquerade, French comedies and parodies of operas, the charm of which consisted mainly in their vocal parts, on which account they were called opera comique. A dangerous rival to the Comédie Italienne was the Théâtre de la Foi, whose representations took place originally on the feasts of Saint-Germain, Saint-Laurent, and Saint-Ovide. 
the two companies were always inimical and the comédien de la foi were from time to time suppressed by their stronger rival but always revived until at last in seventeen sixty two the two companies were amalgamated in this soil was planted opera buffa and favored by circumstances it grew into a great national institution translations and adaptations of favorite italian operas satisfied the public at first and were decried by the buffonis as travesties of the original but very soon especially after the brilliant success of vad's les troquaires in seventeen fifty three a new school of composers sought to reconcile the excellencies of the italian music especially in singing with the exigencies of the national taste it was difficult at first to break loose from the defined outline and simple design of the intermezzi but gradually the french taste became apparent in the greater connection and interest of the plot and the delicacy and wit of the composition the lively interest of the public induced poets of talent such as fevard sedin and marmontel to devote themselves to operatic writing and the french comic opera soon surpassed the opera buffa from a dramatic as well as a musical point of view these various impulses were all the more lasting since they were founded on the national character egidio romualdo duni seventeen o nine to seventeen seventy five born and educated in naples having made his reputation on the italian stage was led by his connection with the court at parma which was french in manners and in taste to compose french operettas as for instance ninette a la cour the applause with which they were received induced him to go to paris in seventeen fifty seven where he made an exceptionally favorable debut with the peintre d'amarot and during the next thirteen years produced a succession of comic operas the easy style and simple form of which secured them both the favor of the public and the imitation of untrained french composers duny was followed by pierre alexandre monsigny seventeen twenty nine to eighteen seventeen a dilettante who was so excited by the performances of the bouffon that he applied himself to the study of music and at once began to compose operas in seventeen fifty nine he put his first opera les avaux indiscrets on the stage and this was rapidly succeeded by others sedan was so interested in monsigny that he entrusted all his operatic librettos to him a wider sphere was opened to him with the three-act opera le roi et le fermier which was the commencement of the most brilliant success it must be allowed that the cooperation of a poet to whom even grimm allows all the qualities of a good librettist was an important element in this success but monsigny's work was quite on a level with that of his collaborateur his music expresses with instinctive truth the most amiable side of the french character monsigny not only had at his command a wealth of pleasing sympathetic melodies but possessed as decided a talent for pathos as for light comedy and a sure perception of dramatic effect combined with life delicacy and grace his natural feeling for beauty of form concealed the want of thorough artistic training and his operas were universally admired some of them such as le deserteur acquiring more extended fame a better theoretical musician was francois andre daniquin philidor seventeen twenty seven to seventeen ninety five who enjoyed the reputation of extraordinary genius as a chess player before appearing as a composer with his first opera Blé le Sabatier, in seventeen fifty nine his fame as a musician was soon established 
and he ruled the comic stage with Duny and Monsigny until Gretry took possession of it. He was reproached with justice for too great a display of musical scholarship and for making his accompaniments too prominent. He had more force and energy than Monsigny, with greater power of passionate expression, but his fun is coarser, and he is inferior in grace and tenderness. He finally abandoned music, partly from disinclination to enter into rivalry with Gretry, and partly from his passion for chess. It was characteristic that comic opera, the outcome of vaudeville and chanson, should have been nursed in its infancy by composers like Duny, who had no pretensions to great genius, Monsigny, who was half a dilettante, and Philidor, who only composed music as a pastime. André Ernest Gretry, on the contrary, 1741 to 1813, threw himself into the pursuit with all his powers and with zealous ardor. He it was who perfected the comic opera, making it what it still remains, the representative of the French national character in the province of dramatic music. As a boy, he had delighted in the performances of Italian opera singers in his native town of Liège, and as a youth he had been in Rome during the most brilliant part of Piccini's career, had studied there for several years, and at last produced an intermezzo, Le Vin Demiatrici, which was well received, and gained even Piccini's approval. In Paris, although Monsigny and Philidor received him kindly, he had to contend with difficulties. But after the complete success of his opera Le Huron in 1768, even his remarkable fertility in production could hardly satisfy the demands of the public for his works. Marmontel, Sedan, and other poets offered him libretti, which were in themselves pledges of success. The idea that dramatic poetry should represent human nature in its naked reality, which had emanated from the encyclopedists, found its realization in the drama of common life, and had considerable influence on the development of the comic opera. The strict line of demarcation between opera seria and buffa did not exist in Paris. The effort to give more dramatic interest and freer scope to operatic music led to the portrayal of the deeper and noble emotions, and opera approached more and more nearly to serious comedy in plot, situations, and psychological intention. Merriment gradually ceased to be the predominating element, and became nothing more than a flavoring thrown in. It was replaced by that mixture of seriousness and playfulness, which, in opposition to the former prohibition of any amalgamation of different styles, was now considered as the true expression of music. A characteristic distinction between comic and serious opera in France was the adoption by the former of spoken dialogue instead of recitative. Any attempt to imitate the free declamatory recitative of the Italians would have been thought too daring, and was perhaps actually prohibited by the privileges of the Grand Opera but in renouncing recitative, the dialogue gained the freedom of witty and sparkling conversation, without which the French cannot exist. And this note, once struck, soon regulated the whole character of operatic music, which, elevated as it may be, nevertheless starts from the idea of a conversation. No one could be better fitted than Gretry for the development of such a style as this. His was a pliant and amiable nature, but not a great one. He was excitable and susceptible to any emotion, but without depth. His wit was delicate and versatile, and he possessed the power of giving it the most striking and appropriate expression. 
he was determined that his music should always faithfully render some definite emotion even to the minutest detail of the dramatic situation and characters he held that a composer could only attain this end by working himself up into a pitch of intense excitement and living for the time in the drama that was under his hands the actual means which he employed was song that is melody he learnt the art of tuneful song from the italians and made its expressiveness depend upon intonation in delivery which it is the composer's part to suggest and control he laid great stress upon true and strongly accentuated declamation which he had studied under good actors this lent a liveliness and piquancy to his musical style and rendered it essentially french End of section one. Section two of The Life of Mozart, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Life of Mozart, Volume 2, by Otto Jan, French Opera, Part 2 Gretry accomplished wonders for musical form, as far as grace and freshness, lively emotion and wit go, but his powers did not attain to anything truly great or important to art. The art of melodious expression was developed by him almost to the exclusion of other means such as rich and well-chosen harmonies artistic accompaniments and instrumental effects all of which he treated as subordinate and unimportant he inveighs against the misuse of the instruments especially of the wind instruments which gluck's example had introduced even if he were not personally responsible for it but he recommends the moderate use of them for characterization and prides himself on his very questionable invention in his andromaque of assigning special instruments to the recitatives of each principal character andromaque for instance having always three flutes a saying of gretry's that in opera song is the statue and the orchestra the pedestal and that mozart sometimes put the pedestal on the stage has often been repeated. Whether this is authentic or not, the fact remains that Gretry's neglect of the orchestra was not altogether of set purpose, but that this branch of artistic education was unknown to him, and interested him as little as did the minute elaboration and hard study which are dear to all first-rate musicians. His idea that a musician of genius may spoil his inventive powers by too much study is truly comical. What he tells of his own studies shows how shallow they were, and his productions are all of a piece. On the other hand, he lays great weight upon reflection, which does not properly concern music at all, but his simplicity, which almost amounted to barrenness, served to heighten his truly excellent qualities and to make him the popular idol he was it is quite conceivable that the encyclopedists who were the champions of italian music should have seen in him the man who united beauty and melody with italian truth and characteristic expression diderot wrote under gretry's portrait the motto irritat molset falsis terroribus implet ut magus rousseau thanked him for having reopened his heart to emotion by his music grimm who had received him with approbation from the first declared during the heat of the struggle between gluckus and picinus that connoisseurs and others were all agreed that no composer had succeeded like gretry in fitting italian melody to the french language and in satisfying the national taste for wit and delicacy 
Suard and Arnaud, Gluck's supporters, stood by Gretry, as well as Marmontel, who was opposed to Gluck. And with what enthusiasm the public received his operas, many of them, to mention only Zemir and Azor, made their way throughout Europe, and had unquestionably much influence on the formation of musical taste. While comic opera was thus flourishing more and more richly and abundantly, the grand opera was confined almost exclusively to Lully and Rameau. It might almost seem that it had reached its limits, and that the interest of the public was henceforth to be centered on comic opera. But fresh trials awaited the grand opera. Doubtless the light breezes which sprang from the reformed comic opera were precursors of the coming storm, but the actual impulse to it was not given in Paris itself. Christian Wilhelm Gluck, 1714 to 1787, after doing good service to Italian opera in Italy and London, went to Vienna in 1748 and there wrote partly for the prince of hildburghausen partly and chiefly for the imperial court a succession of italian operas of no very striking originality it was precisely the time when the traditional forms were becoming more and more conventional formulas and when the vocal art was demanding the sacrifice of simplicity, nature, and truth to the whim of each virtuoso. The decadence of operatic music, which Metastasio bitterly laments, inspired Gluck with the desire to lead it back to its first principles. He was a man of earnest thought and strong will the tendency of german literature to give dignity and importance to poetry did not pass by him unnoticed and he was a warm admirer of klopstock whose odes he set to music the efforts then being made to raise the german stage in vienna had an influence on him and his own first attempts at reformation were greeted with loud applause by sonnenfels Gluck has professed his principles of dramatic composition in the well-known dedication to his Alceste. He declares his opposition to the abuses introduced by the vanity of singers and the servility of composers, by which the most beautiful and stately drama becomes the most tiresome. He refused to interrupt the action at a wrong time by a ritornello, to sacrifice expression to a run or a cadenza, to neglect the second part of a song when the situation demands that peculiar stress shall be laid on it, in obedience to the custom which requires the fourfold repetition of the words of the first part, or to give an ending to the song against the sense of the text. His overtures were to be characteristic of the drama which was to follow, and to prepare the minds of the spectators for it. His fundamental law of operatic music was its due subordination to the words, so that every turn in the action should be suitably expressed, without any superfluous adornment, just as color gives life and expression to a sketch he professed his highest aim to be simple beauty. He condemned all difficulties which hinder clearness, all novelties which do not proceed from the necessities of the situation. He set aside all rule in order to obtain true effects. There can hardly be a doubt as to the justice of these principles in general, and we are only concerned with the result of their adoption on musical progress our remarks on a style of music which professes itself the handmaid of poetry and is content with giving the fittest expression to verse must be prefaced by some notice of the poets who supplied the verse ranieri di calsabigi came to vienna in seventeen sixty one after making himself known by an edition of metastasio's works with an aesthetic introduction proving their perfection as tragedies and operas. 
he had also written several libretti for operas and cantatas he had formed an idea that music fitted for dramatic poetry must approach as nearly as possible to natural energetic declamation for since declamation was only unperfected music dramatic song could only be elaborated declamation enriched by the harmonies of the accompaniment the poetry for such music must be intense forcible passionate moving and harmonious and it could not fail of its result full of this idea he wrote orfeo and submitted it to count dorazzo the latter wished it to be put on the stage and recommended Glock as the composer who could best carry out the intentions of the poet. Calsabigi declaimed his Orfeo repeatedly before Glock, and noted his declamation in the textbook with signs which he illustrated by remarks. Glock, while giving full justice to the impulse which he had received from his poet, could only partially yield to his whimsical exaggeration of declamatory music. But Calsabigi's ideas accorded with his own, so far as to aid him in giving them clearness and precision. Gluck's demands on the musical drama went farther and deeper than Calsabigi's comprehension and powers could reach. But in the meantime he accepted what was offered to him, and so were produced Orfeo et Eurydice, seventeen sixty two, Alceste, seventeen sixty seven, and Paride et Elena, seventeen sixty nine. Not one of these works betrays any apprehension of true tragedy, any trace of the antique mind, when the poet seeks to escape from the rhetoric of Italian poetry he draws not from the greek but from the french tragedy nor do the operas possess any proper dramatic interest instead of having a well-connected symmetrical plot they consist of a succession of detached situations closely resembling each other which are too often repeated while in details they are too broad and rhetorical Gluck's principle of making music the simple exponent of the poet's words was calculated to give them dignity and influence. Gluck possessed not only boldness and energy united with intellectual acuteness, he had, what is a rare quality at all times, a deep perception of true grandeur. But although Calsabigi strove to simplify his plots, and to excite the deeper and more powerful emotions of his audience, of greatness there was no trace in his librettos. Gluck, perceiving the latent capabilities which the poet had failed to develop, brought them out, as it were, instinctively, and while he believed himself to be following the poet, he was in reality himself creating all that was great and new in the work his fame will be immortal and rests upon the stately breadth of his designs upon the simple truth of his representations in short upon the greatness of his artistic genius his weakness consisted in his one-sided tendency to characterization a tendency in no way identical with those qualities which made his reputation. Gluck does not abandon any of the accepted forms in his Italian operas. He rather, in many respects, revives older traditions. His strict treatment of the aria, the simplicity of his melodies, and the moderation of his adornments, together with his careful recitative, and especially his correct expression, were certainly variations on the then ruling taste, but not innovations on the earlier method. But in his desire to replace by accurate musical characterization the ear-flattering artificial degeneration of operatic singing, he made use of stronger means than had hitherto been known. His harmonies in especial are not only more important and interesting in themselves, but they are used of set purpose for dramatic characterization. 
in a similar manner the orchestra is made of higher use the instruments are treated according to their individualities not as combining to a purely musical effect but as giving by their tone colouring definite expression to a variety of moods light and shade are carefully adjusted and much lively execution is allotted to the orchestra the effect is still further heightened by the frequent use of the chorus which is intricately treated and so becomes a powerful factor in the musical characterization gluck extended his care to the details of scenery to marches and dances everything was to be in accordance with and characteristic of the situation here he had been preceded by jean georges Novair, seventeen twenty seven to eighteen ten who in his lettres sur la danse et sur les ballets in seventeen sixty strove for a reformation in the ballet on the same principles which gluck employed for the opera he condemned stereotyped forms of set dances and demanded a plot for the ballet expression should be the task of the dancer with nature for his model and the ballet master should be both poet and painter the ballets which he produced upon these principles at stuttgart until seventeen sixty four then at vienna and after seventeen seventy six at paris were finished productions of a very pure taste and effected a complete revolution in the art of dancing gluck laid great stress upon recitative he almost entirely abandoned the customary plain recitative and used accompanied recitative as most fitting for the dignified language of musical drama truth and power of expression are combined with a wealth of delicate and characteristic detail and gluck rarely falls into the error of destroying the impression of the whole by over elaboration of detail his nature was averse to all forms of triviality but here again the one-sided application of gluck's principle becomes a weakness as according to his view music is to be subservient to the words he follows with his strongly marked recitative every turn of the dialogue rhetorical and inflated as it might be so that he not only employs all the resources of his art on an unworthy object but fritters away the interest on which he makes claims at once too extensive and too rapidly succeeding one another musical representation works immediately upon the mind and the emotions and can do this so much more strongly and vividly than verse which however forcibly declaimed appeals primarily to the intellect and the imagination that a painful incongruity occurs when music with all her resources of accurate characterization follows step by step the words of the poet it is therefore an error to suppose that the music must always yield to the words as in a correct and well-composed picture adds gluck the animation of the colouring and of well-disposed light and shade vivifies the forms without distorting the outlines but the true painter does not colour or illumine the naked outline he considers the form in its total effect as a piece of colouring and it exists for him only in this totality which it is his object to represent the distinction between form and colour is only technically important and does not affect artistic perception and production in the same way the musician has something more to do with respect to the words of his text than to colour given outlines the conceptions which the poet has formed with the consciousness that they could only attain a complete independence by their combination with music must be absorbed by the musician and reproduced in the forms appointed by the nature of his art 
the exaggerations attending on all forms of opposition and attempted reformation will not suffice to explain this important error in dealing with so great and powerful a mind as gluck's we must go deeper and seek for the cause in his artistic organization alone an ardent admirer of gluck has pronounced that he was more intellectually than musically great and certainly his musical productions do not correspond to the energy of his feelings and his will his organization fitted him for a reformer as a creative artist his weakness became apparent gluck's works are not exactly one-sided he expressed every variety of passion with equal skill and he is never wanting in grace and charm but he cannot be said to be rich or spontaneous. The lofty sentiment which he expresses in firm and comprehensive melodies is natural to him, but his exact and confined mode of composition is in part the result of his limited power of invention. The final cause of his desire to deprive music of her rights as an independent art in favor of verse lies in this weakness of his musical organization closely connected with this is another phenomenon it has been justly remarked that gluck's powers of characterization extend only to soliloquies that he failed to give proper expression to the dialogue proper the contrast of voices and characters which either in opposition or agreement demonstrate their different natures the polyphonal power of music in its intellectual sense remained undeveloped by gluck failing in this he failed in the highest object of music by virtue of which alone she can make any claim to dramatic force the fact that gluck did not feel himself impelled to express his dramatic situations after this fashion is a proof that his imagination was more easily stirred poetically than musically the narrow limits within which he occasionally confines even the music whose expression is intended to be purely lyrical may be traced to the same source for gluck did not think it necessary that action on the musical stage should maintain the same uninterrupted flow as in real life he thought it far more important to give a well-sustained musical representation of some one mood or disposition and the more broadly such moods were indicated by the poet the better he was pleased it is true that even then he keeps within the limits of the strictest form but he is fond of employing frequent repetition particularly when the chorus and a solo voice are set in opposition to each other this way of rendering a dramatic idea is often of powerful effect but considered from an artistic point of view it should be subordinated to the design of a grandly conceived composition expanding into a living organism it cannot be denied therefore that gluck failed in the working out of his subjects and that he sometimes betrays a certain amount of weakness as well in the structure of his compositions as in their details it is not for want of industry or care it was that he did not feel the necessity for mastering this important side of musical representation and the fact affords fresh testimony of the singularity of his musical organization gluck's first opera orfeo ed eurydice adheres most closely to the usual italian style and was indeed successfully performed in italy of action in this opera there is hardly any the introduction of cupid at the beginning and the end gives it the cold allegorical character of the then customary festival entertainments the broadly represented situations in which orpheus mourns for eurydice and charms by his music the demons of the lower world form the main portions of the opera 
and they are expressed with striking fidelity and fervor of sentiment, as well as with great force and beauty. The use which is made of the chorus and the cultivation of the orchestra betoken great and important advances on the older style. The opera was well received by connoisseurs, both in Vienna and Paris, but it does not appear to have been regarded as the inauguration of a reformation in music. Indeed, during the next few years, Gluck composed several Italian operas quite after the old fashion. Alceste, however, is an avowed attempt towards a reformation of dramatic music, and it manifests the settled purpose and the complete individuality of the master. The poet offers nothing but a succession of situations without any progressive action. The situations turn exclusively on the decision of Alceste, and are employed less as psychological developments of character than as opportunities for a rhetorical representation of certain frames of mind. The character of Hercules is omitted, and the task of deliverance is entrusted to Apollo as an apparition in the clouds. This destroys an effective contrast, and the two confidants retain a suspicious likeness to the parte seconde of Italian opera. But Gluck considered the separate scenes not only with regard to their fitness for musical treatment, he felt firm ground in which he might strike root. It testifies to his marvelous energy of mind that no weakness was discernible in the repetition of such closely allied situations, and that he had always new shades of expression and climacteric effects at his command. The connection with the forms of Italian opera is not by any means completely severed, an unprejudiced survey discovers numerous traces of this, and many of the main features of the composition are the results of the particular way in which Gluck made use of these forms. The Vienna public received the opera with indifference, but the critics welcomed it eagerly as the inauguration of a new era. Unhappily, the critics were not by any means competent judges. Sonnenfels and Rydell were not cultivated musical connoisseurs. The opera scarcely reached a more extended circle. In Italy little notice was taken of it. Frederick the Great had several portions of it performed before him without finding any enjoyment in them. North German critics, while doing full justice to the new work, raised objections to some of the essential points of Gluck's principles as carried out in it. Gluck remarks with some resentment in his dedication to Paridi ed Elena on the lukewarmness of the public and the want of insight and justice on the part of the critics. He goes on to blame the cowardice and stupidity of musicians, none of whom had ventured to follow his lead and proudly declares his intention of maintaining his principles to the correctness of which this new opera was to testify on altogether new grounds this was an unlucky announcement for paride ed elena gave no proof of gluck's exceptional powers the subject a sufficiently poor one is deprived of every vestige of interest by the interposition of cupid in disguise between the lovers a fiction which turns the whole drama into an absurdity the meagre story is spun out into five acts while to the love scenes which are wanting in any true passion independent choruses and dances are attached calling for nothing beyond outward display gluck's genius for depicting the wider and deeper emotions found no task fitted to its powers and the inclination to mere grace and superficiality was one altogether foreign to his nature beauties of detail do not suffice in the consideration of a work of art the opera was a failure however and it does not appear to have been reproduced 
Perhaps Gluck would now have paused in his endeavors, had not new prospects opened which seemed to promise good results. A Frenchman named Du Rollet, attached to the embassy at Vienna, and an enthusiast for poetry and music, asserted that the tendency of Gluck's principles was in essentials the same as that of French opera style. He therefore assured him that in Paris only would his reformation meet with approval, and urged that a true tragedy ought always to be the foundation of an opera. As an example, he suggested Racine's Ephigenie en Olide, and commissioned him to arrange it as an opera, and to take the preliminary steps for its production in Paris. Gluck accepted the proposal without hesitation. The circumstances were, in fact, very favorable. The principal difficulty against which Gluck had hitherto to contend, viz. the deep-rooted partiality for Italian music and its accepted forms, did not exist in Paris, for opera seria in its developed form had made as little way there as the display of fine execution and even lovers of italian music would have been loath to introduce its abuses and exaggerations of set purpose french opera on the contrary in accordance with the genius of the nation made its first principal dramatic and characteristic expression which could only be attained by correct yet free treatment of musical forms and by well-considered treatment of recitative courses too which were for gluck an important aid to climax and dramatic effect were indispensable in french opera and since rameau's time the orchestra had been successfully employed as a means of characteristic expression but the french school had hitherto failed to combine dignity and beauty with their dramatic force and expression and here gluck's italian training enabled him to supply the deficiency as far as comic opera was concerned gretry had preceded him with similar efforts and had accustomed the ear of the parisians to the mingling of french and italian music but to carry out such a reformation in the grand opera required a man of commanding qualities and such a one Gluck had proved himself to be. The choice of subjects was a happy one. Racine's tragedy was known as a masterpiece to the whole nation, and, unless the adaptation were very clumsily made, success for the poetic share of the opera was assured. The advance on earlier operas is a very decided one. An important event forms the center of the plot, dramatic contrasts passions and characters are effectively portrayed it is true that the spirit of the age of louis the fourteenth runs through it all we have greeks in patches and powder monseigneur achille and princess iphigenie behave with becoming courtesy and gallantry and even the artistic representation is made subordinate to the ceremonial but Gluck had been trained among these impressions. The forms were not irksome to him, and the greatness of his artistic individuality is nowhere more plainly seen than in his power of exhibiting at momentous crises the purely human and poetic emotions stripped of their outward disguise, and reflecting the ideal spirit of antique art by means of music in a way of which the poet had never dreamed. Gluck did not venture to depart from the national form of the versification. He was well aware that he must yield to the demands of French taste, if he wished to influence the French on his main points. He not only strove to conform to external conditions, as, for instance, to the great extension of the ballet, endeavouring to turn them to his own ends, he carefully studied the language in order to declaim it and treat it musically in a way suitable to its character he also eagerly studied the operas of his predecessors lully and rameau 
that he might adopt all that was truly and genuinely national in them. The influence of these studies may be recognized even in details, but Gluck turned to account whatever he adopted in a perfectly free and independent manner, and developed it still further. His most important innovation was the substitution of free Italian recitative with the grand capabilities for characteristic expression given to it by Gluck himself for the old psalmody. He changed throughout the fundamental character of the musical representation, and here he had no predecessors, for the treatment of the several parts of the composition after the Italian style, comic opera had, as we have seen, in some degree prepared the way. A further advance, brought about by the greater vividness of the dramatic impersonations, was the cultivation of ensemble pieces, but this as has been already remarked is the weakest side of gluck's performances although gluck's Iphigenie might rightfully claim to have perfected the french grand opera in its national sense yet it was a difficult undertaking to gain recognition for this fact in paris and to produce there the work of a foreign if not of an unknown composer Dorelet published a letter to d'Auvergne, one of the directors of the Grand Opera, in the Mercure de France, October 1772, in which he acquaints him of Gluck's wish to produce his Ephigenie in Paris. He laid stress on Gluck's having preferred the French language and music to the Italian and declared that his composition of Racine's masterpiece was altogether after the French taste. He hoped in this way to gain the favor of the public and the theater management. As this met with no response, Gluck himself published a letter in the Mercure, February 1773, in which, without undue submission, he reiterates the wish he wastes great praise on J. J. Rousseau, who was destined to be the most determined opponent of the French language and music. At last Gluck succeeded in gaining the interest of the Dauphiness, Marie Antoinette. All difficulties were overcome, and in the autumn of 1773 Gluck went to Paris to put his opera in rehearsal again hindrances were thrown in his way which it required all the force and vigor of his character to overcome the hardest struggle was with the vocalists male and female and with the orchestra they must be attached to him at all costs but he was an implacable conductor and never gave way before a storm after six months rehearsing Iphigenie was performed February 14, 1774. The success of the first performance was not brilliant, but the second quite confirmed the victory. Gluck had succeeded, an important point in Paris, in raising public expectation to a high pitch beforehand, and he found zealous supporters among the journalists, especially the Abbé Arnaud, the opposition engendered by the enthusiastic partisanship of his admirers was in his favor in so far that it prevented the interest of the public from becoming faint opposition came as might have been expected from both sides the followers of lully and rameau would not grant any progress made and saw in gluck's innovations nothing but the harmful influence of italian music while the partisans of the italians looked upon gluck's music as essentially identical with the old french and complained of the tudesque modifications of the italian style as usual neither party was satisfied with the concessions made to it and still less would either acknowledge that its strong places had been overthrown J. J. Rousseau alone acknowledged himself vanquished, and as he had previously done justice to Gretry's efforts, so he now extolled Gluck's music as being genuinely dramatic. 
not so grim. He was too well versed in Italian music not to perceive that if Gluck's ideas became prevalent, those forms which he held to be essential would soon be annihilated. Gluck's operas appear to him a revival of the old French style which would only hinder or retard the triumph of the italian it is true that out of deference to public opinion and to that of many of his friends and of gluck's royal patroness he does not express himself very positively on the subject but his real views cannot be mistaken with just discrimination the directors had declared that they would not risk appearing before the public with one of gluck's operas if he would write six they might have a chance of success gluck himself was aware that if he was to succeed in the long run his iphigenie must not be left long alone he rapidly revised and elaborated Orphe et Eurydice, not at all to the advantage of the opera, in which he was induced, quite against his principles, to insert a long bravura aria by Bertoni. It was performed on August 2, 1774, with great success, and was followed on february twenty seventh seventeen seventy five by a one-act opera l'arbre enchanté and on august eleventh seventeen seventy five by an opera in three acts la cithère assiégée neither of which had any lasting effect in order to ensure a fresh and lasting success gluck took in hand his alceste anew the text was thoroughly revised by Duorle, with the adoption of Rousseau's suggestions, especially in the second act. Hercules is introduced again, but not very skilfully. Gluck's revision was a very thorough one. The old music was transposed, curtailed, or lengthened, the details altered, and new passages inserted, generally with admirable discrimination then in order to put new works in direct competition with his old compositions he undertook to set operas by quinault to music unaltered and chose roland and armida while gluck was engaged on these works in vienna the supporters of italian music who were now convinced of the possibility of procuring foreign composers for the grand opera sought on their side to oppose a rival to gluck some time previously madame du barry had been induced by laborde's influence to obtain the presence in paris of piccini the most esteemed of italian composers the neapolitan ambassador the marquis caracchioli by his intellect and position a powerful patron of the arts and sciences had been mainly instrumental in summoning piccini and the young queen, Marie Antoinette, who saw no necessity for bending her inclinations to party interests in the matter of music, and who, like her brother the emperor, was personally attached to Italian music, gave her consent to Piccini's appointment. Marmontel declared himself ready to adapt an opera by Quinault for Piccini, of whose music he announced himself the champion. When Gluck heard that the work selected was the Roland, on which he was already at work, he published a letter, Année Littéraire, 1776, in which he bitterly complained of this affront, and violently assailed his adversaries. Open war was now declared between the critics of the Gluckists and the Piccinists, and carried on in pamphlets, journal articles, and epigrams with so much violence that even the public were led into a partisanship more eager than had ever before arisen from a question of art the leaders of the piccinis were marmontel and la harpe while gluck's faithful partisans were arnaud and suard who appeared as the anonymous of vaugirard grimm took no direct share in the contest 
but his comments on it show him in spite of apparent impartiality to have been decidedly on the side of piccini the first performance of alceste on april twenty third seventeen seventy six was a failure and it only gained in public favor by slow degrees Iphigenie, too, which was reproduced, was severely criticized. But this severity served but to increase public sympathy, and Gluck's operas drew full houses and became more and more unmistakably popular. Pacini arrived in Paris quite at the end of 1776. He was welcomed by all the composers, Gretry alone failing to pay his respects to him. For this he was severely censured, since on first coming to Paris he had announced himself as a pupil of Piccini, which he was not. Strange and unknown in Paris, Piccini took a great distaste to its harsh climate, its unaccustomed way of living. His ignorance of the French language isolated him and debarred him from any personal share in the contest of which he was the subject. His easy-going and peace-loving temperament prevented his wishing to join in the fray, while for Gluck's passionate nature it was a satisfaction to give vent to angry vituperation in the public journals. Marmontel relates how he had to instruct Piccini in French by reading him his opera every day as a task, and translating what Piccini had to compose thus slowly proceeded the work of the dissatisfied maestro and every day he doubted of its success more and more gluck began the rehearsals of his armide in july seventeen seventy seven and it was performed on september twenty third the opera on which gluck had built such confident hopes of success was very coolly received its failure was owing partly to the dangerous rivalry of Lully, partly to the fact that the subject was not suited to his genius, and partly also to the premonitory shadow of Piccini's new work. Justice was not done to Armide until later. La Harpe attacked it bitterly, and Gluck, in a violent retort, called for the aid of the Anonymous of Vaugirard, which did not tarry. Then began the rehearsals of Piccini's opera, and the storm of partisanship was let loose. Piccini was incapable of restraining it. While his friends espoused his cause with zeal, while Gluck himself sought to restrain the singers and the orchestra, Piccini looked sorrowfully to heaven and sighed, Ah, tutte va male, tutte! Firmly convinced that the opera would be a failure, and resolved to return to Naples on the following day, he went to the first performance, January 1778, consoling his family with the assurance that a cultivated nation like the French would do a composer no bodily harm, even if they did not admire his operas, and experienced a brilliant triumph. End of section two. Section three of The Life of Mozart, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. THE LIFE OF MOZART, VOLUME TWO, BY OTTO YAN PARIS, 1778, PART One. Such was the condition of musical affairs at the time of Mozart's arrival in Paris. The successes on either side, and the violence of partisan controversy, had, as might have been expected, prevented any decisive conclusion of the dispute. We know now that Gluck remained master of the field, and that the influence of Lully and Rameau sinking henceforth into oblivion, Gluck determined the character of French opera in all its essential points as it still exists, 
in spite of its many Italian modifications. But at the time of which we are speaking, the Gluckis and Piccinis were carrying on the warfare with greater bitterness than ever, and the old national party, although pushed into the background, was seeking to free itself from both influences. The interest of the public was more eagerly excited than ever, but, as usual, more for the sake of the literary scandal and personal animosity than with any love of art, and when audiences flocked to the opera they desired not to enjoy, but to participate in what was going on. This was an unfortunate state of things for a young composer whose object was to acquire an honourable position for himself. He must, in order to be heard at all, attach himself to one or other party, and so lose his independence, the only true foundation of excellence. To put an end to the dispute by forcing the combatants to acknowledge a success greater than that of either was at this juncture beyond the power of even a transcendent genius, and Mozart brought nothing with him to Paris but his genius. He had failed in obtaining an introduction to the Queen Marie Antoinette from Vienna, and access to the circle of the nobility was no easy matter. Mozart had little to expect from the support of his fellow artists, for they were all ranged against each other, and had enough to do to fight their own battles. Gluck had left Paris when Mozart entered it. He renewed his acquaintance with Piccini, whom he had known in Italy and was polite in his greetings when he met him at the Concert Spirituel and elsewhere. But there the intercourse ended. I know my affairs, and he his, and that suffices. July ninth, 1778 We find no traces of any acquaintance with Gretry, who never mentions Mozart in his memoir. He was resigned to professional envy, and had already experienced his full share of it. But in Paris at that time the gens de lettres were the arbiters of taste and fashion. Pamphlets and critical articles, epigrams and bon mots, proceeding from the literary circle, ruled public opinion, and a thorough knowledge of music was, as a rule, the last requirement thought of by those who strove to influence its progress. It was a new world to Wolfgang, in which he would have found it difficult to move successfully and uprightly, even if he had gained access to its favor. Grimm, who might have introduced him, was himself a partisan, and esteemed only by his own party. Besides which, he could not fail soon to discover that Mozart was the last man in the world for this kind of intercourse. Nevertheless, he received him very kindly, and sought to make him known wherever he could." They were always quite of accord in their opinions of French music. Baron Grimm and I, writes Mozart, April 5, 1778, often pour out our wrath over the music of the present day, but in private be it understood. In public it is all bravo, bravissimo, and clapping one's hands till the fingers burn. And in another letter he says, what annoys me is that the French have improved their taste just enough to enable them to listen to good music, but their own is still very bad. I, upon my word, but it is, and their singing, oi me, if they would only let Italian songs alone, I could forgive their Frenchified cherubing, but it is really unpardonable so to spoil good music." Mozart's outward circumstances were not pleasant. In order to economize, for his mother found everything in Paris half as dear again as elsewhere, they took a dark, uncomfortable lodging, so small that Wolfgang could not get his clavier into it. But their life was rendered considerably more cheerful by the presence of their Mannheim friends. Wendling, writes the mother, April 5th, 
there is no more talk of his irreligion, has prepared Wolfgang's way for him, and has now introduced him to all his friends. He is a true benefactor, and M. von Grimm has promised him to use all his influence, which is greater than Wendling's, to make Wolfgang known. In Paris, too, Mozart became better acquainted with Raff, and learned to value him as an artist and as a friend. This was greatly owing to the interest Raff took in the Weber family. He appreciated Aloysia's talents, promised to give her lessons, and approved of Mozart's liking for her. This was all the greater consolation, since he dared not speak openly on the subject to his father, although he did not attempt to conceal his correspondence with the Weber family, nor could his wishes and feelings fail to be perceived when he wrote, July 3rd, 1778, I have never been backward and never will be. I will always use my powers to the uttermost. God can make all things good. I have something in my mind for which I pray to God daily. If it is His divine will, it will come to pass. If not, I am content. I have at least done my best. If all goes well and things turn out as I wish, then you must do your share, or the whole business will fall through. I trust to your kindness to do it. Do not attempt to discover my meaning, for the immediate favor I have to beg of you is to let me keep my ideas to myself until the right time comes. He does not seem to have been very hopeful, March ninth, 1778. I am pretty well, thank God, but for the rest I often scarcely know or care for anything. I am quite indifferent, and take little pleasure in anything. What most supports and invigorates me is the thought that you, dear father, and my dear sister are safe and well, that I am an honest German, and that although I cannot always say what I like, I can always think what I like, which is the main point. In a mood like this, the encouragement of musical compatriots would be doubly grateful to him. This was freely bestowed on him by the ambassador from the Palatinate, Count von Sickingen, to whom Gemingen and Cannabich had given him letters, and Raff a personal introduction. He is a charming man, a passionate lover, and true judge of music. I spent eight hours with him quite alone. We were at the clavier morning and afternoon, and up to ten o'clock in the evening— all the time making, praising, admiring, altering, discussing, and criticizing nothing but music, he has about thirty operatic scores. He maintained this acquaintance zealously, often dining with the Count, and spending the evening over his own compositions with so much interest that the time went without their knowing it. June twelfth, 1778 the Mannheim friends were engaged for the Concert Spirituel, which had been founded in 1725. Anna Danikin Philidor, elder brother to the composer already mentioned, was accorded the privilege, on payment of a fixed sum, of giving about four-and-twenty concerts in the course of the year, on festivals when there was no grand opera. They were given in a hall of the Tuileries, and consisted of instrumental music, and sacred or classical compositions for chorus or solo singing. Wolfgang was introduced to the director, Jean Le Gros, 1739-1793, and at once received from him a commission with which he acquaints his father, April 5, 1778. The Kapellmeister Holzbauer has sent a miserere, but the Mannheim chorus being weak and bad, while here it is good and strong, his choruses make no effect. Therefore, M. Le Gros has commissioned me to write other choruses. Holzbauer's introductory chorus remains. The first by me is Quonium iniquitatum miam ego, etc., 
allegro the second adagio ecce enim in iniquitatibus then allegro ecce enim veritatum dil existi up to assa humiliata then an andante for soprano tenor and bass soli cor mundum crea and redi mihi laetitium allegro as far as te convertenter then i have done a recitative for the basses libera me de sanguinibus because it is followed by a bass song by halsbauer domini labia mea in the same way because sacrificium deo spiritus is an andante tenor air for raff with solo oboe and bassoon i have added a little recitative quanium si valuisis also with oboe and bassoon concertante recitatives are very much in vogue here beningi fac up to muri jerusalem andante moderato chorus then tonc acceptabus tu super altari tuam vetulos allegro tenor solo le gros and chorus together i must say i am glad i have finished this work for it is confoundedly awkward when one is in a hurry with work and cannot write at home but it is finished thank god and will i think make an effect m grosset whom you must know told m le gros after seeing my first chorus that it was charming and would certainly tell in performance that the words were well arranged and admirably set to music he is a good friend of mine but a dry reserved man that this scampering work for mozart was only a few days over it should form his debut before the french public caused his father great uneasiness but it was uncalled for for in his next letter wolfgang informs him march first seventeen seventy eight i must tell you by the way that my chorus work came to nothing holzbauer's miseria is too long as it is and did not please besides which they only performed two of my choruses instead of four and left out the best it did not much matter for many people did not know that they were mine and many more never heard of me notwithstanding they were highly applauded at rehearsal and what is more important for i do not think much of parisian applause i like them myself another work was occasioned by the presence of the mannheim performers with whom was associated the celebrated hornist johann punto seventeen forty eight to eighteen o three who in mozart's opinion played magnificently mozart set to work at a symphonie concertante for flute wendling oboe ram french horn punto and bassoon ritter which was to be performed at one of the concerts but he was soon obliged to write to his father may first seventeen seventy eight there is another hickle hackle with the symphonie concertante i believe there is something behind for i have my enemies here as where have i not had them it is a good sign however i was obliged to write the symphony in great haste worked hard at it and thoroughly satisfied the four performers le gros had it four days for copying and i always found it lying in the same place at last the day but one before the concert i did not find it searched about among the music and found it hidden away i could do nothing but ask le gros a propos have you given the sinfoni concertanti to be copied no i forgot it of course i could not order him to have it copied and played so said nothing the day it should have been performed i went to the concert ram and punto came up to me in a rage and asked why my sinfoni concertante was not played i do not know this is the first i have heard of it ram was furious and abused le gros in french saying that it was unhandsome of him etc 
what annoyed me most in the whole affair was le gros not telling me a word about it as if i was to know nothing of it if he had only made an apology that the time was too short or anything but no not a word i think cambini an italian composer here is at the bottom of it for i was the innocent cause of his being extinguished on his first introduction to le gros he has written some pretty quartets one of which i had heard at mannheim i praised it to him and played the beginning ritter ram and punto were there and they left me no peace insisting that i should go on and make up myself what i could not remember so i did it and cambini was quite beside himself and could not refrain from saying questa è una gran testa but it must have been sorely against the grain with him the father was of the same opinion and warned wolfgang that cambini would not be the only one who would seek to injure him but he must not allow himself to be disconcerted april twenty ninth seventeen seventy eight wolfgang expressed himself with considerable dissatisfaction if this were a place where the people had ears to hear and a heart to feel and just a little understanding and taste for music i would laugh from my heart at all these things but as far as music is concerned i am among a set of dolts and blockheads how can it be otherwise they are just the same in all their transactions love affairs and passions there is no place in the world like paris you must not think that i exaggerate in speaking so of the music here ask whom you will only not a native frenchman and they will tell you the same well i am here and must make the best of it for your sake i shall thank the almighty if i come out of it with unvitiated taste i pray to god daily to give me grace to stand firm and do honour to myself and the german nation and that he will grant me success so that i may make plenty of money help you out of all your present troubles and that we may meet once more and all live happily together again through the good offices of Grimm, Mozart was recommended to the Duc de Guine, who had been recalled from his post as ambassador in London after his notorious lawsuit with Secretary Tort in 1776, and stood high in favor with the Queen. Leopold Mozart wrote, March 28, 1778, My dear son, I beg that you will do your best to gain the friendship of the Duc de Guine, and to keep well with him. I have frequently read in the papers of his high place in the royal favor. The Queen being now enciente, there are sure to be grand festivities when the child is born. You may get something to do and make your fortune, for in these cases everything depends upon the pleasure of the Queen. The Duke was amusing and fond of music, as Mozart himself says. He played the flute inimitably, and his daughter the harp magnificently. He gave Mozart a commission to compose a concerto for flute and harp. These were exactly the two instruments which Mozart could not endure. But this did not prevent his accomplishing his task to the perfect satisfaction of the Duke, the concerto, 299K, is in C major, with accompaniments for a small orchestra, and consists of the usual three movements. In conformity with the nature of the instruments, the character of the concerto is cheerful and graceful, and it is excellent of its kind. Each movement is well and compactly formed, and has an abundance of rich melody enhanced in effect by the harmonic treatment the varied character of the accompaniment and the alternation of the solo instruments the thematic treatment is only lightly sketched in so as to keep the interest alive but in the middle movement of the first part the harmonic arrangement betrays a master hand 
At its close, a fresh melody is introduced, as was then the rule, in order to excite the attention anew. Especially graceful and tender is the andantino, accompanied only by a quartet. The solo instruments are brilliant, without being particularly difficult. The orchestra is discreetly made use of to support the delicate solo instruments, without interfering with their effect. But the easy setting a jour is elaborated in detail with great skill and decision, both as regards the sound effects and the passages and turns of the accompaniment. Besides this, Mozart gave the Duke's daughter two hours' lessons in composition daily, for which generous payment might be expected. He describes the lessons minutely, May fourteenth, 1778. She has talent, and even genius, but especially has she a marvellous memory. She knows two hundred pieces, and can play them all by heart. Once, when we were talking of instruments, Mozart said that he detested the harp and the flute. She is, however, very doubtful whether she has any talent for composition, particularly as regards ideas and imagination. But her father, who, between ourselves, is a little infatuated about her, says she has plenty of ideas, but is over-modest, and has too little confidence in herself. Well, we shall see. If she does not get any ideas or imagination, at present she has absolutely none, it is all in vain, for God knows I cannot give them to her. Her father has no intention of making her into a great composer. I do not wish her, says he, to write operas, concertos, songs, or symphonies, but only grand sonatas for her instrument and mine. Today I gave her her fourth lesson, and, as far as regards the rules of composition and exercises, I am fairly satisfied. She has supplied a very good base to the first minuet which I set her. She is beginning now to write in three parts. She does it, but she gets ennui. I cannot help it, for I cannot possibly take her farther. Even if she had genius, it would be too soon, and unhappily she has none. Everything must be done artificially. She has no ideas, and so nothing comes of it. I have tried her in every sort of way. Among other things, it came into my head to write down a very simple minuet, and to try if she could write a variation on it. No, it was in vain. Well, I thought, she does not know how to begin, so I began to vary the first bar, and told her to go on with it, and keep the same idea, and at last she managed it. When that was done, I told her to begin something herself, only the first part of a melody. She reflected for a quarter of an hour, but nothing came of it. Then I wrote the first four bars of a minuet, and said, See what a donkey I am! I have begun a minuet, and cannot even finish the first part. Be so kind as to do it for me. She thought it was impossible. At last, after much trouble, something came to light, and I was very glad of it. Then I made her complete the minuet, only the first part, of course. I have given her nothing to do at home but to alter my four bars, and make something out of them, to invent a new beginning, even if the harmony is the same, so long as the melody is altered. I shall see to-morrow what she has made of it. The father was justly astonished at the demands made by Wolfgang on the talent of his pupil, and on the earnestness with which he threw himself into his task. May twenty eighth, seventeen seventy eight. You write that you have just given Mademoiselle de Guine her fourth lesson, and you want her to write down her own ideas. Do you think that everybody has your genius? It will come in time. She has a good memory. Let her steal, or more politely, adapt. It does no harm at the beginning until courage comes. 
Your plan of variations is a good one. Only persevere. If Monsieur le Duc sees anything, however small, by his daughter, he will be delighted. It is really an excellent acquaintance. But Wolfgang had not the art of cultivating such acquaintances any more than of giving lessons in composition to young ladies of no talent. He wrote later that she was thoroughly stupid and thoroughly lazy, July ninth, 1778, and in conclusion the Duke offered him two louis d'or, which he indignantly rejected. He had some other pupils, and might have had more, had not the distances in Paris been so great that his time was too much curtailed thereby. He complains, July thirty first, 1778, It is no joke to give lessons here. You must not think that it is laziness, no. But it is quite against my nature, my way of life, you know that i so to speak live in music that i am busy at it the whole day planning studying considering lessons come in the way of this i shall certainly have some hours free but i need them rather for rest than for work highly distasteful to him also were visits to people of rank and attempts to gain their favour he enumerates all the disagreeables of it, May 1st, 1778. You write that I should pay plenty of visits to make new acquaintances and renew old ones. It is really impossible. To go on foot takes too long and makes one too dirty, for Paris is inconceivably filthy, and to drive costs four or five livres a day, and all for nothing the people pay compliments and nothing more engage me for such or such a day and then i play and they say oh c'est un prodige c'est inconcevable c'est étonnant and then adieu i have already spent money enough in that way and often uselessly for the people have been out no one can know the annoyance of it who is not here paris is very much altered the french are not nearly so polite as they were fourteen years ago they approach very near to rudeness now and are dreadfully arrogant the example which he gives his father sufficiently justifies his complaints and is as significant of the impertinence of the nobility towards artists as of mozart's powerlessness to resent such behaviour Monsieur Grimm gave me a letter to Madame la Duchesse de Chabot, and I went there. The purport of the letter was principally to recommend me to the Duchesse de Bourbon, then in a convent, and to bring me again to her remembrance. A week passed without any notice taken, but as she had already commanded my presence in that time, I went. I was left to wait half an hour in an icily cold, very large room, with no stove or means of heating it. At last the Duchesse de Chabot came in, and politely begged me to make allowances for the clavier, since she had none in good order. Would I try it? I said I should have been delighted to play something, but that I could not feel my fingers for the cold, and I begged her to allow me to go to a room where at least there was a stove. Oh, oui, monsieur, vous avez raison, was her only answer. Then she sat down and began to draw for at least an hour with some other gentlemen, who all sat round a great table. I had the honour of standing waiting this hour the doors and windows were open very soon not only my hands but my feet and whole body were stiff with cold and my head began to ache no one spoke to me and i did not know what to do for cold headache and fatigue at last to cut it short i played on the wretched miserable pianoforte the most vexatious part of all was that madame and all the gentlemen went on with their employment without a moment's pause or notice, so that I played for the walls and chairs. All these things put together were too much for my patience. I began the Fisher variations. 
played the half and got up then followed no end of eloge i said what was quite true that i could do myself no credit with such a clavier and that i should be very pleased to appoint another day when i could have a better clavier but she did not consent and i was obliged to wait another half hour till her husband came in but he sat down beside me and listened with all attention and then i i forgot cold and headache and annoyance and played on the wretched clavier as you know i can play when i am in a good humour give me the best clavier in europe but with an audience who do not or will not understand and feel with me when i play and i lose all pleasure in it i told the whole affair to monsieur grimm wolfgang tells his father may fourteenth seventeen seventy eight of a prospect of a settled position in which however he was disappointed rudolf the french horn player is in the royal service here and very friendly to me he has offered me the place of organist at versailles if i like to take it it brings in two thousand livres a year but i should have to live six months at versailles the other six where i choose i must ask the advice of my friends for two thousand livres is no such great sum it would be if it were in german coin but not here it makes eighty-three louis d'or and eight livres a year that is nine hundred and fifteen florins forty-five kreutzers of our money a large sum but only three hundred and thirty-three dollars and two livres here which is not much it is dreadful how soon a dollar goes i cannot be surprised at people thinking so little of a louis d'or here for it is very little four dollars or a louis d'or which is the same thing are gone directly his father who considered a settled position of such importance that a certain amount of concession should be made for it advised him to reflect well on the proposal if indeed rudolph seventeen thirty to eighteen twelve who had been a member of the band since seventeen sixty three had sufficient influence to bring it about may twenty eighth seventeen seventy eight you must not reject it at once you must consider that the eighty three louis d'or are earned in six months that you have half the year for other work that it probably is a permanent post whether you are ill or well that you can give it up when you like that you are at court consequently daily under the eyes of the king and queen and so much the nearer your fortune that you may be promoted to one of the two kapellmeister's places that in time if promotion is the rule you may become clavier master to the royal family which would be a lucrative post, that there would be nothing to hinder your writing for the theatre, concert, spirituel, etc., and printing music with dedications to your grand acquaintance, among the ministers who frequent Versailles, especially in summer, that Versailles itself is a small town, or at all events has many respectable inhabitants, among whom pupils would surely be found, and that, finally, this is the surest way to the favour and protection of the Queen. Read this to the Baron von Grimm and ask his opinion. But Grimm took Wolfgang's view of the matter, expressed in his answer to his father, July third, 1778. My inclination has never turned towards Versailles. I took the advice of Baron Grimm and others of my best friends, and they all thought with me. It is small pay. I should have to waste half the year in a place where nothing else could be earned, and where my talents would be buried. For to be in the royal service is to be forgotten in Paris, and then to be only organist. I should like a good post extremely, but nothing less than Kappelmeister, and well paid. Mozart's absorbing desire was to have an opportunity of distinguishing himself as a composer above all things by an opera. 
There seemed a fair prospect of doing this soon after his arrival in Paris. He had renewed his acquaintance with Novaire, who, after giving up the direction of the ballet at Vienna in 1775, had, through the Queen's influence, been appointed ballet master to the Grand Opera in 1776. He took such a liking for Mozart that he not only invited him to his table as often as he chose, but commissioned him to write an opera. He proposed as a good subject Alexander and Roxanne, and set a librettist to work at the adaptation of it. The first act was ready at the beginning of April, and a month later Mozart was in hopes of receiving the whole text. It had then to be submitted to the approbation of the director of the Grand Opera, de Vime, but this did not seem to offer any difficulty, Novaire's influence being powerful with the director. As soon as Leopold Mozart heard of the prospect of an opera, he wrote, April 12, 1778, I strongly advise you, before writing for the French stage, to hear their operas and find what pleases them. In this way you will become quite a Frenchman, and I hope you will be specially careful to accustom yourself to the proper accent of the language. And he continues to impress upon him, April twenty ninth, 1778, Now that you tell me you are about to write an opera, follow my advice, and reflect that your whole reputation hangs on your first piece listen before you write and study the national taste listen to their operas and examine them i know your wonderful powers of imitation do not write hurriedly no sensible composer does that study the works beforehand with baron von grimm and Novaire. make sketches and let them hear them it is always done voltaire reads his poems to his friends hears their judgments and follows their suggestions your honor and profit depend upon it and as soon as we have money we will go to italy again wolfgang was aware of the difficulties which lay before him especially with regard to the language and the vocalists and expressed himself energetically on both points july ninth seventeen seventy eight if i do get as far as writing an opera i shall have trouble enough over it that i do not mind for i am used to it if only this cursed french language were not so utterly opposed to music it is truly miserable german is divine in comparison and then the vocalists male and female they have no right to the name for they do not sing but shriek and howl, and all from the nose and the throat. In spite of all this, he was eager to set to work, July thirty first, 1778. I assure you that I shall be only too pleased if I do succeed in writing an opera. The language is the invention of the devil, that is true, and the same difficulties are before me that beset all composers but i feel as well able as any one else to surmount them in fact when i tell myself that all goes well with my opera i feel a fire within me and my limbs tingle with the desire to make the french know honour and fear the german nation more End of section three. Section 4 of The Life of Mozart, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Life of Mozart, Volume 2, by Otto Jan. Paris, 1778, Part 2. In the meantime, Leopold Mozart heard that, at the very time when Novaire was interesting himself so warmly in Wolfgang's opera, he had engaged him to write the music for a ballet which was coming out, May 14, 1778. 
when after a considerable lapse of time the father inquired what had become of this ballet and what he had made by it wolfgang had almost forgotten the subject july ninth seventeen seventy eight as to Novaire's ballet, I only wrote that perhaps he would be making a new one. He just wanted half a ballet, and for that I provided the music. That is, there were six pieces by other people in it, consisting of poor, miserable French songs. I did the overture and contradance, altogether about twelve pieces. The ballet has been performed four times with great applause, but now I mean to do nothing without being sure beforehand what I am to get for it, for this was only as a good turn to Novaire. But such good turns were precisely what Novaire had in view. It suited him, as it did Le Gros, to have at command the services of a young artist, eager to compose, and ready to accept hope and patronage in lieu of payment whose name it was not necessary to risk bringing before the public since he was only employed as a stop-gap but it would be a very different and far more serious thing for them to bring forward an original work such as an opera by this same unknown young man in case of failure the protectors would share the responsibilities of the protege while success would bring fame and profit to the latter alone nothing shows more clearly mozart's unsuspecting nature than his explanation of the long delay of his libretto july ninth seventeen seventy eight it is always so with an opera it is so hard to find a good poem the old ones which are the best are not in the modern style and the new ones are good for nothing for poetry which was the only thing the french had to be proud of gets worse every day and the poetry of the opera is just the part that must be good for they do not understand the music there are only two operas in aria which i could write one in two acts the other in three the one in two acts is alexander and roxanne but the poet who is writing it is still in the country that in three acts is demophonte by metastasio translated and mixed with choruses and dances and specially arranged for the french theatre and this i have not yet been able to see the father saw through it all more plainly and cautioned wolfgang if he wanted to succeed with an opera in paris to make himself known beforehand august twenty seventh seventeen seventy eight you must make a name for yourself when did gluck when did piccini when did all these people come forward Gluck is not less than sixty, and it is twenty-six or twenty-seven years since he was first spoken of. And can you really imagine that the French public, or even the manager of the theatre, can be convinced of your powers of composition, without having heard anything by you in their lives, or knowing you, except in your childhood as an excellent clavier-player and precocious genius, you must exert yourself and make yourself known as a composer in every branch make opportunities and be indefatigable in making friends and in urging them on wake them up when their energies slacken and do not take for granted that they have done all they say they have i should have written long ago to m de Novaire if i had known his title and address but this way of pushing his talents was completely foreign to Wolfgang's nature, and so it followed in the natural course of things that, after a delay of months, Novaire declared that he might be able to help him to a libretto, but could not ensure the opera being performed when it was ready. One success, however, was to be granted him in Paris— he had naturally ceased to visit le gros since the latter had so ruthlessly rejected his symphonie concertante but had been every day with raff who lived in the same house 
he had chanced to meet le gros there who made the politest apologies and begged him again to write a symphony for the concert spirituel how could mozart resist such a petition on june twelfth he took the symphony which he had just finished to count sickingen where raff was he continues they were both highly pleased i myself am quite satisfied with it whether it will please generally i do not know and truth to say i care very little for whom have i to please the very few intelligent frenchmen that there are i can answer for as for the stupid ones it does not signify much whether they are pleased or not but i am in hopes that even the donkeys will find something to admire i have not omitted the premier coup d'archet and that is enough for them what a fuss they make about that to be sure was too fell i see no difference they just begin together as they do elsewhere it is quite ludicrous the symphony pleased unusually however as he tells his father july third seventeen seventy eight it was performed on corpus christi day with all applause i hear that a notice of it has appeared in the courrier de l'europe i was very unhappy over the rehearsal for i never heard anything worse in my life you cannot imagine how they scraped and scrambled over the symphony twice i was really unhappy i should like to have rehearsed it again but there are so many things that there was no time so i went to bed with a heavy heart and a discontented and angry spirit the day before i decided not to go to the concert but it was a fine evening and i determined at last to go but with the intention if it went as ill as at the rehearsal of going into the orchestra taking the violin out of the hands of m la Housset, and conducting myself i prayed for god's grace that it might go well for it is all to his honour and glory and ecce the symphony began Raff stood close to me, and in the middle of the first allegro was a passage that I knew was sure to please. The whole audience was struck, and there was great applause. I knew when I was writing it that it would make an effect, so I brought it in again at the end da capo. The andante pleased also, but especially the last allegro. I had heard that all the last allegros here, like the first, begin with all the instruments together, and generally in unison. So I began with the violins alone, piano for eight bars, followed at once by a fort. The audience, as I had anticipated, cried, Hush! at the piano, but directly the fort began, they took to clapping as soon as the symphony was over i went into the palais royal took an ice told my beads as i had vowed and went home so brilliant a success was not wanting in more lasting results m le gros has taken a tremendous fancy to me he writes july ninth seventeen seventy eight and he was commissioned to write a french oratorio for performance at the concert spirituel during the following lent my symphony was unanimously applauded and le gros is so pleased with it that he calls it his best symphony only the andante does not hit his taste he says there are too many changes of key in it and it is too long but the real truth is that the audience forgot to clap their hands so loud as for the first and last movements the andante is more admired than any other part by myself and by all connoisseurs as well as by the majority of the audience it is just the contrary of what le gros says being unaffected and short but for his satisfaction and that of others according to him i have written another either is good of its kind for they differ greatly perhaps on the whole i prefer the second one
the symphony 297k well known by the name of the french or parisian symphony was repeated with the new andante on august fifteenth it consists of three movements in the customary form except that none of the parts are repeated entire although they are perfectly distinct this was a concession to the parisian taste wolfgang writes to his father september eleventh seventeen seventy eight that his earlier symphonies would not please there we in germany have a taste for lengthy performances but in point of fact it is better to be short and good the first and last movements are unusually animated and restless with an almost unbroken rapidity of movement and the different subjects offer no contrast as to character being all in the same light restless style thematic elaboration is only hinted at except in the well-worked-out middle movement of the finale melodies are scattered through the whole in great abundance often connected with each other in a highly original and attractive manner suspense is kept up by strong contrasts of fort and piano by sudden breaks and imperceptible modulations and by striking harmonic effects the general impression given by both movements is animated and brilliant but they are more calculated to stir the intellect than to awaken the deeper emotions and are therefore well suited to a parisian audience the same is the case with the tender and beautiful andante which only now and then surreptitiously as it were betrays the existence of deep feeling there are as has been seen two versions of the andante both still existing in mozart's handwriting the second considerably shorter than the first the leading part is minutely given throughout the score of the whole piece which is marked andantino besides a fixed subject being indicated for the bass and in some places for the other instruments after thus laying down as it were the ground plan he proceeded to details making few alterations beyond some slight abbreviations when in working out the movement he came to a passage which seemed to him tedious or superfluous he struck it out and went on with the next this has been the case with several unimportant passages and with one longer one a transition to the theme by means of an imitative passage after page thirty six bar six of the score soon after too a middle passage with flute and oboe solos is cut out after thus elaborating the movement he hastily copied it all as it is now printed the later andante is printed in a parisian edition of the symphony it is far less important than the first and was rightly rejected by mozart it is worthy of remark that the violoncello is employed as a leading instrument the orchestral workmanship shows that mozart had not listened to the mannheim band in vain the different instruments form a well-ordered whole in which each has its individual significance it is only necessary to examine the thematic arrangement in the last movement score page fifty four to perceive how skilfully the effect of varied tone coloring is taken into account while at the same time by means of contrapuntal treatment due prominence is given to the purely melodious element it may well be imagined that mozart would not let slip the opportunity of trying the splendid effect of a symphony with flutes oboes and clarinets but the clarinets are sparely used as a foreign importation and together with the trumpets and drums are altogether omitted from the andante large demands are made on the executive delicacy of the orchestra and in many places the whole effect depends on a well-managed crescendo 
as it had never done in previous works in fact it is not too much to say that many of the subjects would not have been conceived as they are without the prospect of their performance by a well-organized orchestra during this interval mozart also completed the clavier sonatas with violin accompaniment which he had begun at mannheim three o one to three o six k the fourth bearing the inscription a paris and busied himself to find a publisher for them who would pay him well he found leisure also to compose a capriccio for his sister's birthday thus we see mozart disliking paris and the parisians deriving little practical gain from all his exertions and yet striving in his own way to attain the position which was his due when an event occurred which plunged himself and his family into the deepest grief paris had never agreed with the frau mozart their lodging in the hotel des quatre filles d'aimon in the rue de gros Chenet, a musical quarter was bad as well as the living and she sat all day as if under arrest wolfgang's affairs necessitating his almost constant absence she was ill for three weeks in may and intended on her recovery to seek out better lodgings and manage the housekeeping herself but in june she fell ill again she was bled and wrote afterwards to her husband june twelfth seventeen seventy eight that she was very weak and had pains in her arm and her eyes but that on the whole she was better but the improvement was only apparent and her illness took a serious turn the physician whom grimm sent in gave up hope and after a fortnight of the deepest anxiety which wolfgang passed at his mother's bedside she gently passed away on july third his only support at this trying time was a musician named heine who had known his father in former days and had often with his wife visited frau mozart in her solitude wolfgang's first thought was to break the news gently to his father who was ill prepared for so crushing a blow he wrote to him at once saying that his mother was ill and that her condition excited alarm at the same time he acquainted their true friend bullinger with the whole truth and begged him to break the dreadful news to his father as gently as possible in a few days when he knew that this had been done he wrote again himself in detail offering all the consolation he could and strove to turn his father's thoughts from the sad subject to the consideration of his own prospects this letter affords a fresh example of the deep and tender love which bound parents and children together and of wolfgang's own sentiments and turn of mind the consolations he offers and the form in which he expresses them are those of one who has himself passed through all the sad experiences of life but to his father whose teaching had tended to produce this effect his expressions were justified and correct with a natural and genuine sorrow for his irreparable loss is combined a manly composure which sought not to obtain relief by indulging in sorrow but to look forward calmly and steadily to the future and its duties as a loving son he set himself to the filial task of comforting and supporting his father after hearing that the latter was aware of his wife's death and resigned to god's will wolfgang answers july thirty first seventeen seventy eight sad as your letter made me i was beyond measure pleased to find that you take everything in a right spirit and that i need not be uneasy about my dear father and my darling sister my impulse after reading your letter was to fall on my knees and thank god for his mercy 
i am well and strong again now and have only occasional fits of melancholy for which the best remedy is writing or receiving letters that restores my spirits again at once he felt and with justice that his father's anxiety on his account would now be redoubled in keeping him informed of all his exertions and successes he satisfied his own longing to confide in his father and gave the latter just that kind of interest and occupation of the mind which would serve to dispel his grief it is touching to see the pains he takes to keep his father informed of all that he thinks will interest him and how a certain irritability which had occasionally and under the circumstances excusably betrayed itself in his former letters now completely disappears before the expression of tender affection even the handwriting which had been blamed as careless and untidy by his father becomes neater and better trifles such as these are often the clearest expression of deep and refined feeling when the heavy blow fell wolfgang was alone his mannheim friends having left paris his father might well be apprehensive lest he should neglect the proper care of himself and his affairs but grimm now came forward he or more properly as mozart declares his friend madame d'epinay offered him an asylum in their house and a place at their table and he willingly agreed as soon as he was convinced that he should cause neither appreciable expense nor inconvenience he soon found himself obliged occasionally to borrow small sums of grim which gradually mounted piecemeal to fifteen louis d'or grim reassures the father by telling him that repayment may be indefinitely postponed but wolfgang soon found the way of life in grim's household not at all to his mind and wrote of it as stupid and dull and indeed a greater contrast cannot well be imagined than when from the house whence issued with scrupulous devotion bulletins of voltaire's health contradictory reports of his religious condition and finally the announcement of his death may thirtieth seventeen seventy eight wolfgang should write to his father july third seventeen seventy eight i will tell you a piece of news which perhaps you know already that godless fellow and arch scoundrel voltaire is dead like a dog like a brute beast that is his reward the condescending patronage with which he was treated soon became intolerable to him and he complains of grimm's way of furthering his interests in paris as better fitted to a child than a grown man we can well imagine that grimm like mozart's own father desired that he should make acquaintances should gain access to distinguished families as a teacher and clavier player and should seek to win the favor of the fashion leading part of the community no doubt too grimm felt it his duty to remonstrate openly with wolfgang for what he considered his indolence and indifference it is impossible to deny the good sense and proper appreciation of the position of all grimm's remarks but they were resented by mozart on account of the tone of superiority with which they were enforced grimm was indeed openly opposed to mozart and told him frankly that he would never succeed in paris he was not active and did not go about enough and he wrote the same thing to wolfgang's father it soon became apparent that grimm was not really of opinion that mozart's talents were of such an order as to offer him a career in paris he said that he could not believe that wolfgang would be able to write a french opera likely to succeed and referred him for instruction to the italians he is always wanting me writes mozart september eleventh seventeen seventy eight to follow piccini or caribaldi 
in fact he belongs to the foreign party he is false and tries to put me down in every way he longed above all things to write an opera to show grim that i can do as much as his dear piccini although i am only a german Grimm's character was not a simple one. He had both won and kept for himself, under adverse circumstances, an influential position, which was no easy matter in Paris at any time. Queer stories were told of him, and his love of truth was not implicitly relied on. Rousseau describes him as perfidious and egotistical, madame d'epinay on the other hand extols him as a disinterested friend and others speak of his benevolence and ready sympathy there is at any rate no reason to suspect that he meant otherwise than well by mozart although he did not appreciate his genius and interested himself more for the father's sake than the son's he had striven for years to assert the supremacy of italian music and his ideal was italian opera performed in paris by italian singers in the italian language when de Vime, who was anxious to propitiate all parties engaged a company of italian singers grimm hailed the auspicious day on which caribaldi baglioni and chiavacci appeared in piccini's finte gemelle june seventeen seventy eight it is therefore quite conceivable that he renounced all interest in mozart's artistic future as soon as he was convinced of his falling off from purely italian notions and it is interesting to us to have so clear an indication that even thus early in his career mozart had set himself in opposition to the italian school he had long since learnt all that it had to teach and he fully recognized the fact that it was his mission to carry on the reform set on foot by gluck and gretry at the same time retaining all that was valuable in the italian teaching a confirmation of this is found in a later expression of opinion made by mozart to joseph frank who found him engaged in the study of french scores and asked him if it would not be better to devote himself to italian compositions whereupon mozart answered as far as melody is concerned yes but as far as dramatic effect is concerned no besides the scores which you see here are by gluck piccini salieri as well as gretry and have nothing french but the words this view was confirmed by his stay in paris a stay quite as fruitful for his artistic development as that at mannheim had been grimm's accounts show that mozart had opportunities for hearing the operas of numerous french composers besides gluck's armide which was still new orpheus alceste and iphigenia in aulis which had been revived piccini's roland gretry's matroco les trois âges de l'opera and le jugement de medas were given as well as Philidor's Ernelinde, Desaides Zulima, Gossec's Fete du Village, Rousseau's Devin du Village. Added to these were Piccini's Italian opera Le Fin Jamel, and doubtless many others of which we know nothing. It may well excite wonder that Mozart's letters to his father describe none of the new artistic impressions which he must have received in Paris but apart from the fact that personal affairs naturally held the first place in his home correspondence it must be remembered that abstract reflections on art and its relation to individual artists were not at that time the fashion and were besides quite foreign to mozart's nature his aesthetic remarks and judgments whether they treated of technical questions or of executive effects are mostly founded on concrete phenomena the practical directness of his productive power set in motion by every impulse of his artistic nature 
prevented his fathoming the latest psychical conditions of artistic activity or tracing the delicate threads which connect the inner consciousness of the artist with his external impressions or analyzing the secret processes of the soul which precede the production of a work of art he does not seem any more actively conscious of the effect wrought upon him by the works of others some men's impressions of a great work are involuntary and they seek later to comprehend the grounds of their enjoyment others strive consciously to grasp the idea of the work and to incorporate it into their being but to the man of creative genius alone is it given to preserve his own totality while absorbing all that is good in the works of other artists without ever losing his own individuality an artist of true genius absorbs impressions from nature and from other works of art than his own and constructs them anew from his inner consciousness he accepts and assimilates whatever is calculated to nourish his formative power and rejects with intuitive right judgment all that is foreign to his nature just as in the production of a true work of art invention and labor inspiration and execution willing and doing are inseparably interwoven so in the consideration by a genius of the works of other men and other ages delighted appreciation is combined with criticism ready apprehension collects materials for original work in its truest sense it is a natural process which perfects itself in the mind of the artist without any conscious action on his part therefore the judgment that one artist pronounces on another is not always in perfect accord with the influence which has been brought to bear on himself by that other the deeper the influence penetrates into the roots of an artist's inner being the more will it become part and parcel of his productive powers and the consciousness of any outside influence will be rapidly lost it remains for future historical inquirers to ascertain and define the influence of the intellectual current of the age on the individual and the mutual action on each other of exceptional phenomena small as the visible results of mozart's stay in paris might be and far as he remained from the object with which he had undertaken the journey it yet enabled him with great gain to his progress as an artist to free himself from the italian school after such a thorough study of its principles as convinced him of the value of the element of dramatic construction which lay concealed in it it may indeed be considered as a fortunate circumstance that no sooner had this conviction taken root in him than he turned his back on party disputes and left the place which was of all others the least fitted to encourage the quiet steady progress of genius leopold mozart had other and very different reasons for wishing to shorten wolfgang's stay in paris as much as he had hitherto desired to prolong it with his wife's death he had lost the assurance that wolfgang's life in paris would be of no detriment to his moral nature indulgent as she had been to her son in this respect her influence was unbounded and now it might be feared that wolfgang's easy-going nature would lead him into bad company grimm's account convinced him that wolfgang had no prospects of success in paris the less so as he took no pains to conceal his dislike of the place his dearest wish at this time was to be appointed kapellmeister to the elector of bavaria he hoped thus to be able to improve the position of the weber family and to claim aloysia as his own the project was not disapproved of by his father who however was told nothing of the last item 
on the contrary he wrote to padre martini describing the state of affairs and earnestly requesting him directly and through raff to gain the elector for wolfgang this the padre readily undertook as for raff his friendship for mozart and the interest which he took in aloysia weber were incentives enough for exertion and mozart had other influential friends among the musicians besides being able to count on the support of count sickingen end of section four section five of the life of mozart volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by rita boutros the life of mozart volume two by otto jan paris seventeen seventy eight part three in munich especially where there was no german operatic composer of merit holzbauer being too old to have much influence the need of a kapellmeister and composer was strongly felt but the circumstances were very unfavorable after it had been finally decided that the court should be removed from mannheim to munich and all had been prepared for the move threatenings of war threw everything into confusion again wolfgang felt this a heavy blow to the interests of the webbers concerning whom he writes to his father july thirty first seventeen seventy eight the day before yesterday my dear friend weber wrote to me among other things that the day after the elector's arrival it was announced that he intended to take up his residence at munich this news came like a thunderbolt to mannheim and the joy which has been testified by the illuminations of the day before was suddenly extinguished the court musicians were all informed that they were at liberty to follow the court to munich or to remain in mannheim with their present salary each one was to send in his written and sealed decision to the intendant within fourteen days weber whose miserable circumstances you know wrote as follows my decayed circumstances put it out of my power to follow my gracious master to munich however earnestly i may wish to do so before this happened there was a grand concert at court and poor mademoiselle weber felt her enemy's malice she was not invited to sing no one knows why immediately afterwards was a concert at herr von gemmingen's and count Seo was present she sang two of my songs and was fortunate enough to please in spite of the wretched foreigners the munich singers she is much injured by these infamous slanderers who say that her singing is deteriorating but cannabis when the songs were over said to her mademoiselle i hope that you will go on deteriorating after this fashion I will write to Herr Mozart tomorrow and acquaint him with your success. As the matter now stands, if war had not broken out, the court would have removed to Munich. Count Seo, who positively will have Mademoiselle Weber, had arranged everything so as to take her, and there was hope that the circumstances of the whole family would improve in consequence but now the munich journey is no more talked of and the unfortunate webbers may have to wait here long enough their debts growing heavier day by day if i could only help them my dear father i recommend them to you with my whole heart if they had only one thousand florins a year to depend upon thereupon his father reminds him that his anxiety about the webbers is unbecoming as long as he does not bestow the same care on himself and his own family august twenty seventh seventeen seventy eight besides there was no prospect for him in munich at present
and his father therefore wished him to remain in paris at all events until the matter was decided in the midst of this uncertainty a favourable prospect opened in salzburg itself since adelgasser's death it had become more and more evident at court that wolfgang's recall would be of all things most advantageous it was signified to leopold mozart through bullinger that as he doubtless wished to retain his son near him the court would be prepared to give him a monthly salary of fifty florins as organist and concertmeister and he might look forward with certainty to being made kapellmeister but the archbishop could not make the first advances bullinger duly performed his mission but leopold mozart who well knew the perplexity the archbishop was in required that the proposition should be made direct to him so therefore it was obliged to be and the diplomatic skill worthy of a ulysses as wolfgang says with which leopold mozart contrived to hold his ground and to avail himself of his strong position in an interview with the canon count joseph starenberg is minutely described by himself june twenty ninth seventeen seventy eight when i arrived no one was there but his brother the major who is staying with him to recover from the fright into which he has been thrown by prussian powder and shot he told me that an organist had been recommended to him but he would not accept him without being sure that he was good he wished to know if i was acquainted with him mandel or some such name he did not remember what oh you stupid fellow thought i is it likely that an order or a request should be received from vienna with reference to a candidate whose name is not even mentioned as if i could not guess that all this was by way of inducing me to mention my son but not i no not a syllable i said i had not the honour of knowing any such person and that i would never venture to recommend any one to our prince since it would be difficult to find any one who would altogether suit him yes said he i cannot recommend him any one it is far too difficult your son should be here now bravo the bait has taken thought i what a pity that this man is not a minister of state or an ambassador then i said we will speak plainly is it not the case that all possible measures were taken to drive my son out of salzburg i began at the beginning and enumerated every past circumstance so that his brother was quite astonished but he himself could not deny the truth of a single point, and at length told his brother that young Mozart had been the wonder of all who came to Salzburg. He wanted to persuade me to write to my son, but I said that I would not do so. It would be labor in vain, for that unless I could tell him what income he might expect, my son would laugh at the proposition." adelgasser's salary would be totally insufficient indeed even if his grace the archbishop were to offer him fifty florins a month it would be doubtful whether he would accept it we all three left the house together for they were going to the riding school and i accompanied them we spoke on the subject all the way and i held to what i had said he held to my son as the only candidate for him the fact is that the archbishop can hear of no other good organist who is also a good clavier player he says now but only to his favourites that bique was a charlatan and a buffoon and that mozart excels all others he would rather have him whom he knows than some one else highly paid whom he does not know he cannot promise any one as he would have to do if he gave a smaller salary an income by pupils 
since there are but few, and those are mine, I having the name of giving as good lessons as any man. Here, then, is the affair in full swing. I do not write, my dear Wolfgang, with the intention of inducing you to return to Salzburg, for I place no reliance on the words of the archbishop, and I have not yet spoken to his sister, the countess. I rather avoided the opportunity of meeting her, for she would take the least word as consent and petition. They must come to me, and if anything is to be done, I must have a clear and advantageous proposal made, which can hardly be expected." We must wait and hold fast to our point. Wolfgang, who disliked Salzburg even more than Paris, at first took no notice of all this. But the death of the old Kapellmeister Lolly, coinciding with that of his mother, brought matters in Salzburg to a crisis, and under the circumstances leopold mozart was more than ever convinced that wolfgang should have a good position there good old bullinger was again employed as a mediator to reconcile wolfgang to the idea he wrote to his young friend that he would be wronging his family by refusing so advantageous a position as that now offered to him and that life might be endurable even in so small a place as salzburg he mentioned casually that the archbishop intended engaging a new singer and hints that his choice might be turned towards aloysia weber thereupon wolfgang wrote candidly to bullinger august seventh seventeen seventy eight you know how hateful salzburg is to me not alone on account of the unjust treatment received there by both my father and myself, though that in itself is enough to make one wish to wipe the place clean out of one's memory. But even supposing that things turned out so that we could live well, living well and living happily are two things, and the latter I should never be able to do without the aid of magic, it would be against the natural order of things. It would be the greatest pleasure to me to embrace my dear father and sister, and the sooner the better, but I cannot deny that my joy would be doubled if the reunion took place anywhere but in Salzburg. I should have far more hope of living happily and contentedly. He goes on to explain that it is not because Salzburg is small that he dreads returning to it, but because it offers no field for his talent, music being but little esteemed there. He remarks with bitter satire how the archbishop pretends to seek with much parade for a Kapellmeister and a prima donna, and in reality does nothing soon after his father gives him further information as to the position of affairs august twenty seventh seventeen seventy eight i have written to you already that your recall here is desired and they beat about the bush with me for a long time without getting me to commit myself until at last, after Lolly's death, I was obliged to tell the countess that I had addressed a petition to the archbishop, which, however, simply appealed to his favor by drawing attention to my long and uncomplaining services. The conversation then turned upon you, and I expressed myself as frankly upon all necessary points as I had previously done to Count Starenberg. At last she asked me whether you would come if the archbishop were to give me Lolly's post and you Adelgasser's, which, as I had already calculated, would bring us in together one thousand florins a year. I could do nothing else but answer that I had no doubt that if this happened you would consent for love of me especially as the countess declared that there was not the least doubt that the archbishop would allow you to travel in italy every second year since he himself had said how important it was to hear something new from time to time 
and that he would furnish you with good letters of introduction if this were to happen we might reckon securely on one hundred and fifteen florins a month and as things now are on more than one hundred and twenty florins we should be better off than in any other place where living is twice as dear and not having to look so closely after money we should be able to think more of amusement but i am far from thinking the affair a certainty for i know how hard such a decision will be to the archbishop you have the entire good will and sympathy of the countess that is certain and it is equally certain that old arco count staremberg and the bishop of konigsgratz are all anxious to bring the matter to a conclusion but there are reasons as is always the case and as i have always told you the countess and old arco are afraid of my leaving also they have no one to succeed me as a clavier teacher i have the name of teaching well and indeed the proofs are there they know of no one and should a teacher come from vienna is it likely that he would give lessons for four florins or a ducat the dozen when anywhere else he would have two or three ducats this sets them all in perplexity but as i have said before i do not reckon on it because i know the archbishop it may be true that he sincerely wishes to secure you but he cannot make up his mind especially when it concerns giving probably wolfgang counted on this fact and refrained on that account from treating the matter seriously just at this time his discomfort in paris was lightened by a pleasant event his old london friend bach had been invited to write an opera amadis for paris the french are asses and always will be remarks wolfgang thereupon july ninth seventeen seventy eight they can do nothing themselves but are obliged to have recourse to foreigners bach came to paris to make the necessary arrangements and wolfgang wrote august twenty seventh seventeen seventy eight herr bach has been in paris for the last fortnight he is going to write a french opera he has come to hear the singers then he goes back to london writes the opera and returns to put it on the stage you may imagine his joy and mine at our meeting perhaps mine is more sincere but it must be acknowledged that he is an honest man and does people justice i love him as you know from my heart and have a high esteem for him as for him he does not flatter or exaggerate as some do but both to myself and others he praises me seriously and sincerely bach had introduced wolfgang to the marchal de noailles and the latter had invited them both as well as bach's bosom friend tenducci to st germain there they spent some pleasant days together and it need hardly be said that mozart composed a cena for tenducci with pianoforte oboe horn and bassoon accompaniment the instruments being taken by dependents of the marshal chiefly germans who played well meanwhile the time for decision drew near the salzburg authorities had made a definite proposal to leopold mozart as he had wished and he wrote to his son in a way which hardly left him a choice august thirty first seventeen seventy eight you do not like paris and i scarcely think you are wrong my heart and mind have been troubled for you until now and i have been obliged to play a very ticklish part concealing my anxiety under the semblance of light-heartedness in order to give the impression that you were in the best of circumstances and had money in abundance although i well knew to the contrary i was very doubtful of gaining my point because as you know the step we took and your hasty resignation left us little to hope from our haughty archbishop but my clever management has carried me through and the archbishop has agreed to all my terms both for you and myself 
you are to have five hundred florins and he expressed regret at not being able to make you kapellmeister at once you are to be allowed to act as my deputy when the work is beyond me or i am unfit to do it he said he had always intended to give you a better post etc in fact to my amazement he made the politest apologies more than that he has given five florins additional to paris so that he may take the heaviest duties and enable you to act as concertmeister again so that we shall get altogether as i told you before an income of one thousand florins now i should like to know whether you think my head is worth anything and whether or not i have done my best for you i have thought of everything the archbishop has declared himself prepared to let you travel where you will if you want to write an opera he apologized for his refusal last year by saying that he could not bear his subjects to go about begging now salzburg is a middle point between munich vienna and italy it will be easier to get a commission for an opera in munich than to get an official post for german composers are scarce the elector's death has put a stop to all appointments and war is breaking out again the duke of zweibrucken is no great lover of music but i would rather you did not leave paris until i have the signed agreement in my hand the prince and the whole court are wonderfully taken with mademoiselle weber and are absolutely determined to hear her she must stay with us her father seems to me to have no head i will manage the affair for them if they choose to follow my advice you must speak the word for her here for there is another singer wanted for operatic performances he was now so sure of the affair that he concluded his letter with the words my next letter will tell you when to set off leopold mozart was not mistaken in his son however great the sacrifice it entailed upon him he prepared to yield to the will of his father when i read your letter he answered september eleventh seventeen seventy eight i trembled with joy for i felt myself already in your embrace it is true as you will acknowledge that it is not much of a prospect for me but when i look forward to seeing you and embracing my dearest sister i think of no other prospect he did not conceal from his father his repugnance to the idea of a residence at salzburg on account of the want of congenial society the unmusical tone of the place and the little confidence placed by the archbishop in sensible and cultivated people his consolation was the permission to travel without which he would hardly have made up his mind to come a man of mediocre talent remains mediocre whether he travels or not but a man of superior talent which i cannot without hypocrisy deny myself to be becomes bad if he always remains in the same place the possibility that Eloisa Weber might come to Salzburg filled him with joy, for, indeed, if the archbishop really wanted a prima donna, he could not have a better one. He is already troubled by the thought that if people come from Salzburg for the carnival and Rosamunde's plate, poor Mademoiselle Weber will perhaps not please, or at least will not be judged of as she deserves for she has a wretched part almost a persona muta to sing a few bars between the choruses when i am in salzburg he continues i shall certainly not fail to intercede with all zeal for my dear friend and in the meantime i earnestly hope you will do your best for her you cannot give your son any greater pleasure he begs for permission to take Mannheim on his way home in order to visit the Webers. Leopold Mozart, 
knowing how deep and well-founded an antipathy wolfgang had for salzburg sought to convince him that he would find himself in a much better position there now than formerly our assured income he wrote september third seventeen seventy eight is what i have written to you and your mode of life will not come in the way of your studies and any other work you are not to play the violin at court but you have full power of direction at the clavier this was an important point to wolfgang and his father recurs to it again september twenty fourth seventeen seventy eight formerly you were really nothing but a violinist and that only as concertmeister now you are concertmeister and court organist and your chief duty is to accompany at the clavier you will not think it any disgrace to play the violin as an amateur in the first symphony since you will do it in company with the archbishop himself and all the court nobility herr haydn is a man whose musical merit you will readily acknowledge should you stigmatize him as a court fiddler because in his capacity as concertmeister he plays the viola in the smaller concerts it is all by way of amusement and i would lay a wager that rather than hear your compositions bungled you would set to yourself with a will he consoles him also by reminding him that the concerts at court are short from seven o'clock to a quarter past eight and that seldom more than four pieces are performed a symphony an aria a symphony or concerto and another aria september seventeenth seventeen seventy eight since the payment of their debts did not press they could pay off annually a few hundred gulden and live easily and comfortably you will find amusement enough here for when one has not to look at every kratzer it makes many things possible we can go to all the balls at the town hall during the carnival the munich theatrical company are to come at the end of september and to remain here the whole winter with comedies and operettas then there is our quoit playing every sunday and if we choose to go into society it will come to us everything is altered when one has a better income but the father knew that the point on which wolfgang would be most open to persuasion was not the prospect of salzburg gaieties but that of a union with his beloved mademoiselle weber and he goes on to speak on this subject too not only does he say you will soon be asked about mademoiselle weber when you are here i have praised her continually and i will do all i can to gain her a hearing but he continues as to mademoiselle weber you must not imagine that i disapprove of the acquaintance all young people must make fools of themselves you are welcome to continue your correspondence without interference from me nay more i will give you a piece of advice every one knows you here you had better address your letters to mademoiselle weber under cover to some one else and receive them in the same way unless you think my prudence a sufficient safeguard the paternal permission to make a fool of himself was calculated to hurt the lover's tenderest feelings and he does not disguise that this is the case in narrating a proof of the genuine attachment of the webbers for him the poor things he writes october fifteenth seventeen seventy eight were all in great anxiety on my account they thought i was dead not having heard from me for a whole month owing to the loss of a letter they were confirmed in their opinion because of a report in mannheim that my dear mother had died of an infectious illness they all prayed for my soul and the dear girl went every day to the church of the capuchins you will laugh no doubt but not i it touches me i cannot help it 
about the same time he received the news that aloysia had obtained an operatic engagement at munich with a good salary and he expresses the mingled feelings with which he heard it simply and truly i am as pleased at mademoiselle weber's or rather at my dear aloysia's appointment as any one who has taken such a warm interest in her affairs was sure to be but i can no longer expect the fulfilment of my earnest wish that she should settle in salzburg for the archbishop would never give her what she is to have in munich all i can hope for is that she will sometimes come to salzburg to sing in operas this turn in affairs must have strengthened mozart's secret wish to obtain an appointment under the elector of bavaria and his determination to do all he could towards this end on his journey through mannheim and munich and to turn a cold shoulder on the archbishop his father had nothing to oppose to such a project except the uncertainty of its prospects he sought therefore to convince wolfgang that his only right course now was to accept the certainty offered to him and to keep munich in view for a future time he gave him definite instructions on the point september third seventeen seventy eight since the electoral court is expected in munich on september fifteenth you can speak yourself to your friend count Seal, and perhaps to the elector himself on your journey through you can say that your father wishes you to return to salzburg and that the prince has offered you a salary of seven or eight hundred florins add on two or three hundred as concertmeister that you have accepted it from filial duty to your father although you know he has always wished to see you in the electoral service but nota bene note well no more than this you may want to write an opera in munich and you can do so best from here it cannot fail to be so for german operatic composers are very scarce schweitzer and holzbauer will not write every year and should michel write one he will soon be out michelled should there be those who throw doubts and difficulties in the way you have friends in the profession who will stand up for you and this court will also bring out something during the year in short you will be at hand it was now quite necessary that wolfgang should leave paris and in anticipating what he had to expect in salzburg he began to feel what he was leaving in paris he was angry with grimm who desired that he should be ready for his journey in a week which was impossible since he had still claims on the duc de guine and on le gros and must wait to correct the proofs of his sonatas and to sell the compositions he had with him he had no small desire to write six more trios for which he might expect good payment grimm's evident wish that he should go and his offer to pay the journey to strasburg which seemed to the father a proof of friendship was considered by wolfgang as distrust and insincerity grimm no doubt wished to be relieved of the responsibility he had undertaken as soon as possible and may have offended his protege by too open an expression of his desire but there is no doubt that he acted according to the mind of the father and in the sincere opinion that the unpractical and vacillating young man required decided treatment but wolfgang was so firmly convinced that his departure from paris was premature that he wrote to his father from strasburg october fifteenth seventeen seventy eight that it was the greatest folly in the world to go to salzburg now and only his love to his father had induced him to set aside the representations of his friends he had been praised for this but with the remark that 
if my father had known my present good circumstances and prospects and had not believed the reports of certain false friends he would not have written to me in a way that i could not withstand and i think myself that if i had not been so annoyed in the house where i was staying and if the whole thing had not come upon me like a thunderbolt so that there was no time to consider it in cool blood i should certainly have begged you to have a little more patience and to leave me in paris i assure you i should have gained both money and fame and been able to extricate you from all your embarrassments but it is done now do not imagine that i repent the step for only you my dear father only you can sweeten for me the bitterness of salzburg and we shall do it i know we shall but i must frankly own that i should come to salzburg with a lighter heart if i did not know that i was to be in the service of the court the idea is intolerable to me in the meantime business was wound up the mother's property and the heavy baggage was sent direct to salzburg and on september twenty sixth wolfgang left paris having gained much experience but little satisfaction as depressed and out of humour as he had entered it end of section five Section 6 of The Life of Mozart, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Mozart, Volume 2, by Otto Jahn. Chapter 20. The Return Home. Wolfgang's father expected that he would perform his homeward journey without any unnecessary delay, and his anxiety became serious when day after day passed, and he received no tidings of his son's approach to Strasbourg. I confessed and communicated together with your sister, he writes, October 19, 1778, and earnestly prayed for your preservation. Good old Bullinger prayed for you daily in the Holy Mass. The fact was that, instead of providing Mozart with means to travel by the diligence, which accomplished the journey to Strasbourg in a week, Grimm had satisfied himself with an ordinary conveyance, which occupied twelve days on the road. Mozart's patience was tired out in a week, and he halted at Nancy. Here he met with a German merchant, the best man in the world, who at once conceived a paternal attachment for him, and wept at the idea of their parting with this new friend wolfgang determined to travel to strasburg as soon as an opportunity of doing so cheaply should occur they were obliged to wait a considerable time and it was the middle of october before they reached strasburg things are not promising here but on the day after to-morrow saturday october seventeenth i intend quite alone to avoid expense to give a subscription concert to certain friends and connoisseurs if i had engaged any other instruments it would with the lighting have cost me more than three louis d'or and who knows if it will bring in so much it was a shrewd guess for his next letter had to announce three louis d'or as the exact sum made by this little model of a concert but the principal receipts were in bravos and bravissimos which resounded from all sides prince max of zweibrucken too honoured the concert with his presence i need scarcely say that every one was pleased i should have left strasburg immediately after this but i was advised to stay until the following saturday and give a grand concert in the theatre at this i made the identical same sum to the amazement and indignation and shame of all strasburg i must say however that my ears ached as much from the applauding and hand-clapping as if the theatre had been crammed full every one present openly and loudly denounced the conduct of their fellow townsmen and i told them all that if i could have imagined that i should have so small an audience i would gladly have given the concert gratis for the pleasure of seeing the theatre full indeed i should have preferred it for nothing can be more dismal than to lay a table for eighty guests and receive only three and then it was so cold but i soon grew warm and in order to show my gentleman of strasburg that i was not put out i played a great deal for my own entertainment 
i gave them a concerto more than i had promised and improvised for a long time at the end well it is over and done with and at least i have gained the reputation and honor besides the concerts he played publicly on the two best of silbermann's organs in the new kirka and in the thomas kirka and the roads being flooded and his departure for the present impossible he resolved to give another concert on his fete day october thirty first this he did at the solicitation and for the gratification of his friends franck de Bayer, etc and the result was one louis d'or no wonder that he was obliged to raise money in order to continue his journey a fact which he remembered years after with indignation by advice of friends who had made the journey he continued his way by diligence via mannheim the better roads and more comfortable carriage amply compensating for the detour at mannheim he alighted on november sixth and was welcomed with acclamations by his friends the journey via mannheim seemed to leopold mozart a most senseless proceeding on wolfgang's part the weber family and all his best friends had migrated to munich and there was nothing to be gained by the visit he stayed with madame Kanabik, who had not yet left and who was never tired of hearing about himself all his acquaintance tore him in pieces for as i love mannheim so mannheim loves me the old associations woke in him the old hopes and wishes the mannheim people were anxious to believe that the elector could not stand the coarse manners of the bavarians and soon would be tired of munich it was reported that madame toscani and madame urban had been so hissed that the elector had leant over his box and cried hush as this had no effect count Sio had begged some officers not to make so much noise since it displeased the elector but they answered that they had paid for their admission to the theatre and no one had any right to give them orders there every one was convinced that the elector would soon bring the court back to mannheim and wolfgang was only too ready to believe the assurances of his friends that when this took place a fixed appointment would certainly be offered to him between mannheim and salzburg what a difference the archbishop he wrote to his father november twelfth seventeen seventy eight cannot give me an equivalent for the slavery in salzburg i should feel nothing but delight were i only going to pay you a visit but the idea of settling myself for good within that beggarly court is pain and grief to me at mannheim there were already prospects of immediate employment besides and what did he want more the opportunity for dramatic composition amid the universal desolation which was spread over mannheim by the removal of the electoral court to munich patriotic men were not wanting who strove to resuscitate the intellectual and material prosperity of the town heribert von dahlberg failed indeed in his project for removing heidelberg university to mannheim but he gained the express support of the elector to the establishment of a theatre for carrying out the idea of an established national drama volume one page three sixty nine dahlberg undertook the management with zeal and intelligence and both the choice of pieces and the manner of representation were considered entirely from an artistic point of view the mannheim theatre first attained its peculiar importance and celebrity in the autumn of seventeen seventy nine when the principal members of the gotha court company with ifland among them were engaged at mannheim when mozart was on his way back from paris seiler was there with his company which was only available for operetta and vaudeville but higher notions were in the air the idea of a german national opera had never been abandoned and to enlist in its service such a composer as mozart was a prospect not to be despised how ready he was for the service we know he had not been in mannheim a week when he wrote full of enthusiasm to his father november twelfth seventeen seventy eight i have a chance of earning forty louis d'or here i should be obliged to stay six weeks or at the longest two months the cider troupe are here no doubt you know them by reputation herr dahlberg is manager and refuses to let me go until i have composed a duo drama for him i have made no objection for i have always wished to write a drama of this kind i do not remember if i told you anything about these duo dramas when i was here before i have been present at the performance of one of them twice with the greatest pleasure in fact i was never more surprised 
for i had always imagined such a piece would have no effect you know that the performers do not sing but declaim and the music is like an obligato recitative sometimes speaking is interposed with first-rate effect what i saw was medea by benda he wrote another ariadne on naxos both excellent you know that benda was always my favorite among the lutheran koppelmeisters i like these two works so much that i carry them about with me now you may imagine my joy at having to do just what i wished do you know what i should like to have recitatives of this kind in opera and only sometimes when the words are readily expressible in music to have them sung the duodrama which he was thus burning to compose was semiramis and the poet was his friend and patron herr von gemmingen volume one page four twenty nine it was he probably who wished mozart to remain to compose semiramis for dahlberg had other views for him he had written an opera cora which he much wished to have composed he had already applied to gluck and to schweitzer but not feeling sure of either of them he now sought to secure mozart the latter wrote to him mannheim november twenty fourth seventeen seventy eight monsieur le baron i have already waited upon you twice without having had the honor of finding you at liberty yesterday i believe you were at home but i was not able to speak with you i must therefore ask you to pardon me for troubling you with a few lines for it is very important to me that i should explain myself fully to you monsieur le baron you know that i am not mercenary especially when i am in a position to be of service to so great a lover and so true a connoisseur of music as yourself on the other hand i feel certain that you would not desire that i should be in any way injured by the transaction i am therefore bold enough to make my final proposition on the matter since i cannot possibly remain longer in uncertainty i undertake for twenty-five louis d'or to write a monodrama to remain here two months longer to arrange everything attend the rehearsals etc but with this proviso that let what will happen i shall be paid by the end of january that i should be free of the theatre is a matter of course this monsieur le baron is the utmost i can offer if you consider it i think you will see that i am acting very moderately as far as your opera is concerned i assure you that i should like above all things to set it to music that i could not undertake such a work as that for twenty-five louis d'or you will readily allow for it would contain at the most moderate computation quite as much work again as a monodrama the only thing that would make me hesitate to undertake it is that as you tell me gluck and schweitzer are already writing it but even supposing that you offered me fifty louis d'or for it i would as an honest man dissuade you from it what is to become of an opera without singers either male or female at the same time if there were any prospect of its being well produced i would not refuse to undertake the work from regard for you and it would be no trifle i give you my word of honour now i have told you my ideas clearly and straightforwardly and i must beg for a speedy decision if i could have an answer to-day i should be all the better pleased for i have heard that some one is going to travel alone to munich next thursday and i would gladly profit by the opportunity mozart would hardly have left mannheim as long as a glimmer of hope remained he who was so overjoyed at finding employment there that he wrote to his father november twelfth seventeen seventy eight they are arranging an academie des amateurs here like the one in paris herr franzel is to lead the violins and i am writing them a concerto for clavier and violin but his father who was very dissatisfied with the foolish fancy for remaining in mannheim came to the point and represented to him november nineteenth seventeen seventy eight how impossible it would be for the elector to return to mannheim it was equally undesirable now to seek a post in the bavarian service since the death of karl theodore had let loose on the world a whole army of artists who are in mannheim and munich seeking a mode of livelihood the duke of zweibrucken himself had an orchestra of thirty-six performers and the former mannheim establishment cost eighty thousand florins he cares nothing for the possible earning of forty louis d'or but emphatically orders set off as soon as you receive this 
and to meet any conceivable remonstrance he once more sets plainly forth the true position of affairs november twenty third seventeen seventy eight there are two things of which your head is full and which obscure your true judgment the first and principal is your love for mademoiselle weber to which i am not altogether opposed i was not formerly when her father was poor and why should i be so now when she may make your fortune instead of you hers i conjecture that her father is aware of your love since all mannheim knows it since herr fiala oboist in salzburg has heard it since herr bullinger who teaches at count laudron's told me of it he travelled with some mannheim musicians from elwang where he was in the vacation and they could talk of nothing but your cleverness compositions and love for mademoiselle weber in salzburg the father goes on he would be so near munich that he could easily go there or mademoiselle weber could come to salzburg where she might stay with them opportunities would not be wanting fiala had told the archbishop a great deal about mademoiselle weber's singing and wolfgang's good prospects in mannheim he might also invite his other friends Kanabik, wendlin ritter ram they would all find hospitable welcome in his father's house most especially will your acceptance of the present office which is the second subject of which your head is full be your only certain opportunity for revisiting italy which is what i have more at heart than anything else and your acceptance is indispensably necessary unless you have the abominable and unfilial desire to bring scorn and derision on your anxious father on that father who has sacrificed every hour of his life to his children to bring them credit and honour i am not in a position to pay my debts which now amount in all to one thousand florins unless you lighten the payment by the receipt of your salary i can certainly pay off four hundred florins a year and live comfortably with you two i should like if it is the will of god to live a few years more and to pay my debts and then you may if you choose run your head against the wall at once but no your heart is good you are not wicked only thoughtless it will all come this was not to be withstood wolfgang wrote that he would set off on december ninth but he still declined to travel the shortest way december third seventeen seventy eight i must tell you what a good opportunity i have for a travelling companion next wednesday no other than the bishop of kaisersheim one of my friends mentioned me to him he remembered my name and expressed great pleasure at the idea of travelling with me he is a thoroughly kind good man although he is a priest and a prelate so that i shall go via kaisersheim instead of stuttgart the farewell to mannheim was a sad one both to mozart and his friends madame Kanabik, who had earned the right to be considered as his best and truest friend and who had placed implicit confidence in him was specially sorrowful she refused to rise for his early departure feeling unequal to the leave-taking and he crept silently away that he might not add to her distress he was loath to give up his monodrama i am now writing he says december third seventeen seventy eight to please herr von gemmingen and myself the first act of the declamatory opera which i was to have finished here as it is i shall take it with me and go on with it at home my eagerness for this kind of composition is uncontrollable the bishop took such an extraordinary liking for him that he was persuaded to stay at kaisersheim and to make an expedition with his host to munich where he arrived on december twenty fifth here he looked forward to some pleasant days in the society of all his mannheim friends and above all to reunion with his beloved aloysia in order that nothing might be wanting to his pleasure he begged his cousin to come to munich and hinted that she might have an important part to play there he had no doubt of the success of his suit but he almost immediately after received a letter from his father ordering him in the most positive manner to set out by the first diligence in january and not on any account to be persuaded by Kanabik to make a further postponement l mozart foresaw that wolfgang would make another effort to escape the slavery in salzburg and that his friends would encourage him to hope for a place under the court at munich 
in anticipation of this he once more laid plainly before him that the settlement in salzburg would afford the only possibility of putting their affairs in order this representation arrived very inopportunely for wolfgang Kanabik and Roth were in point of fact working hand and foot for him by their advice he had already undertaken to write a mass for the elector and the sonatas volume one page four fifteen two page seventy which he had dedicated to the electress had arrived just in time to be presented by him in person and in the midst of all this his father's letter dashed his hopes to the ground and added to his gloomy anticipations of life in salzburg the fear that he would not be kindly received he opened his heart to their old friend the flautist becca volume one page two twenty eight who moved him still further by his account of the kindness and indulgence of his father i have never written so badly before he writes to his father december twenty ninth seventeen seventy eight i cannot do it my heart is too much inclined for weeping i hope you will soon write and console me becca also wrote on behalf of wolfgang he burns with desire to embrace his dearest and best beloved father as soon as his present circumstances will allow of it he almost makes me lose my composure for i was an hour or more in quieting his tears he has the best heart in the world i have never seen a child with a more loving and tender affection for his father than your son he has a little misgiving lest your reception of him should not be as tender as he could wish but i hope quite otherwise from your fatherly heart his heart is so pure so childlike so open to me how much more so will it not be to his father no one can hear him speak without doing him justice as the best intentioned most earnest and most honourable of men el mozart answered at once that his son might rely on the most loving welcome and that everything would be done to entertain him the autumn festivities and quaint prize meetings had been postponed on his account but he bid him observe that his long delay the appointment being already four months old is beginning to make the archbishop impatient and it must not go so far as to cause him to draw back in his turn to this wolfgang answered january eighth seventeen seventy nine i assure you my dear father that i feel only pleasure in coming to you not to salzburg now that i see by your last letter that you have learnt to know me better there has been no other cause for this last postponement of my journey home than the doubt i felt which when i could no longer contain myself i confided to my friend becca as to my reception what other cause could there be i know that i am not guilty of anything that should make me feel your reproaches i have committed no fault for i call that only a fault which is not becoming to an honourable man and a christian i look forward with delight to many pleasant and happy days but only in the society of you and my dear sister i give you my honour that i cannot endure salzburg and its inhabitants that is natives of salzburg their speech and their way of living are thoroughly distasteful to me mozart had other causes than this for despondency before he left munich he was destined to be painfully undeceived he had been kindly welcomed by the webers who insisted on his staying with them aloysia had made striking progress as a vocalist and mozart as might well be expected from him rendered anew his musical homage to her by writing for her liet de genio seventeen seventy nine a grand aria three sixteen k he had designedly chosen as a subject the recitative and air with which alceste first enters in gluck's italian opera Schweitzer's alceste had been performed in munich so that mozart entered the lists with both composers in order to provide his friends rahm and ritter with a piece of brilliant execution he made the oboe and bassoon accompany obligato and emulate the voice part the song is admirably adapted for a bavura piece affording the singer an opportunity for the display of varied powers and great compass together with artistic cultivation of the voice the recitative might be considered as an attempt at a dramatic delivery of a grand and dignified kind the song itself affords in both its parts 
a dante sostenuto e cantabile and allegro assai the most charming instances of sustained singing and brilliant execution it is written for a high soprano seldom going so low as generally upwards from what is expected of the singer in the way of compass and volubility may be judged by passages such as in the allegro but the importance of this song does not depend alone on the brilliancy of its passages the recitative undeniably the most important section of the composition is second to none of mozart's later recitatives in depth and truth of expression and noble beauty and is richly provided with unexpected harmonic changes such as he used more sparingly in later songs the very first entry of the voice is striking and beautiful with a long and pathetic prelude and the close of the recitative is equally effective if this carefully and minutely elaborated recitative can be compared with gluck's simple secco recitative there can be no doubt that mozart's is far superior both in fertility of invention and marked characterization but it must not be left out of account that if mozart treating the recitative and air as one independent whole was right to emphasize and elaborate details gluck had to consider the situation in its connection with a greater whole in which respect his simple but expressive recitative is quite in its right place the song itself in depth of tragic pathos is not altogether on a level with the recitative it consists of two movements an andantino and an allegro very nearly equal in length and compass and each of them independently arranged and elaborated the motifs in both are simple and expressive especially the passionate middle part of the allegro in c minor but in performance the attention to bravura necessitated by the emulation of the wind instruments detracts from the intensity and earnestness of tone the treatment is masterly both of the voice and the two instruments whether considered singly or in relation to each other it is equally so of the orchestra quartet and horns which forms a foundation for the free movement of the solo parts in the hands of a first-rate performer the song could not fail to have a brilliant and striking effect but the exclusive reference to individual talents and executive powers detracted of necessity from the dramatic effect and if the composer had given full sway to his passions the harmony he calculated on between his work and the performer would have been lost as far as we can judge of aloysia weber as a singer from the songs composed for her by mozart the powerful rendering of violent and fiery passion was not her forte her delivery cannot be said to have been wanting in depth of feeling and yet a certain moderation seems to have been peculiar to her which mozart turned to account as an element of artistic harmony this song was a parting salutation to aloysia weber a touching memorial of the parting is preserved in the voice part of a song ah c'est in ciel written by mozart's hand in seventeen eighty eight five thirty eight k at the close of it she has written the words ne giomi tuoi felici pensa qualche volta al popoli di tessalia el mozart with his custom of reckoning on the selfishness of mankind had already expressed apprehension lest weber now that he no longer required wolfgang's good offices should cease to desire his friendship this was not indeed the case but he found a great change in aloysia's sentiments she appeared no longer to recognize him for whom she had once wept so mozart sat down to the clavier and sang loud ich las das mädel gern das mich nicht bill this renunciation might satisfy his pride but not his heart his love was too true and deep to evaporate as lightly as the whim of a woman whose true character he learnt to know later and yet he wrote from vienna to his father may sixteenth seventeen eighty one i was a fool about longa's wife that is certain but who is not when he is in love i loved her in very deed and i feel she is not yet indifferent to me a good thing for me that her husband is a jealous fool and never lets her out of his sight so that i seldom see her on january seventh seventeen seventy nine mozart was presented to the electress by Kanabik and handed her the sonatas he had composed for her she conversed with him very graciously for a good half hour a few days later he saw schweitzer's alceste which was at the carnival opera 
and at last after repeated injunctions from his father he set out for salzburg in the comfortable carriage of his fellow traveller a salzburg merchant named krischwender end of section six section seven of the life of mozart volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by m a henson the life of mozart volume two by otto jan section seven chapter twenty one court service in salzburg Mozart was welcomed to the paternal roof with open arms. Everything was prepared for his reception. A convenient cupboard and the clavichord were placed in his room. The cook, Teresa, had cooked capons without number. The high steward, Count von Fermian, offered him his horses, and Dr. Prexel also placed his beautiful bay mare at his disposal. In short, Mozart's return home was a happy and triumphant event to all the good friends of his youth. We know the feelings with which he returned, disappointed in his hopes of rapid and brilliant success. He returned to the old condition of things, and the yoke must have pressed on him all the more heavily now that his illusions were dispelled and he no longer saw a prospect of shaking it off. He had buried his mother in a foreign land, and his warm true heart had been deceived in its first love. In poverty he returned to his father's house. He was not in a position to see as clearly as we do now how powerfully his added experience of life and manifold artistic impressions had contributed to his moral and mental development. And he could scarcely be expected to look to this development for the strength and courage necessary to face the future. The commencement of his residence in Salzburg was cheered by the presence of his lively young cousin. She followed him from Munich on his entreaties to pay a visit of some weeks to her uncle. Mozart's amiability and cordial manners renewed many pleasant intimacies, but the actual cause of his distaste to Salzburg, viz. the want of cultivation and of a disinterested love of art among its inhabitants, remained as before, and his long absence was likely to make him feel it all the more sensibly. The archbishop, compelled by circumstances and his surroundings to recall Mozart, had not by any means forgiven his voluntary resignation of his former office, and the disinclination to return which Mozart had so evidently displayed was certainly not calculated to appease his ill will. We shall soon learn the kind of treatment which Mozart had to expect from him. The Salzburg public are described by Wolfgang in a letter to his father, May 26, 1781. When I play in Salzburg, or when any of my compositions are performed, the audience might just as well be chairs or tables. He declares that, Although he actually loves work far better than idleness, the want of congenial intercourse and inspiring surroundings make it often almost impossible for him to set to work at composition. And why? Because my mind is not at ease. Again, he says, April 8, 1781. To dawdle away one's youth in such a wretched hole is sad enough, and harmful besides. This and similar expressions might lead one to suppose that Mozart had neglected composition during these years, but a survey of the works which are known to us suffices to dispel this idea. His musical activity took, as a matter of course in all essential points, the same direction as formerly. His official position as concertmeister and as court and cathedral organist for so he was entered in the Salzburg court calendar, gave occasion for instrumental and church compositions, the style and materials of which were as restricted as before. The first instrumental composition, in G major, 318K, 
dated April 26, 1779, seems to have been written for some very special occasion. The orchestra is strongly appointed. Besides the quartet, there are two flutes, two oboes, two bassoons, four horns in G and D, and two trumpets in C, and used for effects which must have startled the Salzburgers. It is in the form now usual for overtures, but out of date for concert symphonies, viz. three connected movements, Allegro Spiritoso, 4-4, four, four, which contains, besides the principal energetic motif with which it begins, and which constantly recurs in different ways, two independent, quieter motifs in succession, Andante 3-8, gentle and soft, somewhat longer than is usual for middle movements, but simple and without thematic elaboration. It leads back to the first allegro, shortened by the omission of the second subordinate subject, and modified in the elaboration. The individual and dramatic character of this composition, expressed most particularly in the commencement and the close of it, makes it probable that it was written as an introduction to a drama. We shall see that there were no lack of occasions for such works and belonging to this period are two symphonies in the usual three movements. One, the earlier in B major, 319K, part two, composed in the summer, July 9, of 1779, was evidently the results of a pleased frame of mind. It is a genuine product of Mozart's humor, lively, cheerful, and full of grace and feeling. The second, a year later, August 29, 1780, in C major, 338K, part 10, is grander in conception and more serious in tone. This is particularly noticeable in the first movement. A constant propensity to fall into the minor key blends strength and decision with an expression not so much of melancholy as of consolation. In perfect harmony of conception, the simple and fervent Andante di Molto combines exceeding tenderness with a quiet depth of tone. The contrasting instrumentation is very effective in this work. The first movement is powerful and brilliant, but in the second, only stringed instruments with double tenors are employed. The last movement is animated throughout, and sometimes the orchestral treatment is rapid and impetuous. A serenade in D major, 320K, belongs also to 1779, composed probably for some special festival, and, except that the march is omitted, quite in the style of the early already noticed serenades 2, volume 1, page 301. A short adagio serves as introduction to a brilliant allegro, arranged exactly like the first movement of a symphony, and worked out at considerable length. To this follows a minuet. Then there is inserted a concertante, described as such in the title, consisting of two movements, an andante grazioso, 3-4, and a rondo allegro ma non troppo, 2-4, both in G major. In earlier days, when Mozart figured as a violin player, a violin solo played the chief part in such compositions. But now the wind instruments, two flutes, two oboes and two bassoons are employed concertante. The stringed instruments and horns form the accompaniment proper. These two pieces are elaborated with great care and accuracy, and are clear and perspicuous as well as tender and graceful. The rondo is somewhat lighter in tone than the first movement. Of bravura, properly so called, there is none to be found and the ornamental passages are confined to moderate amplifications of the melodies. The instruments are so low in that they bear their principal part throughout, concertante in that they emulate each other in manifold and changing combinations. Their strife is playful, with a sometimes almost mischievous tone. The andantino, which follows, offers a strong contrast to both movements of the concertante. This is marked at once by the fact that the stringed instruments are here put forward as the exponents of the musical idea. While the very sparely used wind instruments only emphasize certain sharp points of detail, but the contrast is deeper than this, 
The light and sunshiny mood of the two previous movements accentuates the serious melancholy of the Andantino, which seems to tell not of the pain of an existing passion, but of the inner peace of a sorrow overcome. After a less noticeable minuet, the serenade closes with a long, elaborate presto, an important movement full of life and force. The most emphatic contrapuntal arrangement of the principal theme is in this middle passage. It is lively and original, as well as technically correct. The melodies and subjects of these works show unmistakable progress. They are of a mature invention, have more musical substance, if the expression may be allowed, more delicacy and nobility of apprehension. Technical progress is visible in the greater freedom of the contrapuntal treatment which had already been fully developed in Mozart's vocal compositions. This is most obviously apparent in those parts where thematic elaboration predominates, which are richer and freer than hitherto. There are also many motifs which owe their importance mainly to the contrapuntal treatment. But, above all, we recognize Mozart's sure tact in preserving the limits that prevent the interest in the different combinations of counterpoint to which a motive can be subjected from becoming essentially technical and losing its artistic character. Equally surely has his genius preserved him from the mistake of ascribing any absolute value to the contrapuntal method or favoring the logical element which lies in it to the disadvantage of sensuous beauty. He makes use of the forms of counterpoint only to arrest the attention and to heighten the interest, without wearying the mind, intruding a foreign element into the original essence of the work, or neglecting beauty of form. Mozart never forgets that music must be melodious. Therefore, a receptive, although uncultivated hearer, receives a pleasing impression from artistic and even intricate passages without at all suspecting the difficulties which he enjoys. But the influence of the contrapuntal method reaches far deeper than well-defined and scholastic forms. Just as a well-considered discourse does not consist merely in the observance of syllogistic forms, the principle of the free movement of the separate members of one whole penetrates the minutest divisions, and the combined effects of creative ability and artistic cultivation are nowhere so well displayed as in the independent construction of the separate elements which go to form the whole work. We admire Mozart's art in devising his plan, in accurately distributing his principal parts, and in disposing his lights and shades, but where he is in truth inexhaustible is in his power of strewing round a wealth of small touches which assist the characterization and give to each part its peculiar effect and, in some respect, the justification of its existence. This power, which always seems to have something at command beyond the necessities of the case, although, in fact, every detail which seems to be the chance expression of individual vigor is conditioned of necessity by the whole conception, is the prerogative of genuine creative genius. It approaches the eternal power of nature, whose apparent prodigality is revealed to the deeper view as the wisest economy, or rather, as the unruffled harmony of a great whole. So a statue by Phidias suggests to the spectator the impression of animated nature, because it not merely puts before his eyes in general features a representation of the bodily form of man, but suggests to him the totality of the muscular movements which are in a living body, in incessant activity. It is in art as in nature. The further we penetrate, the fewer and less complex become the governing forces and impulses. Many details may be considered as trifling until it is asked whether they, in their place, have the required effect as part of the whole. When a work of art gives an effect of an artistic whole in a way which cannot be explained by a consideration of its apparently insignificant parts, this may be taken as the surest proof that the artist worked downwards from his conception of a great whole to the minutest details of his work. We must not undervalue, on the other hand, Mozart's more exact knowledge and freer use than formerly of external means. His residence in Mannheim had given him an altogether new conception of the performance of a good orchestra. 
both as to sound effects and execution. The result is present in these compositions, although Salzburg's surroundings and customs limited him greatly in his choice of means. It may be that, for these reasons, his instrumental combinations show no marked progress on former works, but the skillful use of the forces at his command became all the more apparent. It is remarkable how, without any alteration in the instrumentation as a whole, the body of sound has become richer and fuller, the result of a more careful consideration of the particular nature of each instrument. This is most striking in the management of the wind instruments. The bassoons predominate throughout, independently treated, whereas formerly they only strengthen the bass, and the use of the horns, with their long, sustained notes, shows marked progress. The combination of the wind instruments, sometimes in opposition to the stringed instruments, sometimes in unison with them, is another advance. Effective as are the wind instruments in combination, they are still more so in the delicacy of their individual features, and the perfection of their treatment could not fail to influence that of the stringed instruments, which show the same higher conception of what orchestral performances ought to be. The Mannheim experiences were not without result either in respect to the executive delivery of the orchestra. Mozart must have been particularly impressed with the effect of crescendo, for almost in every passage we meet with phrases built upon a long-drawn crescendo. The contrast between piano and forte is also made the most of. Regular alterations of long passages, forte and piano, were formerly the custom, but now we have a rapid succession of very varied shades, fortissimo and pianissimo being also brought into use. But all these are only the outward signs of a higher intellectual apprehension, for which it was necessary also to give credit to the performers, the composer, far from relying only on external effect, makes it the mere expression of the deeper meaning and intrinsic value of his compositions. It is from this point of view that the progress made by Mozart in the manipulation of his artistic materials acquires its true worth in the eyes of a musical critic. We may imagine that Mozart found it no easy task to substitute a completely new style of execution for the time-honored customs of the Salzburg band. The energy with which he was able to, at a later date, inspire the Leipzig Orchestra, wedded as it was to its own traditions, gives some indication of his way of proceeding as a young man at Salzburg. His cousin used to hold forth latter on Mozart's eccentric behavior when conducting, and we may imagine that she witnessed some of the extraordinary scenes she describes during her present visit to Salzburg. Mozart never appeared again as a violin player and we therefore find no compositions for the violin belonging to this period. After such an expression of opinion concerning the Salzburg public as that noted above, we cannot wonder that he was not over-anxious to appear before them as a clavier player. We doubtless owe the concerto for two claviers with orchestral accompaniment in E-flat major, 365K, part 17, to his wish to play a duet with his sister. In design and treatment, it is essentially similar to the earlier triple concerto. There is no intention apparent of making the two instruments independent. The players emulate each other in the delivery of the melodies and passages, sometimes together, sometimes in succession, often breaking off in rapid changes and interruptions. The melodies are sometimes simply repeated, sometimes with variations so divided between the two instruments that neither can be said to have the advantage over the other. There are somewhat greater difficulties of execution than have been usual hitherto. A few passages, for instance, in octaves and thirds, but very modest ones. The passages generally have more variety and elegance. The orchestra is simply and judiciously, but very delicately treated. The wind instruments in sustained chords as a foundation for the clavier passages. The effect of the crescendo and a greater attention to light and shade show the influence of Mannheim. Altogether, the concerto is a well-arranged composition, clear and melodious, as well as accurately constructed with a free, cheerful expression, which is most strikingly shown in the fresh gaiety of the last movement. As organist, Mozart was under the necessity of playing the organ at festivals, but as a rule, only for accompaniments and for interludes at set places, which gave him opportunities for improvising, his special delight. 
we have some organ sonatas with orchestral accompaniments belonging to this time. 328, 329, 336K. Quite in the style of those already noticed compositions after the fashion of the first movement of a sonata, without a trace of ecclesiastical severity, either in the technical construction, which is very light, or in the style, which is brilliant and cheerful. The organ occurs as an obligato instrument, only in one of these sonatas, 329K, which is the most elaborated, but still very moderate in style and without any florid passages. Of more important church compositions, there belong to this period two masses in C major, of which the earlier, 317K, is one of Mozart's best-known works of the kind, bearing date March 23, 1779, and the latter, 337K, which was written in March 1780. They are quite after the prescribed manner, not too long, not too serious, and yet not light, in no respect difficult or important, or closely allied in substance and treatment to the other works which have already been analyzed. The easy invention, never at a loss for fitting expression, the talent for organization which arranges the parts into a connected and coherent whole, the technical sureness which gives to every detail its due share of interest. Above all, the inexhaustible gift of melody and symmetry, all these qualities are here to be found. And it is by their aid that, in spite of hampering circumstances, such great and wealthy work was done. Nevertheless, these masses show more plainly, even than earlier works of the same kind, how the fetters of outward control check the impulses of inner strength and feeling. We see Mozart, as it were, in court dress. He is expert enough to move in it with tolerable freedom, but he is disguised rather than clothed. Conventional influence is most apparent in the instrumentation which, as a whole, is little different from that of the earlier works. Some passages are remarkable even in their instrumentation. For instance, the Et Incarnatus and Crucifixus of the first Mass have an expressive violin passage, and in the second, the treatment of the wind instruments in the Crucifixus and Resurrexit, and the organ, oboe, and bassoon in emulation with the voice in the Anus Dei, remind us of Mannheim. But these are details, and in its general features the tone coloring of the orchestra is the same as formerly. Rapid violin passages predominate, the trombone follows the voice regularly and forte, and so on. But in other respects, original features are not wanting, nor even passages of surprising beauty to which belongs, for instance, the usual melodious close of the first mass, in which the Benedictus, contrary to custom in a serious choral movement, is in strict counterpoint. These are signs of a great genius, which must make us regret all the more that the whole work is not dedicated and inspired by the same spirit. To this period also, according to the handwriting, belongs a curie sketched by Mozart, and not preserved quite complete, 328K, which has been completed and printed as a Regina Coeli by Sadler. It is characterized by a rapid sextole package, which is described among the wind instruments in uninterrupted movement. The voices take to their own independent course throughout. Among other unfinished attempts by Mozart preserved in the Mozarteum at Salzburg, are in both by the handwriting and instrumentation as well as from other reasons, to be referred to this time, we may particularize the beginning of a mass with obligato organ, on 13k, and the beginning two pages of a curie, on 16k, which is in such strict counterpoint that the mass, if it had been finished, would have been among the most elaborate of them all. But Mozart had neither inducement nor the means for producing such compositions in Salzburg. Two Vespers by Mozart, 321, 339 K, of the years 1779 and 1780, have much the same resemblance in substance and compass to masses that litanies had at 
an earlier period. But they stand higher in many respects. Five psalms and the Virgin's hymn of praise from the part of the Vespers, which is in varied chant, every division ends with the doxology, and is complete in itself. In the literary, the principal part is framed in, as it were, by two equally original and characteristic movements, the Kyrie and Anus. The Vespers, on the other hand, consist of six separate movements, which have no connection, either actual or artistic. Most striking differences of key are therefore permissible than is generally the case with the movements of one composition, and it was possible to put together at pleasure psalms belonging to different compositions, sometimes even by different composers. The Dixit and Magnificat, as the two corner posts, were considered the principal parts. They were generally specially composed, and others inserted between them. As the words of the doxology, Gloria Patri, recur at the close of each movement, it would have been natural that the idea should arise of giving them the same musical rendering, and suggesting a relation between the different movements by this kind of refrain. But they are, on the contrary, in close connection with the words to which they serve as a conclusion. So as to characterize the use of general formula as dependent on the special nature of each case. For the most part, therefore, a principal subject of the piece which it concludes is utilized for the doxology, and it is astonishing of what a variety of appropriate and expressive musical renderings these words are capable. A settled custom became established, both as to the general conception and the distinguishing characteristics of these compositions, which was closely followed even by Mozart. In the main, the conception and treatment resemble those of the litanies. The effort is evident to reconcile the requirements of divine service with the prevailing and somewhat trivial musical taste of the times. But the Vespers preserve the dignity and solemnity of church music more strictly than the litanies. There is no sign of a leaning to operatic style. Concessions to bravura are sparely and exceptionally made. The orchestra preserves the simplicity of the traditional church orchestra, and limited scope is allowed even to grace and pleasing fancies. Nevertheless, the expression of dignity and solemnity shows the influence of a time which did not exact from sacred art the absorption of the inner man in the sacred and the divine, but was satisfied with a decent observance of the forms of external homage. It was left to the artist, who had a deeper spiritual craving, and such a delicate artistic sense as forbade the use of form without substance, to give a higher tone to his work. In this sense, we may include by far the larger portions of these vespers among Mozart's great works. As concerns the musical construction in detail, a narrow mode of treatment resulted throughout form the conditions of worship. The words had to be composed straight through, just as in short masses. A broader rendering of separate portions which might seem to lend themselves to musical expression was not admitted, and the endeavor after a dramatic characterization of certain points did not come within the artistic usages of the time. The important point, therefore, was not to render the words in music, so as to give them a new and fitting expression to each detail but to invent characteristic motifs for the important points which should be suitable for further elaboration, and which, in spite of individual distinction, should spring from the fundamental conception of the whole work. The task of the composer is not made easier by the words of the psalms. They do not offer a good basis for musical construction, nor are the ideas conveyed in them generally such as would incite to musical production. The composer must therefore be original in no ordinary degree as it is excusable if he now and then handles the rules of forms of his art with a certain amount of abruptness, and even makes verbal expressions subservient to them, so far as it can be done without a harmful pressure. In order to introduce variety among these closely allied compositions, a certain type had been formed, which was not exactly the inevitable consequence of the effort to satisfy the rules of art 
and of good taste, but as in the litanies, exercised considerable influence over the treatment of the text. The two vespers we are considering are very similar in form and workmanship. Various parts are treated in both with marked preference, and it is scarcely possible to place one before the other in merit, except that perhaps the earlier one is the more serious. The first psalm, Dixit Dominus, is formed into an animated, restless movement, full of strength and dignity. While the same tone predominates in both, there is more fire and brilliancy in the first composition, more mildness and tranquility in the second. This kind of treatment may be compared to that of the Gloria and Credo of the Mass, without any sustained thematic elaboration. Certain principal motifs are maintained and emphasized in different ways. The animated string passages are not only in varied harmonic combinations, either imitative or a combination of the different subjects. The voices are free and independent, but with a few trifling exceptions they are treated harmonically. Solo voices sometimes alternate with the chorus, but without any special prominence. The second psalm, Confitebor Tibi Domine, is in the earlier Vesper, 321k, a chorale with solo intermixed, accompanied by the organ and stringed instruments, E minor 3-4. This mature and beautiful composition approaches the Mass in F major, both in tender and fervent sentiment, and in simplicity and purity of form. But there the treatment is counterpuntal throughout. Here it is essentially harmonic. The independent progress of the voices displays a succession of rich and startling harmonies in animated but natural development, notwithstanding many suspensions and unexpected turns. They are always clear and melodious, and always the true and natural expression of the sentiment to be conveyed. The frame of mind represented is not one of fanatical remorse, but rather of a soul penetrated with the feeling of guilt and impelled to acknowledge it with shame and anguish. The moderate expression of such a mood, which might easily pass over into the sentimental, coincides with the symmetry of form observable in the main features as well as in the details of the work. The corresponding movement of the second Vesper, 339k, is not to be placed on the same level as this. It maintains on the whole the tone of the first movement, with an increase in earnestness, and is a clever and melodious composition, with good effect in its place, but the poetical beauty of the other is altogether wanting. The third psalm, Beatus Vir, has least original coloring. It is in both Vespers a lively, powerful, one might almost say, cheerful movement, suggestive of the Gloria or Credo of more than one Mass but without the solemnity which characterizes them. Here, too, solo voices alternate with the chorus without interrupting the steady flow of the composition. In the earlier work, there are some beautiful harmonic effects. In the later, contrapuntal phrases sometimes occur. An animated, rapid accompaniment by the violin is common to both. As in the litany, the Pignus Futurare Gloriae, so in the Vesper, the fourth psalm, Laudate Pueri was treated in severe counterpoint. And here, it was that a thoroughly trained church composer made good his claim to the title. In the first of the Vespers that we are considering, this psalm is a clever piece of counterpoint, original in form and deviating from the strict regularity which usually characterizes Mozart. It begins with an infinite canon. The twelve bars melody for the soprano is imitated three bars later by the alto in unison, then follows the tenor, an octave higher, and then the bass in unison. After the completion of the melody, the soprano again takes it up, alto and tenor follow. The regular progress of the canon is then broken by a complete final cadenza in which all the voices unite on the last note of the bass melody. A short theme introduced by the bass is imitated by the other parts in similar or in contrary motion, and soon passes over into a short passage ending in D minor. 
Hereupon, the soprano interposes with a new and characteristic melody, the first bars of which are taken up by the other voices. But instead of a further elaboration, a new theme is introduced by the alto, followed by a counter theme, which are both imitated together. Whereupon the alto raises a new melody, which is figured by the other parts in imitation as cantus firmus, and closes in A minor. Then the alto begins with the previous soprano subject, but now in F major. The soprano follows with the second, but the imitative figuring soon gives place to a fine harmonic elaboration, followed by the third passage. The imitative parts maintain the same character, and the alto has now another cantus firmus. To this at last is appended a long coda, formed of detachments of previous subjects, variously elaborated in stretto and contrary motion ending in organ point on the dominant. It cannot fail to be remarked how tuneful and melodious, as well as independent, characteristic, and striking in their effect are these different parts. The melodies which compose the cantus firmus may have been, in part at least, borrowed from church tones. Far more ambitious is the contrapuntal work in the second vesper, which consists of a close succession of difficult problems solved after the severest and most rigorous rules. After the first regular enunciation of the theme, there occurs a second motif, which is at first treated freely, and issues into a short harmonic passage, which is afterwards used again as an interlude. Then the two motifs are combined and elaborated together, after which this section closes on the chord of the dominant in a stretto arrangement of the chief subject, while the violins take up the subordinate motif. When the chief subject has again asserted itself, therefore follows its inversion as a counter-subject and regular elaboration, ending in the above interlude, after which the subject and its inversion appear together as an organ point on the fundamental tone, while the violins proceed with an independent accompaniment. After the previous stretto has again occurred on the chord of the dominant, the first two subjects reappear in new original climacteric treatment, divided between the voices and the accompaniment. A free conclusion brings the artistic and forceful work to an end. As if for refreshment after this effort, the fifth psalm, Laudate Dominum, is treated as a solo movement of a pleasing character. In the earlier Vesper, it is a soprano solo with organ obligato, not certainly set in prescribed aria form, but in its brilliant passages and easy grouping of the melodies more akin to secular music than any other of Mozart's church compositions of this period. In the second Vesper, the psalm has a more solemn character, but even here it is a mild and tender soprano solo, somewhat pastoral in tone, and supported by a solo bassoon, simple throughout and with a fine climax at the close, the doxology being sung by the chorus. The Virgin's Hymn of Praise, Magnificat Amina Mea, which forms the conclusion of the Vespers, is by its form the part best fitted for musical rendering. But the connection in which it here stands with the preceding psalms obliges a corresponding treatment both as to extent and conception. We must not therefore look either for a comprehensive treatment giving free development to the details of the separate sentences, such as it is to be found in the Magnificats of some great masters, or for such an amount of dramatic characterization as the words give scope for. The text is tersely and precisely treated with the avowed intention of concluding the work with a movement in contrast to the first psalm. This is evident not only in the external arrangement, which introduces trumpets and drums, and returns to the original key, but in the technical treatment and the closely allied tone of expression. The expression of firm and cheerful confidence, which is common to both, is naturally accentuated in the Magnificat in accordance with the text and the lively expectation of the first psalm is now turned into thanksgiving for its fulfillment. The technical treatment of the Magnificat is consistently more important and animated, especially in its extended use of the forms of counterpoint. But in the main, the two compositions have the same tone and color, and the same condensed and impulsive style. The words Magnificat Amina Mea Dominum form a solemn introduction as a short, slow movement. Et exaltavit, 
is in quicker tempo, which is maintained to the end, chorus and solo alternating in the usual way. Here again, it is to be noticed, the different points are accentuated in the earlier Magnificat, chiefly by harmonic means, in the second chiefly by counterpoint. Having in these works followed Mozart's steady upward progress along the path which he had previously entered on, a progress maintained against most unfavorable surroundings, let us now turn to his attempts in the new province of music as an adjunct to the drama, remembering his intense desire to write for the stage, a desire which had been increased by the manifold influences of his travels. We shall not be surprised that even theatrical undertakings in Salzburg offered him the opportunity he sought. When he returned home, a theatrical company was performing under Bohm's management. In 1780, we find Schikaneder there with his traveling troupe, a friend of the Mozart family, joining in their quoit contests and quite ready to turn Wolfgang's talents to his own advantage. Two great works owe their origin to these performances although the exact time of their production cannot now be ascertained. End of Section 7 Read by M. A. Henson Houston, Texas September 2022section 8 of the life of mozart volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by m a henson the life of mozart volume 2 by otto jan section 8 chapter 21 court service in salzburg part 2 the first is the music to Thamos, King of Egypt, 345K, an heroic drama by Baron Taub. Phil von Gebler, who, in spite of his exalted position, had devoted himself zealously since 1769 to the reform of the Vienna Theatre. The contents of the piece need be given but briefly, since it is as good as lost. Menes, king of Egypt, has been deposed by a usurper, Ramses, and as it is thought, assassinated. But he is living under the name of Sethos, as high priest of the Temple of the Sun. The secret being known only to the priest, Hammon, and the general fanes. After the death of Ramses, his son Thamos is heir to the throne. The day arrives when Thamos attains majority is to be invested with the diadem and to select a bride. The friends of Menes seek in vain to persuade him to dispute the throne. He will not oppose the noble youth whom he loves and esteems. But Pharaon, a prince and confidant of Thamos, has, in conjunction with Mirza, the chief of the virgins of the sun, organized a conspiracy against Thamos and won over a portion of the army. Tharsis, daughter of Menes, who is believed by all, even her father, to be dead, has been brought up by Mirza under the name of Sais. It is arranged that she will be proclaimed rightful heir to the throne, and as she will have the right to choose her consort, Mirza will secure her beforehand for Pharaoh. When she discovers that Sais loves Thamos, and he her, she induces Sais to believe that Thamos prefers her playmate, Myris, and Sais is generous enough to sacrifice her love and her hopes of the throne to her friend. Equally nobly, Thamos rejects all suspicions against Pharaoh and awards him supreme command. As the time for action draws near, Pharaoh discloses to Sethos, whom he takes for a devoted follower of Menes and consequently for an enemy of Thamos, the secret of Sais' existence and his own plans. Sethos prepares secretly to save Thamos. Sais, also after being pledged to silence by an oath, is initiated into the secret by Mirza and Pharaoh, and directed to choose Pharaoh. She declines to give a decided answer, and Pharaoh announces to Mirza 
his determination to seize the throne by force in case of extremity. Says, who believes herself not loved by Thamos, and will not therefore choose him as consort, but will not deprive him of the throne, takes the solemn and irrevocable oath as virgin of the sun. Thamos enters, and they discover to their sorrow their mutual love. Sethos entering enlightens Thamos as to the treachery of Pharaoh, without disclosing the parentage of Sais. Pharaoh, disturbed by the report that Menes is still living, comes to take counsel of Sethos and adheres to his treacherous design. In solemn assembly, Thamos is about to be declared king, when Mirza reveals the fact that Sais is the lost Tharsis and heiress to the throne. Thamos is the first to offer her his homage. When she is constrained to choose between Thamos and Pharaoh, she declares herself bound by her oath and announces Thamos as the possessor of the throne. Then Theron calls his followers to arms, but Sethos steps forward and discloses himself as Menes, whereupon all fall at his feet in joyful emotion. Pharaoh is disarmed and let off. Mirza stabs herself. Menes, as father and ruler, releases Sais from her oath, unites her with Thamos, and places the pair on the throne. A message arrives that Pharaoh has been struck with lightning by divine judgment, and the peace ends. Mozart wrote music to this drama in Salzburg in 1779 or 1780, according to the evidence of the handwriting and paper of the score, as well as of the treatment of the orchestra. It consisted at first of four instrumental movements, which were played between the acts, and one which formed the conclusion of the whole piece. It was not a new idea to compose appropriate music to a drama of importance instead of the usual indifferent or inappropriate instrumental movements. Joe Ad Sheeb, 1708-1776, wrote music for Polyusit and Mithridate in 1738, and afterwards wrote an article of this kind of music in the Christian Musicus. He maintained that the overture should be composed with reference to the whole piece and should lead up to its commencement, that the symphonies between the acts should be connected both with the act which preceded and that which followed, so as to lead the audience insensibly from the one frame of mind to the other. The closing symphony should be in close relationship to the end of the piece, so as to intensify the impression made by the denouement upon the audience. He considered a change of instruments particularly necessary in order to keep up the attention of the audience, but care must be taken to select the most appropriate instruments for each movement, so as to express what had to be expressed in the most effective manner possible. Sheba was followed by Joe Christ Hertel, 1726-1789, with the music of Krongix Olint and Sophronia, and by others among them Agricola, with the music to Semiramis, after Voltaire, which Lessing thought worthy of an analysis, and declared his opinion that the intraxis should have no reference to the following act, but should only amplify and conclude what had gone before. Vogler's overture and intraxis to Hamlet were given in Mannheim in 1779. Even in Salzburg, M. Haydn had composed in 1777 special music for the performance of Voltaire's Zaire by French actors, which was received with great applause. The music to King Thamos has, curiously enough, no overture, which is perhaps accounted for by the fact that the play begins with a chorus, and so is opened by music. Each intracte is in connection with the last scene of the preceding act, and seeks to express the same set of emotions by means of music. Mozart has each time noted down what seemed to him the prevailing idea to be represented. Thus, he writes concerning the first movement, the first act ends with the determination of Mirza and Pharaoh to place the latter on the throne. Upon the last words of Mirza, Mirza, a woman, trembles not. Thou art a man. Conquer or die. The orchestra strikes in with three solemn chords, the effect heightened by long pauses. Then begins a restless and agitated allegro in C minor. The prevailing tone is one of excitement, and those who were in the theater might well receive the suggestion of Mirza as an eager, passionate woman 
inciting Faron to action. But the characterization is not very striking. It is only noticeable that the separate phrases of the subject are shorter and in greater contrast than is usual with Mozart. Otherwise, we have before us a movement in two parts, with a coda arranged in the ordinary manner, but not elaborated. The second act has, if possible, a still more general application. The noble nature of Thamos is displayed at the end of the second act. The third act opens with Thamos and the traitor Pharaon, and the dialogue wherein Thamos declares his belief in Pharaon's fidelity and resigns says to him, while Pharaon continues to dissemble. Here, too, Mozart has written an ordinary movement in two parts, Andante, E-flat major, but he has resorted to the expedient of denoting the character of the two personages by means of distinct subjects, which he indicates by superscriptions. It is easy to be seen here that musical contrast is the main point, and that the characterization is very general, quite apart from the fact that integrity and hypocrisy cannot be expressed in music. As Mozart was well aware, in spite of his naive superscriptions, the inadequacy of such characterization is shown in the second part, where both characters occur together. Here the expression has become still more general, and we have only the musical development of a given subject, not the progress of a dramatic situation. More than this is out of the province of the musician to give. The suggestions for the music of the third entracte are more promising. The music is connected in the first place with the last scene, the third act closes with the treacherous dialogue between Mirza and Pharaon, expressed by means of an agitated, strongly accented allegro, which, however, soon breaks off and dies away. Thereupon, the music turns to the fourth act, which begins with the vow of the deluded Sais. Here the influence of the melodrama of Pon Mozart becomes apparent, for he follows with his music every turn in the monologue of Sais indicating each by a superscription. We may indeed doubt whether he had not some idea of a melodramatic delivery of the music, although there are no pauses left for spoken sentences. And the flow of the music, notwithstanding frequent changes of time, is uninterrupted. This movement would be most open to the adverse criticism of Lessing, for it anticipates the whole of the following scene. In itself, it is the most expressive and most successful. In spite of its division into separate points, it preserves connection and unity, and a tone of tender grace, such as becomes a bashful maiden. The fourth entracte is again an animated movement, Allegro Vivace Assai, which is to depict the universal confusion, with which the fourth act concludes. We can recognize in the wild, restless subject in opposition to which is placed another full of dignity and reserve, the intended contrast between the conspirators and Thamos with his followers. But we need, of course, to be told what it is that the music means to represent. Since the spectators were in a position to transfer the factitious presumption from the stage to the music, a general characterization would suffice for them. The music, therefore, fulfills its primary aim, but it has undertaken a task which lies beyond its province, and a previous knowledge of the subject treated is indispensable to the due appreciation of it. In this way, the music is as dependent as though it were a setting to words without the advantage of the direct intelligibleness given to it by words. The closing movement describes Pharaon's despair, blasphemy, and death. And this situation coincides with a fearful thunderstorm. The musical characterization is confined to a representation of it, without any dramatic detail. It is a wildly forcible movement, and the effect accords well with the suggested idea. It is unquestionable that Mozart, excited by the melodrama, has set himself eagerly to express dramatic details in music, and yet in almost every case the exigencies of musical construction have been too much for him. The impressions he has received from the drama become only impulses, leading him to accent more sharply and set in more stronger contrast the various points of his composition. 
The special points of the dramatic situations are not fully brought out in the music. This is in great measure the fault of the play, which affords few powerful or effective suggestions to the composer, either through its characters or its situations. Great poetical or dramatic power would no doubt have called forth other music. That such a play should have been received with interest and applause, that it should have incited Mozart to composition, is a speaking proof of the taste of the time. Shakespeare and Goethe had not yet penetrated the intellectual atmosphere in which Mozart had grown up. Before poetry could assert its sway in the province of music, it had to express and realize the demand for a characterization bringing to view the most individual traits of human character. Gebler had sought to invest his drama with peculiar dignity and providing it with choruses for which Racine's Athalier may have furnished him with an example. The play begins with a solemn sacrifice in the Temple of the Sun, the priests and virgins singing hymns to the Godhead, in the same way at the beginning of the fifth act, the coronation of the king is introduced by a sacrifice, the priests and virgins again singing a hymn. These choruses gave Mozart opportunity for a magnificent style of composition, with all the brilliancy that external support could give. The hymns were well-known ones, with Latin words inserted later, for which, however, a German translation was again substituted. Our judgment as to the style and conception will naturally be affected by the fact that the hymns were written for the theater, and not as church music proper. And yet these very hymns have been wildly circulated by countless performances in churches, and are made to serve as the principal evidence of Mozart's style of church music. There is no question that their whole conception is grander, freer, and more imposing than that of any of his masses belonging to that period. But this is because he felt himself unfettered by conventional restrictions. A solemn act of worship was represented on the stage. The expression of reverence to the Supreme Being was heightened in effect by the Egyptian surroundings, and Mozart's endeavor was to render the consequent emotions with all possible truth and force. But he was fully conscious that the expression must be dramatic. Therefore, everything was avoided that directly suggested the church, and an impression of splendor and brilliancy was given, which in this fashion was foreign to the church. Above all, the subjective points of sentiment are thrown into strong relief and forcibly expressed. But although there is an essential difference between these choruses and Mozart's contemporary church music, Yet we cannot fail to perceive a certain amount of resemblance in the manner in which the solemnity and importance of religious ceremony is rendered both here and in the Zauberflot. The drama itself has some resemblance to the Zauberflot, both in its deistic humanitarian tendency and its Egyptian costume and sun worship. Freemasonry may have exerted some influence over Gebler's mind. It could have had none at the time over Mozart. In the music to the Zauberflot, everything, more especially the power of concentrating ideas in the strictest forms, shows mature development. While here, we are aware of the youthful genius, rejoiced at the opportunity of pouring forth his best in full measure, and thereby satisfying his nature to the utmost. The consideration of these choruses explains his joy at finding the chorus in Paris strong and good. Volume 1, page 429. And choruses, his most favorite compositions, well performed and much thought of. We can imagine what he would have made of the choruses if he had written a grand opera in Paris. They leave Gebler's words, out of which, according to Wieland, Gluck would have made something excellent. So far behind that the music and the poetry, considered from an artistic point of view, seem to belong from different periods. For actual representation, they are no doubt too grandly and broadly conceived and executed. They overpower the whole drama with their weight. The impression of solemnity and grandeur produced on the mind by symbolic ceremonies is rendered with dignity, and at the same time with fire and energy. The chorus and orchestra unite to give the effect of splendor and magnificence, and startling harmonies are borne along as if on an irresistible stream. The lighter, subordinate subjects, divided between male and female choruses, as well as solo voices, 
are less marked. The style and treatment of the choruses have afforded a precedent for many similar works in latter days. So also has the way in which the choruses and a full orchestra are united so as to give a massive effect, both of arrangement and construction. Mozart himself had no opportunity of again uniting choruses and orchestra on a large scale, and proceeding further in the same direction. Haydn, in his oratorios, inherited this portion of Mozart's genius, and numerous efforts have since been made to accomplish what Mozart began. The orchestra is provided with all the external advantages that Salzburg could offer. No instruments employed at a latter date are wanting, except the clarinet, which Mozart missed so sensibly. It is organized and constructed exactly as we find it at the present day. The wind instruments of wood and brass and the stringed instruments are united in definite groups, but in perfect freedom of treatment. Most striking is Mozart's progress in his treatment of the brass instruments. The trombones are no longer with the voices, and where they support them, they do it in an independent manner, generally by sustained chords. But they also take their own place in the orchestra. The horns and trumpets united with them, and then again the horns combine with the woodwind instruments, while the trumpets, with the drums, occasionally assert their peculiar character. In the same way, the other wind instruments are combined among themselves, as well as with other instruments. It is in accordance with their nature that the rendering of the more delicate details should fall to their share. Such an extended employment of the wind instruments must naturally have influenced the treatment of the strings. These are independently and forcibly placed in contrast with the wind instruments, so that, while the latter heightened the coloring, the former determined the fundamental character of the work and maintained unity of tone. In short, all important effects which can be produced by different combinations of the instruments are here brought into use, not merely as sound effects produced by changes of tone coloring, but as the means of giving due expression to musical ideas. The chorus also takes a different position in conjunction with an orchestra such as this. It is no longer the principal object in the sense of making everything else subservient to itself, but the independence of the instruments renders it freer in its own motion. Since so much was left to be rendered by the orchestra, the chorus was able to characterize what belonged essentially to it all the more sharply and strongly and the powerful and effective orchestra called forth all the strength of the chorus that they might keep pace with each other. For this there was requisite, besides an intensified meaning in the subjects, a free and melodious treatment which made the separate voices the foundation for the display of natural and forcible effects of sound. To satisfy these varied conditions in detail, and to unite them harmoniously into combined effect, has been Mozart's successfully executed task. Let anyone place those earlier works in which the voices supply the harmonies to a continuous violin passage and a basso continuo side by side with these hymns where an independent chorus, complete in itself, is united with an equally independent and carefully arranged orchestra so as to form a compact and solid whole, and what an extraordinary progress is apparent. Mozart, who executed this work, with loving care, composed both choruses twice over. The first chorus, in the earlier and completely carried out attempt, has essentially the same features as the latter. Only the solo parts are simpler and without the delicate accompaniment which gives them their chief charm. The voices are only altered in the details of the main portions of the chorus, but the orchestra is subjected to a thorough elaboration. At first, there were no flutes and the addition of these has given to the oboes a different position and in many ways caused a different grouping of the instruments. But apart from this, there are so many improvements in detail that this work may be considered as a regular study in instrumentation. The difference between the two versions of the second chorus are more essential. Only the beginning and the fundamental ideas of some of the subjects in the first attempt are identical with the latter elaboration. The working out is quite different, not only much shorter, 
but in every respect scantier and less important. And more especially are the orchestral parts far removed from their present rich perfection. Mozart did not even finish this first attempt. It breaks off in the middle of the last passage, although only a few bars are wanting. The difference in the elaboration proves once more that the true gift of an artist consists in the unerring judgment with which, after no matter how many experiments in the process of his work, he seizes in the end on what is best for his purpose. It is instructive to follow the progress of development from the earlier ideas and attempts. In the second chorus, the main features are more carefully perfected. In the first, the details. The magnificent effect of these two choruses seems to have suggested the idea of bringing the drama to an impressive close by means of another chorus. In the place of the instrumental movement, which represented Ferron's death, there was introduced a short elaboration by the high priest to fear the divine wrath, which is taken up by the chorus, and passes into joyful trust in the protection of the Almighty. Mozart's composition, to words provided by a Salzburg local poet, perhaps by Schachner, is altogether worthy of the two first hymns. The bass solo of the high priest foreshadows the commandantur in Don Giovanni. The chorus which follows gives the right expression of humble reverence on the part of the bystanders, and the cheerful dignity of the conclusion is quite appropriate when we take into account that the chorus was intended for the stage and not for the church. End of section 8. Read by M. A. Henson. Houston, Texas, September 2022. Section 9 of The Life of Mozart, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Mozart, Volume 2, by Otto Jan. Chapter 21, Court Service in Salzburg, Part 3. In the music to the Zauber Flote, everything, more especially the power of concentrating ideas in the strictest forms, shows mature development, while here we are aware of the youthful genius rejoiced at the opportunity of pouring forth his best in full measure and thereby satisfying his nature to the utmost. The consideration of these choruses explains his joy at finding the chorus in Paris strong and good, and choruses, his most favorite compositions, well performed and much thought of. We can imagine what he would have made of the choruses if he had written a grand opera in Paris. They leave Gebler's words, out of which, according to Wieland, Gluck could have made something excellent, so far behind that the music and the poetry, considered from an artistic point of view, seem to belong to different periods. For actual representation, they are no doubt too grandly and broadly conceived and executed. They overpower the whole drama with their weight. The impression of solemnity and grandeur produced on the mind by symbolic ceremonies is rendered with dignity, and at the same time with fire and energy. The chorus and orchestra unite to give the effect of splendor and magnificence, and startling harmonies are borne along as if on an irresistible stream. The lighter subordinate subjects, divided between male and female chorus as well as solo voices, are less marked. The style and treatment of the choruses have afforded a precedent for many similar works in later days. So also has the way in which the choruses and a full orchestra are united so as to give a massive effect both of arrangement and construction. Mozart himself had no opportunity of again uniting chorus and orchestra on a large scale and proceeding further in the same direction. Haydn in his oratorios inherited this portion of Mozart's genius, and numerous efforts have since been made 
to accomplish what Mozart began. The orchestra is provided with all the external advantages that Salzburg could offer. No instruments employed at a later date are wanting except the clarinet, which Mozart missed so sensibly. It is organized and constructed exactly as we find it at the present day. The wind instruments of wood and brass and the stringed instruments are united in definite groups, but in perfect freedom of treatment. Most striking is Mozart's progress in his treatment of the brass instruments. The trombones are no longer with the voices, and where they support them, they do it in an independent manner, generally by sustained chords. But they also take their own place in the orchestra, the horns and trumpets united with them, and then again the horns combine with the woodwind instruments while the trumpets, with the drums, occasionally assert their peculiar character. In the same way, the other wind instruments are combined among themselves, as well as with the other instruments. It is in accordance with their nature that the rendering of the more delicate details should fall to their share. Such an extended employment of the wind instruments must naturally have influenced the treatment of the strings. These are independently and forcibly placed in contrast with the wind instruments, so that, while the latter heighten the coloring, the former determine the fundamental character of the work and maintain unity of tone. In short, all important effects which can be produced by different combinations of the instruments are here brought into use, not merely as sound effects produced by changes of tone coloring, but as the means of giving due expression to musical ideas. The chorus also takes a different position in conjunction with an orchestra such as this. It is no longer the principal object in the sense of making everything else subservient to itself, but the independence of the instruments renders it freer in its own motion. Since so much was left to be rendered by the orchestra, the chorus was able to characterize what belonged essentially to it all the more sharply and strongly, and a powerful and effective orchestra called forth all the strength of the chorus that they might keep pace with each other. For this there was requisite, besides an intensified meaning in the subjects, a free and melodious treatment, which made the separate voices the foundation for the display of natural and forcible effects of sound. To satisfy these varied conditions in detail, and to unite them harmoniously into combined effect, has been Mozart's successfully executed task. Let any one place those earlier works in which the voices supply the harmonies to a continuous violin passage and a basso continuo side by side with these hymns where an independent chorus, complete in itself, is united with an equally independent and carefully arranged orchestra so as to form a compact and solid whole. And what an extraordinary progress is apparent. Mozart who executed this work with loving care, composed both choruses twice over. The first chorus, in the earlier and completely carried out attempt, has essentially the same features as the later, only the solo parts are simpler and without the delicate accompaniment which gives them their chief charm. The voices are only altered in the details of the main portions of the chorus, but the orchestra is subjected to a thorough elaboration. At first, there were no flutes, and the addition of these has given to the oboes a different position and in many ways caused a different grouping of the instruments. But, apart from this, there are so many improvements in detail that this work may be considered as a regular study in instrumentation. 
The difference between the two versions of the second chorus are more essential. Only the beginning and the fundamental ideas of some of the subjects in the first attempt are identical with the later elaboration. The working out is quite different, not only much shorter, but in every respect scantier and less important. And more especially are the orchestral parts far removed from their present rich perfection. Mozart did not even finish this first attempt. It breaks off in the middle of the last passage, although only a few bars are wanting. The difference in the elaboration proves once more that the true gift of an artist consists in the unerring judgment with which, after no matter how many experiments in the process of his work, he seizes in the end on what is best for his purpose. It is instructive to follow the progress of development from the earlier ideas and attempts. In the second chorus, the main features are more carefully perfected. In the first, the details. The magnificent effect of these two choruses seems to have suggested the idea of bringing the drama to an impressive close by means of another chorus. In the place of the instrumental movement which represented Pharaon's death, there was introduced a short exhortation by the high priest to fear the divine wrath, which is taken up by the chorus and passes into joyful trust in the protection of the Almighty. Mozart's composition, to words provided by a Salzburg local poet, perhaps by Schachner, is altogether worthy of the two first hymns. The bass solo of the high priest foreshadows the commendatore in Don Giovanni. The chorus which follows gives the right expression of humble reverence on the part of the bystanders, and the cheerful dignity of the conclusion is quite appropriate when we take into account that the chorus was intended for the stage and not for the church. Another composition falling within Mozart's present residence at Salzburg is a German operetta, for which honest Schachnell provided the libretto. It was almost finished when Mozart went to Munich in November 1780. His father wrote that nothing could then be done with Schachnell's play on account of the public mourning at Vienna. This was all the better, since the music was not quite ready. But Wolfgang begs him to bring with him Schachner's operetta. People come to see Cannabis, with whom the hearing of such things does not come mal a propos. Later on, the father revived the idea of producing the operetta in Vienna. But Wolfgang answered, Nothing can be done with Schachner's operetta for the same reason that I have often given before. I could not contradict Stephanie. I could only say that the piece, except the long dialogues, which could easily be altered, was very good, but not suited for Vienna, where they only care for comic pieces. There can be no doubt that this is the opera in two acts, without a title, preserved in Mozart's carefully executed original score, and complete all but the overture and the conclusion, which was published by André, with the suitable title of Zaide. The handwriting, style, and instrumentation, as well as some special circumstances to be presently noted, prove this beyond a doubt. The plot may be conjectured, in its general features by the songs and music. Comas has been betrayed into the power of the Sultan Soliman and set to servile tasks. He has won the love of Zaida, who is in the seraglio of the Sultan, but the passion of the latter for her affords little hope to the lovers. Finding Gomaz, overcome with toil, asleep in the garden, she leaves him her likeness. This leads to a declaration of their mutual love. To them attaches himself Al-Lazim, the sultan's favorite, 
and apparently the overseer of the slaves, who represents the humane and enlightened Muslim. He procures for them Turkish dresses and accompanies them in their flight. At the beginning of the second act, we find the sultan in violent wrath at the treachery he has just discovered. He rages against the fugitives, whom Zaram undertakes to pursue and capture. They are, in fact, soon brought back, and Soliman is not moved to clemency either by the prayers and constancy of Zaida or by the exhortations of Alazim. In what way a happy denoma is at last brought about cannot be conjectured. This serious operetta is written in the manner and after the scale of the vaudeville of the time. It does not depend upon the executive powers of the performers, nor upon large expedients, and the standard throughout is a modest one. The orchestral combinations prove that it was intended for performance in Salzburg, and the treatment of the separate parts may have had reference to the available personnel. Zaida plays no claim to anything but a certain amount of fluency. The part of the sultan requires a strong, penetrating voice, but for the rest, the requirements of the music are well within the compass of ordinary theatrical singers. Musical feeling and a natural, correct judgment Mozart always displays, because they were, in fact, a part of himself which could not be laid aside. In the construction of the songs, the traditional arrangement of the Italian aria is not closely adhered to. An effort is evident to make use of the fundamental law requiring contrasting motives to be compacted into a whole in developing the individuality of the characters and of the dramatic situations. Nevertheless, the influence of the old tradition is visible in many phenomena such as the change of tempo, the long ritomelli, the division of the different motives by regular rests, and their amplification. Yet it is no longer servile obedience to an external type, but an evident determination to evolve the form out of the given situation. Every artist, no matter how many-sided his genius, feels his nature impelled in a certain direction in which his creative strength works freely and independently, while other paths remain strange to him or are altogether closed. Experience and cultivation go far to equalize his powers, but they are powerless to alter the original impulse. Now, dramatic representation makes demands upon the artist for the satisfaction of which he must not indeed overstep the bounds of his individuality, that no man can do with impunity, but he must stretch them to their extremest limits. Here it is that he seeks aid from the poet. The latter can elevate the musician by the strength and vividness of his situation and characters, by the style and vigor of his language, while it needs but little to stimulate his musical production to activity. This aid was denied to Mozart when, as a young man, he first sought to write dramatic music in its true sense. The first act of the opera before us has no events except the love passages between Gomaz and Zaida, which take their peculiar tone from the mixture of pity for suffering innocence and from the danger threatening in the background. Here, Mozart is quite in his element. The tendency and fervor of his own sentiments are involuntarily expressed. But, graceful and interesting as is this first act, the poetical expression of the words discovers nothing of the more delicate features of the music. Again, in the second act, the sultan raging in jealousy, Zayda at first beseeching, then also furious, Alazim moralizing, these are elements in the treatment of which Mozart might well look for aid from the poet. 
and here it was that the poet left him in the lurch altogether. We fancy ourselves in a marionette show when the sultan sings, Ich bin sobos algut, ich lone die verdienste, mit reichlichem gewinste. Dosh reist man meine Wut, so ich auch voll, Waffen das Laster zu bestrafen, und diese vor dem Blut. And Zayde, Tiger, Fetze deine Klauen, Freu dich der erschlichten Beut, Straf ein der Richtes Vertrauen, Auferstellte Zarlichkeit, Komm nur schnelli und töd uns beide, Saug der Unschuld warmes Blut, Reiß das Herz vom Eingeweide, Und ersetge deine Wut. The music totters under the weight of such words as these. The songs, which follow one after the other, are indeed well conceived and carefully executed, and even for the most part characteristic. But their characterization is all external, and when suggested by different touches in the text, it is rarely happy. There is a want of harmony and balance, as well as of impulse and warmth, so that the really beautiful separate ideas have no proportionate effect. It is remarkable that these songs are all too long, and their cadenzas are especially tedious, as if quantity was to make up for quality. Further adherence to the antiquated aria form is particularly noticeable, as if, when the musical construction no longer proceeded directly from the impulse of the dramatic situation, the old forms involuntarily asserted their sway. The quartet in which the musical and dramatic interest is, as it were, concentrated, contrasts very favorably with the solo songs. The dramatis personae are all happily characterized. The sultan, implacable in his anger, Gumaz seeking to console Zaida, who, in her turn, strives to purchase his life by the sacrifice of her own, and Ayazim, overcome with grief at being unable to see a way out of the complications that he himself has brought about. Here, too, we have a conflict of opposing emotions faithfully and accurately delineated, and all directed to one central point. It is, in fact, a situation which fulfills all the essential conditions of musical representation. Here, then, Mozart is in his element. The different characters are drawn with a steady hand, Every emotion is definitely and accurately expressed, and the elements thus gained are employed as materials for a construction which is as faithful to the laws of musical organization as to the requirements of the dramatic situation. The quartet thus fulfills the two essential conditions of dramatic music and reveals itself as a consistent and harmonious piece of work the separate motives of which are beautiful and expressive, while the interest is kept alive by alternation and climax, and a vivid, dramatic picture is produced by the artistic treatment of musical forms. The grouping of the voices in manifold variety of combination displays, as if on the ground plan, a symmetrical, well-disposed musical edifice. As they proceed, they develop out of the simplest situations the most varied shades of sentiment, so that the music carries into the innermost recesses of the mind and heart what the words have merely hinted at. Even the actual musical formulas, such as the entry of the voices in imitation, produce, in the right place, such a direct and vivid effect that they appear to have been invented for the special case. As to the main conception on which the construction of the quartet rests, it might, if the violent rage of the sultan were considered as the chief point, have been made more passionate and agitated without overstepping truth of expression. But Mozart has in preference emphasized the more fervid and reserved emotions of the other characters, 
to which the expression of anger must be subordinated. This conception has perhaps been suggested by the greater ease which it afforded for the introduction of the necessary reconciliation of the characters. Partly, also, a more quiet and contained piece might appear to be of better effect after so many lively and agitated songs. It is certain, however, that it was the conception most in accordance with Mozart's nature as an artist. Equally in accord with the situation, but not by any means so deep and expressive, is the terzet which brings the first act to a conclusion. In this there is no conflict of sentiment. Zaida, Gomaz, and Alazim are happy in the feeling of mutual love and friendship, and in the hope of a speedy deliverance. The fear lest their plan of escape should fail casts only a passing shadow on their cheerful frame of mind. The music, therefore, expresses content and happiness with great tenderness and the purest melody, especially in the first movement. The duet between Zaida and Gomaz, whose love is not a stormy passion, but the devotion of two noble beings, expresses in the most delightful manner the purity and openness of a happy affection. There are not wanting either such delicate features of detail as characterize the genuine musical dramatist. For instance, in Gomaz's song, when he is divided between gratitude to Alazim and impatience to hasten to Zayda, there is charming humor in his confusion, particularly at the words Dosh ich muss dich schnell verlassen and lass dich küssen, lass dich drücken, which in no way interferes with the more serious sentiment of the song as a whole. The union of humor and sentiment at the close is excellent. While the accompaniment continues the last subject, Gomaz, who had rushed off in hot haste, turns back and sings once more with heartfelt emotion. Herr und Freund, wie dank ich dir. There is a pretty touch in Osmin's air where the purely musical return to the theme is used to express recurring bursts of hearty laughter. The workmanship of the opera, both as regards the treatment of the voices and of the orchestra, is, as might be expected, thorough and sure. The orchestra deserves special notice. We find only the instruments in use at Salzburg, and the wind instruments are sparingly employed. The flutes and oboes generally alternate, but they are together and in conjunction with bassoons and horns in the quartet and in one of the sultan's airs. Trumpets and drums are only used in the sultan's raging scene. Many songs are accompanied by stringed instruments alone. The hand of a master is recognizable throughout in the life and movement which we follow with unflagging interest, in the force and beauty of the sound effects, and in the delicacy of the lights and shades. Many touches recall later works of Mozart, but these for the most part consist in turns of expression, in the treatment of the accompaniment, etc. One decided reminiscence is not without interest, the quartet is introduced by a short passage for the wind instruments, which recurs several times in the course of the piece, whereupon the voices enter as follows. See page image, where it appears in the song of Constance, Kraurigkeit war mir zum Luce, in the following form. See page image. The alternate rendering of the subject by the voices and accompaniment and the alternation between the wind instruments give it a new charm. And it is not without intention that the instrumentation here is less full than in the former case. 
One peculiarity of this operetta is the introduction of melodrama. J. J. Rousseau, in his production of Pygmalion at Lyon in 1770 and Paris in 1775, gave the first example of a dramatic piece in which spoken dialogue was interspersed with music in the nature of obligato recitatives. The attempt thus to render music effective as a means of dramatic expression was successful, although the critics raised objections to the union of music and speech. Independently of Rousseau's experiment, it had occurred to Brandes in 1772 at Weimar to adapt Gerstenberg's Cantate, Ariadne, as a melodrama for his wife, who was an excellent actress, but no musician. Schweitzer undertook the composition, but owing to the interruption caused by his Alceste, he did not finish it. When Brandis removed to Gotha in 1775, he transferred Ariadne to George Benda, with whose music it was then produced. The extraordinary success it met with suggested to Gotter the idea of writing the melodrama Medea for Madame Sailor, the rival of Madame Brandis. This also was composed by Benda. The success of the melodramas was universal and extraordinary. Critics might object to the principle as they pleased. The public was not to be reasoned out of its enthusiasm, which was shared even by many connoisseurs. That the success was mainly due to Bendis' expressive music, which all joined in praising, admits of no doubt, and none of his successors have been able to produce a similar effect. Mozart's idea of substituting melodrama for accompanied recitative in German opera was a kindred one, and the same idea is evident in other directions. It is put into practice in Zaida. Two important monologues are melodramatically treated, one by Gomaz at the beginning of the first, and another by Soliman at the beginning of the second act. Venda's composition has evidently been taken as a model. The music in short periods, often only in detached chords, follows each turn of the monologue and seeks to give expression to the lightest shades of sentiment. The musical treatment is essentially different from that of obligato recitative, where the independent instrumental passages are connected partly by the recitative itself which is always sung, partly by the harmonies of the accompaniment. In the melodrama, on the other hand, every passage, even the smallest, is treated as distinctly apart. In the recitatives, again, which are sung, the lighter shades of sentiment may be rendered by cadence, rhythm, or harmony without the intervention of any instrumental passages. In the melodrama, this is impossible, and in order to accentuate details, the continuity of the dialogue must be sacrificed. Another decided and almost inevitable drawback is the dependence upon details for characterization, which is thereby often out of proportion. In this way, Spoken dialogue loses its chief means of effect, that is, its continuity of idea, while nothing is gained for musical unity, which ought to make up for all deficiencies by the steady maintenance of a sustained mood. For, impelled as Mozart might be by his nature to gather into a whole the shattered members of this musical representation by means of rhythmical combinations and harmonic progressions, this was only possible to a limited degree, and musical construction in its proper sense can only exist in those few places where the music is independent of the melodrama. The main point, however, cannot be denied, which is that the words and the music are not here so blended that each part is richly repaid for what it sacrifices by its union with the other 
but that each is continually asserting itself in opposition to the other, so that both are in fact the losers. To this may be added the great difficulty of satisfying the requirements of music, together with those of declamatory speech, and of filling the pauses with suitable gestures and movements, the amount of histrionic art necessary being rarely possessed by singers. Banda's melodramas were written for distinguished actresses, whose forte lay in their declamation and action. The situations were selected with this view. The dialogue was constructed in accordance with it. In fact, each scene was self-contained, not incorporated as a component part of a greater whole. Objections of this kind must have acted upon Mozart at a later time. At all events, he never again employed melodrama, not even in the Zauberflotte, when the occasion seemed ready to hand. It was nevertheless often introduced into operas, and partially also into plays, with very good effect. But the effect relies chiefly either on the material impressions of sound or upon the delicate and intellectual treatment of the musical interludes, suggesting familiar ideas, sentiments, or fancies, which exist in the minds of the speakers, though they are incapable of expression in speech. These are certainly admirable points in their place, but they can scarcely serve as organizing principles in a work of art. The melodrama must be content to take its place as a subordinate and connecting member if it is to have its true effect. Mozart never took up this opera again, and he was right. It could only have been rendered fit for the stage by complete reconstruction. The first act, however graceful the music may be, has too little variety in its treatment and tone to gain favor on the stage. The second is, as we have seen, barely tolerable. After the composition of the Entfurung, Zaida was heard of no more, partly on account of the similarity of subject and accessories, partly because it was so far surpassed in every respect that it could not fail to fall henceforth into oblivion. End of section 9《Section 10 of The Life of Mozart, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Life of Mozart, Volume 2, by Otto Jan. Idomeneo, Part 1. Although in his earlier years Mozart's career had, as we have seen, been hindered by the circumstances to which he was forced to succumb at Salzburg, yet the severe discipline to which he was subjected must have been in many respects useful during his period of education. Since his return from his travels, however, his Salzburg surroundings were utterly oppressive and distasteful to him his time of training was over what he now required was freedom work worthy of his powers and the means of producing all that he was able and willing to produce but of all this salzburg could give nothing and want of appreciation and mistrust in addition to external obstacles almost caused mozart to lose heart and spirit and throw up his post his longing looks were naturally turned in whatever direction deliverance might seem to lie, and he considered it a fortunate circumstance when he was commissioned to write the opera for the carnival of 1781 at Munich. The interest he had excited in Karl Theodore and his consort rendered it comparatively easy for Mozart's friends among the court singers and musicians to direct the choice so that it should fall on him the archbishop had promised leave of absence too distinctly to be able to draw back nor would his many obligations to the bavarian court have rendered a refusal possible 
an entirely new opera was desired on this occasion and the abbot giambat varesco who had been court chaplain at salzburg since seventeen sixty six was commissioned to write the libretto he could take counsel with mozart who knew the munich company well and by obeying his suggestions make the text quite according to his mind so that a work not unworthy of the brilliant fame of the munich opera might be expected when a translation of the text was called for later mozart proposed his old friend schachner who was employed to do it and leopold mozart could write with some pride to breitkopf august tenth seventeen eighty one it is remarkable that every part of the work is by persons residing in salzburg the poetry by the court chaplain abate varesco the music by my son and the german translation by herr schachner varesco's idomeneo was modelled on the opera idomenei written by danchet and composed by campra first performed in seventeen twelve and revived in seventeen thirty one the dramatis personae are as follows page is depicted the plot is briefly as follows idomeneo king of crete after the siege of troy has wandered a long way from his home where his son idamante grown to man's estate during his absence awaits him in filial love electra daughter of agamemnon banished by the people of argus on account of the matricide of orestes has taken refuge with idamante and becomes deeply enamoured of him but ilia daughter of priam who with other trojan captives has been sent to crete by idomeneo has conceived a passion for idamante which he returns at the opening of the opera we find ilia struggling with her love for the enemy of her fatherland aria too idamante approaches her joyfully he has received tidings that his father's fleet is in sight and has sent his old confidant arbace to bring more exact intelligence on this joyful day he gives freedom to all the trojan captives and declares his love for ilia which she although reluctantly rejects whereupon he bewails himself in an aria three the captive trojans are led in and loosed from their fetters giving occasion for a joyful chorus electra comes and expresses dissatisfaction at the liberation of so many enemies then follows arbace with intelligence which is mistaken of the shipwreck of idomeneo idamante departs overwhelmed with grief electra remains behind and gives vent to her jealousy and despair in a song aria five the scene changes to the sea-coast and the fleet of idomeneo is seen threatened by a storm and driven on to the rocks the mariners lamenting and beseeching aid neptune appears and commands the winds to depart idomeneo prays for his help but the god casts threatening glances on him and disappears the sea being calmed idomeneo lands and declares that during the storm he has vowed to sacrifice to neptune the first person who shall meet him on shore he trembles at the rashness of his vow and anxiously looks for the sacrifice he is to make aria six Eramante enters, having sought solitude as ease to his grief. He offers shelter to the stranger, whom he fails to recognize. In the course of conversation, it transpires that he is mourning for his father Idomeneo, whereupon Idomeneo makes himself known, but overcome by the horror of his situation, he departs, forbidding Idamante to follow him the latter ignorant of the cause is inconsolable at his father's rejection of his proffered love and services aria eight an intermezzo of suitable character follows the first act 
the warriors of Idomeneo disembark to a march, nine, are welcomed by their wives and children, and express their joy in a grand figure dance, ending with a chorus, ten. At the beginning of the second act, Idomeneo is in conversation with Arbace. He communicates to him his fearful vow, from the fulfillment of which he wishes to escape. Arbace represents to him that this is impossible. But when he hears that Idamante is to be the sacrifice, he counsels his being sent to a distant country, and that during his banishment they should seek to appease the wrath of Neptune. Idomeneo decides upon commanding Idamante to accompany Electra to Argos, and there ascend the throne, and commissions Arbace to bid him prepare for the journey. Arbace promises obedience, aria 11, and departs. Ilia now appears, expresses delight at Idomeneo's safety, and while extolling Idamante's goodness, declares her own gratitude and submission. Aria 12. Her warmth causes Idomeneo to suspect their love, and his grief and confusion are thereby augmented. Aria 13. Electra, entering, thanks him for his care. He leaves her alone, and she expresses her joy at the fulfillment of her dearest wishes. Aria 14. The warriors assemble in the harbor to the sound of a march. 15. Electra appears with her followers. The sea is calm, and all look forward to a fortunate voyage. Chorus 16. Idomeneo dismisses Idamante, who sees in this command a fresh proof of his father's inexplicable displeasure. They express their opposing sentiments in a terzet, 17. As they prepare to embark, a terrific storm arises, and a huge sea monster rises from the waves. This convinces Idomeneo that his disobedience has offended Neptune, and he determines to die himself, and not to sacrifice the innocent. The storm continues to rage, the Cretans fly, and the act closes with the expression of their fear and horror by singing and pantomimic dancing. Ilia opens the third act, bewailing her unhappy love. Aria 19. Idamante surprises her and declares his resolve to seek death in combat with the monster who is laying waste the land. This leads to a disclosure of her love, and the two express their happiness in a duet. 20. Idomeneo, entering with Electra, discovers them. He cannot bring himself to acknowledge to Idamante the true cause of his mysterious behavior, but commands him anew to leave Crete at once and seek an asylum in a distant land. The various emotions of those present are expressed in a quartet. 21. Idamante, having departed, Arbace enters, and announces that the people are hurrying with the high priest at their head to demand deliverance from the monster. Idomeneo goes to meet them, and Arbace expresses his earnest wish for the happiness of his ruler. Aria 22. On an open space in front of the castle, the high priest appears with the multitude. He describes the ravages of the monster, which can only be terminated by the fulfillment of Idomeneo's vow, and demands to know the name of the promised victim. 23. When Idomeneo names his son as the sacrifice, horror seizes the people. Chorus 24. During a march... 25, Idomeneo, with his subjects, enters the temple of Neptune, and while the priests prepare for the sacrifice, they offer their solemn prayers to the god. 26. Cries of joy are heard from afar, and Arbace hastens in, and announces that Idamante has slain the monster in heroic combat. 
Idamante is presently borne in by priests and warriors, crowned and in white robes. He now knows his father's vow, and satisfied as to his feelings towards him, he is ready to fall a joyful sacrifice to the angry god, Aria 27. As Idomeneo is in the act of striking the fatal blow, Ilia hastens in and restrains him. She insists upon taking the place of her lover, and a tender strife arises between them, which Idomeneo listens to with emotion, Electra with rage and jealousy. As Ilia kneels before the altar, a great subterranean disturbance is heard, the statue of Neptune totters, the high priest stands entranced before the altar. All are amazed and motionless from fear, while a deep and majestic voice declares the will of the gods. Idomeneo is to renounce the throne which Idamante is to ascend and to be united to Ilia. 28. At this unexpected issue, Electra breaks into violent anger and goes off raging. Idomeneo arranges everything according to the divine will, 30, and expresses his grateful joy, Aria, 31. Idamante is crowned in a pantomimic ballet, during which the chorus sing a joyful conclusion to the opera, 32. Varesco omitted the prologue of his original, and reduced the five acts to the customary three. He also left out altogether the divinities and allegorical personages, which were somewhat prominent in the French text. And of three confidants he retained only Arbasse. For the rest he follows the progress of the plot pretty closely, only judiciously omitting the love of Idomeneo for Ilia, and altering the conclusion. In the original, Idomeneo, after voluntarily raising his son to the throne, and bestowing on him the hand of Ilia, is stricken with madness by Nemesis, and slays Idamante with the sacrificial axe. He is then prevented from committing suicide, but Ilia falls by her own hand. Metastasio had weaned Italian opera from such horrors. Varesco naturally looked to opera Syria as the foundation of his adaptation. But he endeavored at the same time to make use of the distinctive features of French opera. This is evident in his care for variety of scenery and machinery, in the marches and processions which occur in every act, and in the pantomimic dances which are made subservient to the plot. Further, the frequent introduction of the chorus was evidently suggested by French opera, and a marked progress displayed in the fact that the chorus was not employed merely to heighten the pomp of the piece, but took part in the action at critical moments, and expressed important dramatic situations. The ensembles, too, are not placed in regular succession at the end of the acts, without reference to the plot. They occur naturally as the piece proceeds, and have a dramatic signification of their own. Such movements are indeed rarely introduced, and not all the suitable points are made use of for them. No attempt is made either to unite the several connected points of the plot into a musical whole in the finale, but rather each separate situation has its own independent musical treatment. On the other hand, there is an evident intention to give the piece a tragic tone, rather than that of the then prevalent effeminate tenderness, and to invest the characters with a psychological interest, and the plot with natural development and climax. It must be admitted that the success is but partial. Varesco was no poet, and the spirit of French tragedy was not calculated to raise him to a higher sphere than that of Italian opera. Conventionality predominates, passion and emotion find but unnatural expression, pedantry and exaggeration, both alike untrue, jostle each other 
and the plot hangs on such slender threads that in spite of the strong passions which are set in motion it awakens no lively interest the weak points both of french and italian opera are here combined but there are other faults belonging more especially to the latter such for example is the giving of the part of idamante to a male soprano and employing the bass voice only for the subordinate part of the oracle idomeneo is tenor according to traditional usage and stands almost alone against three soprano voices for arbaces as second tenor acts only as a stop-gap and the high priest only appears once in an obligato recitative generally speaking the airs do not form the culminating point of a dramatic situation but only close it with a kind of point frequently they have only a commonplace phrase or an elaborated image for their subject and all their individuality is bestowed upon them by the music Varesco is nevertheless a practised verse-maker who has employed not without skill the materials he found ready to hand but is far removed from metastasio's delicacy and grace with all its drawbacks the advantage of a settled tradition is very visible the external arrangements such as the distribution among the characters of the different pieces being carefully carried out in short if idomeneo is compared with mozart's earlier operas the progress in the choice and treatment of material is very marked such an absolute blending of the essential features of french and italian opera as is aimed at does not indeed take place a compromise between the two had first to be made it can scarcely be doubted that mozart had a share in the construction of the libretto in its more important parts and that his experiences in mannheim and paris had qualified him for the task but his influence was not felt in the details of the work when the libretto was ready and part of the music composed mozart repaired to munich according to custom to finish the opera on the spot after a journey in the post-carriage which shook the soul out of one's body and gave him not an instant's sleep he wrote to his father november eighth seventeen eighty joyful and glad was my arrival there was plenty to be done the opera was to be rehearsed to be put on the stage and the greater part of it was still unwritten how much of it he took with him ready to munich is not precisely known probably the majority of the recitatives the first act and perhaps part of the second at all events his first letters mention some of the songs as already composed he was able to set to work with a good heart for he was met with good will on all sides count siau was altogether at his service and when they sometimes fell out and mozart was provoked to be rude it was always the count who gave way the elector received him very graciously i had almost forgotten the best he writes november fifteenth seventeen eighty count sio presented me en passant to the elector last sunday after mass he was very gracious and said i am glad to see you here again and when i said that i would endeavour to deserve the approbation of his highness he patted me on the shoulder and said oh i have no doubt it will all go very well indeed a piano piano si va lontano the nobility too were favourably disposed towards him canabiche introduced him to the countess baumgarten who was then the favourite of the elector my friend is everything in this house he writes november thirteenth seventeen eighty and i too now 
it is the best and most useful house here for me and so far all has gone and by god's help will go well with me he was able therefore to satisfy his father as to the success of the opera november twenty fourth seventeen eighty have no care as to my opera dear father i hope there will be no hitch a little cabal is opposed to it but it will certainly come to grief for all the best and most powerful houses of the nobility are in my favour as well as the principal musicians especially cannabish there was at all events no opposition to be feared on the part of the singers or the orchestra they and mozart were mutually anxious to satisfy each other but their joint labors and the requirements of the stage showed many alterations in the text to be necessary and varesco must have been often appealed to to undertake these or to sanction proposed changes among the performers for whom he wrote dal prato gave him some real trouble soon after his arrival he had a piece of roguery to narrate november eighth seventeen eighty i have not indeed the honour of knowing the heroic dal prato but according to the description cecchiarelli must be better than he for sometimes his breath fails in the middle of a song and nota bene he was never on the stage and raff is like a statue now you may imagine the scene in the first act the meeting of idomeneo and idamante further acquaintance with del prato justified the reports concerning him my molto amato castrato del prato he writes november fifteenth seventeen eighty requires teaching the whole opera he has to learn his part like a child and has not a penny worth of method november twenty second seventeen eighty he was the stumbling block also in the quartet which had to be rehearsed six times before it went right the fellow can do nothing complains mozart december thirtieth seventeen eighty his voice would not be so bad if he did not sing in his throat and head but he is absolutely without intonation or method or sentiment and sings like the best among the boys who come to be heard when they seek admission to a choir he had trouble of quite another kind with his dear old friend raff he was exceedingly fanciful and mozart made many alterations out of love for him and consideration for his grey hairs december twenty seventh seventeen eighty let me tell you that raff is the best and honestest man in the world but so wedded to his old jog-trot ideas that it is enough to drive one crazy consequently it is very difficult to write for him very easy too i grant you if one is content to write songs such as for example the first vedromi interno etc if you could only hear it it is good and it is pretty but if i had written it for zonka i should have made it much better fitted to the words i had a good deal of trouble with him about the quartet the oftener i hear this quartet the more effective it appears to me and every one that has heard it likes it only raff thinks it will be wanting in effect he said to me non se da spianar la voce as if there should not be more speaking than singing in a quartet but he knows nothing about these things i only said my dear friend if there was only one note in this quartet that i thought should be altered i would do it but i am better satisfied with it than with any other piece in the opera and when you have once heard it together you will alter your mind i have done my best to please you with your two songs and so i will with the third with good hopes of succeeding but as far as regards the terzets and quartets, the composer should be allowed his own way. That satisfied him. 
after the rehearsal ralph gladly acknowledged himself in the wrong and had no more doubt as to the good effect of the quartet december thirtieth seventeen eighty when mozart had shown him the paces of his first air he was quite satisfied with it november fifteenth seventeen eighty and equally so with the air in the second act december first seventeen eighty he is as much in love with his song as a younger man might be with his fair lady he sings it at night before he goes to sleep and in the morning as soon as he wakes he said to baron verrick and herr von castel i have always been used to have a hand in my own part in the recessives as well as the songs but i have left this just as it was there is not a note that does not suit me exactly enfin he is as happy as a king over it some ill-natured speeches were made in spite of all this as mozart writes to his father december twenty seventh seventeen eighty apropos beck tells me that he wrote to you again after the last rehearsal but one and told you among other things that raff's song in the second act is not written for the words they tell me he said that you know too little of italian is it so you should have asked me and then written i can assure you that he who told you this knows very little italian himself the song goes exceedingly well with the words one hears the mare and the mare funesto and the passages lead up to minacciar in a way that thoroughly expresses minacciar a threatening in fact it is the finest song in the opera and meets with universal approval the two other male vocalists belonged to the old munich opera honest old panzacci had been an excellent singer and a good actor in his time but his best days were over and valesi too who had a well-deserved reputation as a tenor had almost given up the stage and devoted himself to teaching leopold mozart had reason therefore to write november eleventh seventeen eighty what you tell me of your vocalists is sad and shows that everything must depend on the composition there were no difficulties this time with the female vocalists both the wendlings were friendly and amenable they went mozart's way and were contented with everything he did madame dorothea wendling is archi contentissima with her cena and wanted to hear it three times over he wrote home november eighth seventeen eighty and they were quite in accord about the second song Lissel wendling he wrote soon after november fifteenth seventeen eighty sang her two songs half a dozen times she is thoroughly pleased i have it from a third person that both the wendlings have praised their songs very highly mozart kept up with great industry the work of rehearsing and composing a song for Schikaneder was composed meanwhile although he was suffering from a severe cold the homely remedies which his father ordered brought some alleviation of it but as he was obliged to continue writing the cure was a slow one at munich he fell in with mara who had not long left berlin she is not so fortunate as to please me he writes november thirteenth seventeen eighty she does too little to come up to the bestardina which is her ambition and she does too much to touch the heart like a weber or an expressive singer he was even less edified by the behavior of the husband and wife than by madame mara's singing and writes at a later date november twenty fourth seventeen eighty of the pride insolence and effrontery which were visible in their countenances when mara was to sing at a court concert after the first symphony i saw her lord and master creep behind her with a violoncello in his hand i thought it was going to be a song with obbligato violoncello 
old Danzi, a very good accompanist, is first violoncellist here. All at once old Toshi, conductor when Canabiche is not there, said to Danzi, who is his son-in-law, by the way, "'Stand up and let Mara take your place.' But Canabiche heard him and cried, "'Danzi, stay where you are. The elector likes his own people to play.' And the song proceeded. Herr Mara stood meekly with his violoncello in his hand behind his wife. The song which Mara was singing had a second part, but she went out during the ritonello without acquainting the orchestra with her native air of effrontery, and afterwards complained to the elector. He answered, Madame, you sang like an angel, although your husband did not accompany you and referred her to Count Sio. The first act was rehearsed at the end of November, and Mozart was able to report to his father such success as raised the general expectation to a still higher pitch, December 1st, 1780. The rehearsal went off remarkably well. There were only six violins in all, but the proper wind instruments— no spectators were admitted but Siao's sister and young Count Seinsheim. I cannot tell you how delighted and astonished every one was. It was only what I expected, for I assure you I went to this rehearsal with as light a heart as if it had been a banquet. Count Seinsheim said to me, I assure you I expected much from you, but this I did not expect. The Canabiche family and all who know them are true friends of mine. I went home with Canabiche after the rehearsal. Madame Canabiche met us and embraced me, full of pleasure that the rehearsal had gone off so well. Then came Ram and Lang, half out of their minds with delight. The good lady, my true friend, being alone in the house with her sick rose, had been full of anxiety for me. Ram said to me, if you knew him you would call him a true German, for he says to your face exactly what he thinks. You may believe me when I say that no music ever made such an impression on me, and I thought fifty times what a pleasure it will be to your father to hear this opera. But enough of this. My cold was made rather worse by the rehearsal. One cannot help getting overheated when fame and honor are at stake, however cold-blooded one may naturally be. Wolfgang's father received other confirmation of the success which he did not withhold from his son. Fiala showed me a letter from Beck, which is very eulogistic of the music of your first act. He writes that tears of joy and pleasure came to his eyes when he heard the music, and that everyone declared it was the finest music they had ever heard. All so new and beautiful, etc. He says that the second act is about to be rehearsed, that he will write to me himself, etc. Well, God be thanked, this all looks well. Leopold Mozart, who had been wont to exhort Wolfgang not to procrastinate, as indeed he often did at Salzburg, was now concerned to hear of his obstinate cult, the more so as his sister was suffering from a chest complaint, and he begs him to take care of himself. He was not to hurry over the third act. It would be ready quite in good time." Ready as he always was with good advice, he warns him to remember that an opera should not only please connoisseurs. December eleventh, 1780. I recommend you not to think in your work only of the musical public, but also of the unmusical. You know that there are a hundred ignorant people for every ten true connoisseurs. So do not forget what is called popular, and tickle the long ears. But Wolfgang will not listen to this. As to what is called popular, he answers, December sixteenth, 1780, Do not be afraid. There is music in my opera for all sorts of people, only none for long ears. 
Meantime, the work of rehearsing went steadily forward. On December 16th, in the afternoon, the first and second acts were rehearsed at Count Seo's, the parts being doubled, so that there were twelve violins. All went well, as Wolfgang reported, December 19th, 1780. The orchestra and all the audience gladly acknowledged that, contrary to their expectations, the second act was superior, both in novelty and expression, to the first. Next Saturday the second act is to be rehearsed again, but in a large room in the palace, which I have long desired, for the room at Count Seos is far too small. The elector is to listen incognito in an adjoining apartment. We must rehearse for dear life, then, said Canabiche to me. At the last rehearsal he was bathed in perspiration. You will judge from my letters that I am well and hearty. It is a great thing to come to the end of a great and laborious work, and to feel that one leaves it with honour and fame. This I have almost done, for now nothing is wanting but three songs, and the last chorus of the third act, the overture and the ballet, est adieu parti. The next rehearsal gave even greater satisfaction, December twenty seventh, 1780. The last rehearsal was splendid. It was in a large room in the palace, and the elector was present. This time we had the whole orchestra that belongs to the opera house, of course. After the first act, the elector said bravo out loud, and when I went to pay my respects to him, he said, This opera will be charming. It will certainly do you honor. As he was not sure of being able to remain to the end, we let him hear the concerted song and the storm at the beginning of the second act. These he also approved of in the most kindly manner, and said, laughing, No one would imagine that such great things could come out of such a little head. The other day at his early reception, too, he praised my opera very much. In the evening at court, the elector again spoke in high praise of the music, and Mozart learnt from a sure source that he had said after the rehearsal, i was quite taken by surprise no music ever had such an effect on me it is truly magnificent the news of this success reached salzburg bit by bit all the town is talking of the excellence of your opera his father tells him december twenty fifth seventeen eighty baron lerbach set it going the chancellor's wife told me that she had heard from him that the opera was wonderfully well spoken of everywhere then came beck's letter to fiala which he gave to be read everywhere beck wrote to leopold mozart himself that the storm chorus in the second act is so powerful that none could hear it even in the greatest heat of summer without turning as cold as ice and he praises Dorothea Wendling's concerted song very much. The violinist Esser from Mayence, who had given concerts in Salzburg, wrote from Augsburg concerning the two acts of the opera which he had heard. Che abbia sentito una musica ottima e particolare, universalmente applaudita. In short, writes the father, it would be tedious to tell you all the compliments paid to you. I hope that the third act will have as good an effect, and I do so the more confidently, since all the best situations are here, and the subterranean voices must be startling and terrifying. I hope to be able to say, Finis coronat opus. To this his son answers, over head and ears, in work, December thirtieth, 1780. The third act will be thought at least as good as the other two. I like it infinitely better, and you may justly say, finis coronat opus. But there was plenty to do meantime. Head and hands, he writes, January third, 1781, are full of the third act, 
so that I should not be surprised if I were to turn into a third act myself. It alone has cost me more trouble than the whole opera, for there is not a scene in it that has not peculiar interest." He had the satisfaction of finding, after the rehearsal, that it really was considered to surpass the other two acts. Mozart's anxious father strove to draw his attention to every point that might contribute to success, and particularly cautioned him to keep on good terms with the orchestra. December twenty fifth, 1780 experience of salzburg must necessarily have shown him the importance of this try to keep your orchestra in good humour flatter them and make them devoted to you by praising them i know your way of writing and the unceasing and close attention it exacts from all the instruments it is no joke for the orchestra to be kept on the stretch of their attention for three hours and more every one even the worst fiddler is touched by being praised tete-a-tete and becomes more and more attentive and zealous and these courtesies cost you nothing but a few words but you know it all yourself i only tell you because such things are often forgotten at rehearsal and you will need the friendship and zeal of the whole orchestra when the opera is in Sina. The position is then altered, and the player's attention must be much more intent. You know that they cannot all be friendly towards you. There is always a but and an if to be met with. You say people doubted whether the second act would come up to the first. This doubt being relieved, few will have misgivings for the third act but I will wager my head that there will be some who will doubt whether the music will be as effective in the theatre as in a room, and in that case the greatest zeal and good will are necessary on the part of the orchestra. But the opera was not ready yet. There was to be no ballet, only a divertissement fitting into the plot, and this mozart was as he expressed it to have the honour of composing december thirtieth seventeen eighty i am very glad of it he adds for then the music will be by one master he was hard at work at the cursed dances until the middle of january and had no time to think of anything else not even of his own health it was not until January 18th that he could write, Laos Deo, at last I have come to an end of it. Amid rehearsals and anxious labors, the day of representation drew near. Leopold Mozart had been concerned lest the death of the Empress Maria Theresa on November 29th, 1780, should put a stop to it but Wolfgang reassured him by saying that none of the theatres had been closed on this account. Soon after, he was terrified by a rumour that the Electress was dangerously ill, but discovered this to be a lie from beginning to end. At first, January twentieth, 1781, was fixed for the performance, then the twenty second and finally january twenty ninth the last rehearsal was to be on the twenty seventh wolfgang's birthday he was pleased at the postponements the opera can be oftener and more carefully rehearsed the fame of idomeneo which had reached salzburg even before its performance was a great source of satisfaction to mozart's friends dr prexel for instance wrote to him of the inexpressible satisfaction with which he had learnt the honour done by wolfgang to salzburg and more than one friend undertook the journey to munich in order to be present among these were frau robini and her family two fraulein barassani and fiala from the capelle leopold mozart who was as pleased as a child about the excellence of the orchestra intended to go to munich with his daughter as soon as he could arrange to be absent but as he dared not risk a refusal from the archbishop 
and it was rumoured that the latter meditated a journey to vienna he waited his time it suited him very well that the first performance was postponed until hieronymus had actually left salzburg this being so he set out on january twenty sixth to be present at the last rehearsal and the performance wolfgang had arranged that his father and sister should find accommodation at his own lodging in the bergasse if they would be contented to live for the time like gypsies or soldiers the arrival of mozart's father and sister at munich brings us to a detailed account of the performance of idomeneo and its success the munich literary and miscellaneous news february first seventeen eighty one number nineteen page seventy six announced it briefly as follows on the twenty ninth ultima the opera of idomeneo was performed for the first time in the new opera house the adaptation music and translation all proceed from salzburg the scenery including a view of the harbour and neptune's temple are among the masterpieces of our well-known theatrical architect the herr councillor lorenz quaglio all that we read however of the success of the opera in rehearsal leaves us no doubt that it met with a very favourable reception End of section ten section eleven of the life of mozart volume two this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Life of Mozart, Volume 2, by Otto Jan. Idomeneo, Part 2. As to the sum received by Mozart in payment for Idomeneo, we know nothing but it cannot have been a large one or leopold mozart would not have written december eleventh seventeen eighty how about the score will it not be copied you must be careful as to this for with such a payment the score cannot be given up to which wolfgang answered december sixteenth seventeen eighty i made no ceremony as to the copying of the score but spoke openly on the subject to the count it was always the custom in Mannheim, where the Kapellmeister was well paid besides, to give up the score to the composer. The original score in three volumes is written in a very neat but rapid hand, with scarcely any alterations except a few in the recitatives. As usual, the different numbers are written separately and then put together the double bass part was written larger as in other scores for the convenience of the bass player at the clavier the score was to have been printed at the time as appears from a letter of leopold mozart to breitkopf august tenth seventeen eighty one we were advised to publish the opera printed or engraved either in full score or clavier score subscribers were promised for some thirty copies among whom was his highness prince max of zweibrucken but my son's journey to vienna and the intervening events caused us to postpone the whole affair the music for the ballet which was given with idomeneo has not yet been printed three sixty seven k mozart seems to have set great value on idomeneo three sixty six k even in later years it is certain that soon after he had made good his footing in vienna he exerted himself to have it placed on the stage for which purpose he intended entirely to remodel it unfortunately this project fell through and when in seventeen eighty six a company of distinguished amateurs performed the opera at the residence of prince karl auersberg mozart contented himself with several alterations but did not attempt a complete remodelling later 
and more especially quite recently, Idomeneo has been given from time to time on different stages, without exciting as much interest in the general public as the better-known works of Mozart. The judgment of connoisseurs, on the other hand, has always distinguished it. Both phenomena are comprehensible on a close examination of the distinctive features of the work. Ulibyshev remarks with great justice that it is easy to distinguish in Idomeneo where Mozart has still clung to the formulas of the opera Syria, where he strives to imitate Gluck and the French opera, and where he gives free play to his own independent impulses as an artist. These indications are, of course, not to be met with accurately marked out in the different pieces. Mozart's individuality, in the perfection to which it had now attained, being throughout the very pith of the work. We have seen that the libretto unites the characteristics of Italian and French opera, as far as style is concerned, but that the determining element is the Italian style. We have seen further that the singers, with the exception of the two female characters, belonged to the Italian school, which fact tended to the maintenance of Italian form. It might therefore be expected that Mozart, especially in the songs, should set out from the traditional forms, and only attempt to modify them as far as was possible but the influence of the french original on the opera lay deeper than this and was impressed on its poetry language and nationality italian as these all were in external form let us consider the songs the effort is evident to give a more individual expression to the sentiment arising from the dramatic situation than was usual even with metastasio but the form and construction are only modified, and have retained the specific character of Italian poetry. The rhetoric differs altogether from the rhetoric of French poetry. Indirectly, too, language by its rhythm and accent affects musical construction, and the distinctions between the Italian and French language are strikingly apparent, not only in the recitatives which are governed by the musical character of the language, but in the formation of the melodies, where language must be taken into account as an essential element. But deepest of all lies the difference in the conceptions and ideas of the two nations. The emotions and passions of different nations vary not only in intensity, but in mode of expression and where a truly national art has developed itself, this special character is stamped on all its productions. The Italians express their feelings vividly and accent them strongly, and not only so, but their instinctive love of formula calls forth sharply defined characterization and favors typical developments, as is shown, for instance, in their singularly perfect talent for pantomimic representations. This tendency has had a marked influence on the development of music, particularly of dramatic music in Italy. It still bears a national character, which is not only stamped on it in certain forms and turns of expression, but which is the artistic expression of emotions springing from the very nature of the people. Whoever has heard Italian music performed both by Italian and German singers will readily be convinced that the difference rests not only on style and method, but still more essentially on the peculiarities of the Italian national character. It should not, therefore, be matter for surprise that music, which to Germans appears false or unnatural, should make a much deeper impression on Italians than the merely sensual one which strikes the ear. Mozart's Idomeneo bears this distinctive Italian coloring, as do all his Italian operas, not only in the employment of Italian technicalities and mechanism, 
but in the living breath and fragrance which nothing but an absorption into the national spirit could bestow even as a boy he displayed a delicate sense of national distinctions when in bastien und batien and the finta samples he defined so sharply the limits of german vaudeville and of opera buffa if zaidi is compared with idomeneo the fundamental distinctions of conception and style are not less definitely marked and the same was the case later in the entfurung and the zauberflaut in figaro don giovanni cosifantute and tito to give only one example one of the most beautiful and affecting scenes that mozart ever wrote is that in which idomeneo at the request of the high priest indicates his son as the sacrifice demanded by the gods and all the people break out into lamentations and yet this chorus twenty four is a most unmistakable instance of the italian form and style places like giaregna la morta appear typical of similar modes of expression which occur so frequently in italian operas but the italian mould in which mozart's work is cast and on which the harmony of the whole depends is not consciously put forward as a national colouring it proceeds from such an intimate acquaintance with the italian style as was then considered the proper foundation for musical studies and was only possible so long as italian music bore actual sway in german churches and theatres and found no contradiction in the national consciousness this sway was undisputed in south germany during mozart's youth and period of artistic development the musical atmosphere in which he grew up the elements of culture which were offered to him were thoroughly italian and italian conceptions and fashions had become second nature to him as to all other german artists who took part in the development of italian opera during the last century the relation in which an artistic genius stands to his time and nation is difficult to grasp far from shunning the influences of either his genius displays itself in his power of representing their significant features and tendencies with force and vigour amounting even to one-sidedness and then again it sets itself in opposition to them and struggles until it rules and determines them anew it would be a hard task indeed to fathom the nature of an artist to that point where the threads of his personal powers and proclivities and those of the cultivation of his time and nation are so interwoven that they appear as the root of his artistic individuality we must be content with tracing onward the path of his development although mozart's training had so imbued him with the spirit of italian music that its essence appeared to him as the essence of music itself yet he transformed the elements which he had so absorbed with the whole force of his individuality he did not consciously adopt them as national neither did he oppose them from motives of patriotism and seek to substitute a german style his individuality joined issue with the elements of an art ready to hand in full development and produced works of art which were genuinely italian and also genuinely mozart the fresh new life which had awakened in german poetry and which first caused a consciousness of national existence to show itself in the realm of art touched mozart at a time when his musical education was already firmly grounded he could therefore without self-contradiction continue along the trodden path and carry on the development of the italian opera as a settled form of art which he had made his own in the truest sense but the impulse of german art laid hold as we shall see of his innermost being 
and gave him clear consciousness of his capabilities as a german artist granted that the german element of his nature with which he could never dispense remained latent and inactive while he appropriated italian art as his own yet all that he so took was treated as his own free property and turned to account with german thought and feeling while thus the german school of music was partly founded partly endued with new life by him he brought italian opera to a climax as far as its universal application was concerned after mozart it became more exclusively national like every genius who has made his mark in the history of art he casts his glance over the past as well as into the future to him it was given to concentrate the living elements of italian music into works of mature perfection in art and setting to work with freshly tempered force to turn to account the youthful impulses of german music and lead them towards the goal of artistic freedom and beauty thus in idomeneo we recognize the genuinely italian character of the opera syria brought to its highest perfection by the force of mozart's perfectly cultivated individuality but in details we still perceive the ascendancy of traditional form to which the artist was obliged to yield it is most unmistakably present in the two songs allotted to arbace the part of confidant was intended both musically and dramatically as a stop-gap it served as a foil for the more important characters and was a principal adjunct in the production of that chiaroscuro which was considered as essential to scenic effect on this account arbace's two songs eleven twenty two are not woven into the dramatic web of the opera either in words or music some concessions were doubtless made to panzacci a clever and accomplished singer of the old school and there is no lack of runs jumps and similar feats for display of execution the songs follow the old fashion in other ways also except that they have only one tempo and a structure modified accordingly as for instance in the introduction of cadenzas a very long ritornello of the second song is afterwards shortened at both ends but in order to give them some musical interest the accompaniment although weak in instrumentation is carefully worked out in counterpoint especially in the second song the preceding accompanied recitative in composing which mozart plainly had panzacci in view is fine and expressive dal prato also for whom the part of idamante was intended had only the knowledge of an italian singer and that in no considerable degree mozart was again therefore fettered by tradition and could venture little to render the song more original and lifelike in all the three songs for this character three eight and twenty seven the old type is clearly to be recognized the first if the singer had had a powerful execution which he avowedly had not would probably have been an ordinary bravura song it has the general plan of one but is without the bravura passages the emphasis is laid on the accompaniment which is independent and interesting throughout the constant use of the wind instruments supplies it with fine sound effects the frequent changes of time the construction of the song being in all other respects very regular is intended to give animation to the expression the second air is shorter to suit the situation more lively and energetic in expression but equally dependent on the accompaniment for originality and interest the third adheres to the old form by the introduction of a slow middle movement larghetto three four and the accompaniment is simpler but the song as a whole is conciser than was the fashion formerly 
Roff's advanced age would have prevented his satisfying any very great expectations, but he was also, as Mozart complained, so wedded to his old jog-trot ideas that it was enough to drive one crazy. He was obliged, therefore, in the very important part of Idomeneo, to submit to much that was against his convictions and inclinations. But Raff was an accomplished and sensible singer, from whom much could be looked for in respect of delivery and expression. His first air, six, vividly expresses deep and painful feeling in two tolerably short and precise movements, an andantino sostenuto, three, four, and allegro di molto, five. It is dramatically quite in its place, and gives opportunity to the singer to display a well-trained voice. The detached, sharply defined motifs, united by interludes, remind us of the old style, but they are very cleverly arranged and carried out. And the treatment of the wind instruments gives a splendidly sonorous and yet subdued effect to the orchestra which was then quite novel and must have been remarkably impressive the second air thirteen is a long bravura song in one movement allegro maestoso in the grand style mozart calls it the most splendid song of the opera and protests vigorously against the idea that it was not written for the words but more was demanded from the singer than raff was able to give it has the proper heroic character of the opera seria and affords opportunity for the display of vocal art in sustained passages long notes and bravura passages the last are completely obsolete but mozart was right to think well of the song it is full of expression and character interesting through its rich and brilliant accompaniment and containing especially in the middle movement surprising beauties of harmony how striking and expressive is for instance this harmonic transition page illustrated the third air thirty which mozart endeavoured to write to please his old friend is on that very account quite after the old pattern it has great resemblance to the song which Mozart had so accurately fitted to Raff at Mannheim. The chief movement is a broadly sustained adagio, simple and noble in tone, and giving opportunity to the singer to display sustained singing, the effect of which is enhanced by a figured accompaniment, shared between the strings and the wind instruments. The middle movement, Allegretto 3-8, is of less importance. A sketch which has been preserved of this song affords a good example of Mozart's method of work. The ritornellos, the voice and the bass, are all fully noted. Probably he submitted the sketch to Raff before elaborating the song. It coincides in all but a few unimportant alterations with the later elaboration. He wished at first to compose the words of the middle movement in the same time and measure as the first movement. After four bars, however, which he erased, he wrote the middle movement as it at present stands. In spite of the restrictions laid upon him in this far from inconsiderable part of the opera, Mozart's progress since the repastore is very marked. What we now find is not the struggle of youthful genius against obsolete and hampering forms, but a conscious compliance with them on definite grounds, by means of which the composer strives to extract all the good possible from his unfavorable circumstances, and knows exactly how far he can go. It is difficult, however, now that the tradition of these forms is wholly lost, to decide with certainty how much is due to the insensible effect of custom, and how much to the conscious labor of the artist those pieces in which mozart could act without control make an entirely different impression to these belong the parts of ilia and electra 
bravura has a decided place in the conception of the latter but with an individual colouring of passion which mozart has made free use of as the characterising element the two great airs five twenty nine are the vivid expression of a glowing impulsive nature which is raised by an admixture of haughty dignity above that vulgarity into which violent outbreaks of jealousy and revenge so readily fall in spite of the text which puts the traditional bombastic pathos into the mouth of electra twenty nine doreste de jaceo in seno e tormenti deleto la fase di morte mi da Squarciatemi il core sereste serpenti. The composer has succeeded in infusing character and individuality into the song. The two songs are allied in subject, but their treatment is different. While in the first passion ferments, as it were, and breaks forth in separate bursts, the second is a continuous stream of wild rage and calls for the more particular employment of the higher notes of the voice purely executive display is not sought after with the exception of one passage going up to c in alto and very expressive if well sung but a passionate well declaimed delivery is taken for granted throughout occasionally the voice part is more declamatory than melodious and the effect is provided for by a rapid succession of striking harmonies how wonderfully affecting for instance is the passionate outcry illustrated page the orchestra has an altogether novel function as a means of musical characterization it goes its independent way side by side with the voice interesting by virtue of the singular vitality of its accompanying passages and its own motifs and its masterly tone colouring gives body and force to the whole composition in the first air all is restless motion we have the flutes in broken chords flashes of sound like lightning from the wind instruments and only at certain points are the forces united into a concentrated expression of emotion how striking again is the effect in the last song when after the long torturing shake passage for the violins the united orchestra bursts forth into a very transport of revengeful feeling electra's middle song fourteen is in strong contrast to the passionate outbursts of the other two here her happy love seems to fill her very being she breathes forth a calm serenity and tender sweetness as if there could be no place in her heart for jealousy and revenge the voice part with the exception of one ornamental passage resembling the string quartet accompaniment is very simple rightly delivered the expression of satisfied affection will be found quite in accord with electra's character in the character of Ilya, Mozart has followed his natural bent. It is full of sentiment, tender and graceful, without any violent passion. It was played by the excellent actress and singer Dorothea Wendling. Here Mozart had free scope, and in her songs, 2, 12 and 19, we find the finest expression of his manner as an artist. In the first air, 2, we find the simplest means lying ready to hand employed to give dramatic effect such for instance is the alternation of major and minor key for the principal subject the climax produced by its repetition the different ways in which the exclamation gracia is treated etc not only are we affected by the charm of beautiful and graceful ideas but the expedients of formal construction become the natural expression of the innermost feelings of the heart the second air twelve is a cavatina having two verses repeated with trifling alterations and accompanied by four obligato wind instruments viz flute oboe horn and bassoon 
besides the string quartet mozart's old mannheim friends wendling ram lang and ritter were together again and he was delighted to write a piece that should do honour to them and to him there can be no question as to his success the first impression is one of the purest melody filling the musical listener with perfect satisfaction a nearer examination shows as much to admire in the simplicity of the artistic structure the symmetry of which in reading the score is displayed as it were on a ground plan and in the delicate use of sound effects as in the tenderness and grace of the conception let us consider the situation Ilia comes to thank Idomeneo for the kindness which she, as a captive, has received in Crete. She is embarrassed by the remembrance that she has lost her father and her fatherland, that Idomeneo is her ruler and the father of Idamante, and more than all by the consciousness of her love for Idamante and yet this very love sheds for her a rosy light on all around. She begins, then, with a composed, almost reverential address, and as her feelings grow more intense, the remembrance of her sorrows returns, but all gives way to the one feeling, Orgioja y contento, in which she altogether loses herself such a combination of different elements into a harmonious whole constitutes a true work of art and it must needs be found beautiful as long as the principles of music remain what they are the situation of the last air nineteen is less striking it is the longing sigh of a deserted lover but the main features of Ilya's character have already been so clearly defined that her singular charm is as indelibly impressed here as elsewhere. It is only necessary to compare the air, 14, in which Electra expresses her tenderest feelings, to perceive how the essential distinctions between the two women are characterized by the music. The duet for the two lovers... 20b is interesting and pleasing but not very striking in form and change of tempo as well as in conception and treatment it adheres to the old established custom of making a love duet light and graceful it proceeds in unbroken movement and precise form throughout and there is no true bravura the terzet seventeen is more striking noble and simple and of fine musical effect but the dramatic situation is not brought to expression in the full energy of which it is capable it is certainly placed with design between a succession of pleasing situations and of more agitated ones its calm and earnest mood fitly concludes what has gone before and prepares the mind for what is to follow without unduly diminishing the effect of surprise in the situation as here presented the three characters are all in a depressed and anxious mood which restrains any lively outburst of emotion and justifies the moderation of the musical rendering the quartet twenty one takes a higher place as regards invention and characterization mozart himself preferred it and rejected any interference from the singers in its composition as decidedly as he gave way to them in the songs it was not an easy task to write a quartet for three sopranos and a tenor but mozart's accurate knowledge of the capabilities of the voices and his skilful combinations enabled him to command the most original and beautiful sound effects we must admire too his genius in marking out a distinct plan within the limits of which he moves at his ease and in giving sharp touches of character without disturbing the unity of the piece ilia and idamante stand in natural contrast to idomeneo and electra and each individual is accurately characterized this is most apparent where they all sing together and gives life and significance to the music 
Besides the independent treatment of the voices, the quartet is especially distinguished by harmonic beauties of an uncommon kind, and undeniably belongs to Mozart's finest performances. His wife relates that once, when singing in this quartet, he was so deeply affected that he was obliged to desist, and for a long time would not look at the composition again. The conclusion is original and appropriate. Idamante's commencement is that of a man who has made up his mind. Andre Ramingo y Solo, however, dies away with the words Marte Cercando into gloomy meditations. At the close he again announces Andro Ramingo y Solo and leaves the scene while the orchestra continues to express gloom and sadness dying away gradually into silence. The chorus forms a principal feature of Idomeneo. There is an important difference, however, between those choruses which actually belong to the plot, and express the meaning of the situation with emphasis, and those which are only superficially connected with the plot, and serve principally for ornament. These last are mostly in connection with the ballet, and should be placed side by side with the ballet music. Such are the first chorus, four, during which the Trojan captives are loosed from their fetters, the closing chorus during Idamante's coronation, and most especially the chorus at the end of the first act, ten, in which we should not fail to recognize dance music even without the superscription siacona and the express indication of the libretto the orchestra has a more independent part here than in the two other choruses the character of them all is fresh and cheerful as with a man rejoicing in the fullness of his health and strength everything is stirring and full of sound and bustle so it is with these choruses, which, without any striking qualities, are thoroughly effective where they stand. The charming chorus previous to the embarkation of Electra and Idamante is more characteristic, and seems to mirror the cheerful heavens and the calm sea, together with Electra's happy frame of mind. Very happy in expression are the verses which Electra sings between the choruses, simple, clear, and full of grace and delicacy. But the remaining choruses, which are more properly dramatic, are incomparably more important, grand, and earnest. The first, five, representing the shipwreck of Idomeneo, is a double chorus for male voices, one chorus in the distance is in four parts. The other, nearer, is in two parts. The former is mostly in unison, the latter imitative. Each chorus is complete in itself and quite independent of the other, but the two together form an artistic, clearly apprehended whole. The orchestra contrasts with it as a solid mass, the stringed instruments belonging more especially to the second, and the wind instruments to the first chorus. It falls to the orchestra to depict the storm, and there are plenty of chromatic scales for the purpose. But the effect depends chiefly on bold and forcible harmonies. How little Mozart shunned difficulties and obstacles may be proved by several parts of this scene, the following passage, among others, illustrated page. Still more powerful are the choruses which close the second act. Again there arises a storm, the sea monster appears, and horror seizes the people. While the orchestra is in constant agitation, the chorus interposes en masse, partly in full chords, partly in effective unison. The succession of striking harmonies reaches its height in the four times repeated question, Il Reo Quaye, which closes with a pause on a dissident chord repeated like an echo by all the wind instruments. Such a magnificent and agitating effect 
as is attained by this concentration into one point of every musical expedient without overstepping the boundaries of the beautiful had scarcely been heard in any opera and mozart himself never surpassed it the concluding chorus which follows an accompanied recitative for idomeneo is of an entirely different character expressive of a flight winged by fear and horror the twelve eight time seldom used by mozart is suited to the expression of haste and agitation and so also is the generally independent and partially imitative treatment of the voices they only unite sometimes into an outcry of horror otherwise they make detached exclamations and each goes his way in hurried confusion until all are dispersed the chorus in the third act twenty four expresses a totally different sentiment in equally grand style when after the effective appeal of the high priest idomeneo discloses his obligation to sacrifice his son the people still discontented and murmuring are struck with grief and horror the intensity and almost over wealth of beauty with which these emotions are expressed give the music as we have already remarked the national stamp of the italian opera we may learn from this chorus how in a true work of art the universal emotions of the human heart may be blended with the peculiarities of national and individual life and transported into the realm of pure art the effect of unison at the words gia la morte expressing the depressed murmur of the people is wonderfully fine the chromatic triplet passage of the accompaniment seeks meanwhile in vain to raise the fainting spirits higher this motif passes finally into the calm confidence of the high priest's prayer and the touchingly beautiful orchestral conclusion lets a ray of light on to this dispirited mood but the climax has not yet reached its highest point after a simple but wonderfully effective march there follows a prayer for idomeneo and the priest which is a complete masterpiece whether we consider its truthful expression of emotion its rich and original orchestral accompaniment or the combination in it of the various elements which produce the total effect we can here merely indicate the short chorus of priests which remains in unison in the one key of c while the instruments the strings pizzicato in a harp-like movement the wind instruments in characteristic passages proceed in varied harmonies from c minor to f major whereupon the voices sink to f and keep this key while the orchestra gives out the solemn and quieting chords of the so-called church ending b minor f major it is much to be regretted that after this chorus the opera follows the usual course of opera seria and leaves important dramatic situations unused for the purposes of musical representation if according to the original design the remaining chief situations had been wrought together into a duet for ilia and iramante and a quartet we should then possess masterpieces of grand dramatic music at the close of the opera instead of this separate songs have been detached from their context in order to satisfy the singers the grandiose and free treatment of the choruses both in the voice parts and the accompaniments places them almost on a level with those of conic thamos but a more condensed and pregnant style of music was required in the opera than in conic thamos where the connection with the drama was loose and superficial mindful of this consideration mozart while giving the choruses free scope for musical execution never allows them to stand independent of and apart from the words 
End of Section 11section 12 of the life of mozart volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by rita butros the life of mozart volume 2 by otto jan idomeneo part 3 a reminiscence of French opera is evident in the treatment of the recitatives, as well as in the important part allotted to the chorus. The groundwork of the dialogue is, as usual, in secco recitative, but accompanied recitative is more often employed as introductory to the songs than formally and it is also made use of as the most fitting vehicle for passionate or agitated soliloquies such as that of idomeneo after the appearance of the monster eighteen or for solemn and pathetic appeals such as that of the high priest twenty two also at different points of the dialogue where the sentiment rises above the tone of ordinary speech the accompanied recitative interrupts the secco for a longer or shorter interval and gives the dialogue increased power and animation the treatment of this kind of recitative is always free it passes from sharply accented declamation into more or less elaborate melodious song in the same way the orchestra sometimes serves simply as supporting accompaniment sometimes suggests in an interlude or carries out more fully the expression of feeling excited by the words a truly inexhaustible wealth of striking and from many points of view interesting features and beautiful motifs displays itself in these recitatives very fine for instance is the anticipation in electra's recitative of the principal subject of the following song how suggestive it is when idomeneo ilia having just left him expresses the conviction that she loves idamante in the characteristic motif of her song by which doubtless she has betrayed her love weaving it in the most striking manner into the interlude of his soliloquy the variety and wealth of harmonic transitions in these recitatives is astonishing mozart's originality is displayed by the way in which he gathers to a point the scattered and fugitive emotions of the various parts so as to form a consistent hull there is not a note which stands alone every separate touch becomes for him a motif capable of further development and each in its own measure contributes to express the situation the subjects are not strung upon a thread they are moulded into a homogeneous entity the effect of the melodrama lingers in the dramatic character of the instrumental interludes which is sharply emphasized by the great variety of orchestral tone coloring an example of such character painting is afforded by the prelude to the high priest's recitative twenty three which is in close connection with the scene which is being enacted on the stage it begins maestoso with a rapid flourish of trumpets drums and horns the king enters with his followers then a largo of two bars length stringed instruments and bassoons the priests enter finally an agitated passage for the violins the people throng tumultuously upon the stage then also we have not only the stringed quartet with occasional use of one or other wind instrument in the recitatives but wherever it seems advisable the whole orchestra is employed the wind instruments serving to accent and light up the most varied combinations this brings us to one of the most remarkable features of idomeneo which at the time rendered the work a true phenomenon and which even now excites admiration and appears worthy of study the treatment of the orchestra 
it was to be expected that mozart having at his disposal a well-appointed and excellently trained orchestra would develop with partiality the instrumental side of his great work in point of fact the orchestral portions of idomeneo are richer more brilliant and more carefully carried out even to the smallest details than was ever again the case in his later works the composition of the orchestra is quite the same as that which he employed in after times except that he occasionally has four horns as on some former occasions but not in vienna he disposed freely of all the forces at his command not contenting himself any longer with accentuating different parts by means of richer instrumentation but maintaining throughout a more brilliant and forcible instrumental colouring and allowing the choice and use of means to be determined only by the particular subject which was to be represented in this manner he kept himself within the bounds of moderation and reserved certain resources for definite effects for instance flutes are employed only in the storm eighteen trombones only for the oracle twenty eight in the choruses to conic thamos on the contrary the trombones are in frequent use as they were later with similar effect in the zauberflaut so decidedly had mozart even at that time fixed the character of this instrument but he was particularly careful so to distribute his effects that the ear should never be either overexcited or overfatigued for instance in the two storm scenes five eighteen there are no trumpets and drums they first occur in the flight scene which is quite different in character and again in the dance choruses ten thirty two when festive brilliancy is required also in the morning chorus where they are muffled which modifies the effect in a very original manner these observations might advantageously be carried into detail but it will suffice here to point out that mozart's moderation in the use of his instrumental forces any unusual enrichment being more easily perceived in this quarter than in any other arises neither from meagreness of invention nor from a calculated singularity but that he adopts it with clear views and firm control of his own powers mozart has in idomeneo laid the foundation of all modern instrumentation which has since only been developed in detail unhappily overdeveloped and perverted but the most delicate perception of material sound effect can only produce superficial results it should serve merely as a cooperating element in true artistic production the instruments in the hand of an artist are only transmitters of the musical idea in its fixed construction and embodiment and the same loving care which the master displays over harmonious and thematic elaboration or characteristic expression appears in his efforts to work on the senses of his hearers by means of beautiful orchestral effects but although the orchestra is perfectly independent it must not be forgotten that it works side by side with the voices serving as foreground and background for them and never made so prominent as to cause the voices to appear only like the accessories in a landscape three marches are characteristic each in its own way the first nine is a brilliant festival march belonging by its style to the ballet which follows the second fifteen which is introduced in the charming way already noticed is mainly effective by its gradual approach new instruments falling in at each repetition and adding to its force and tone colouring at first the trumpets and drums are muted as in the concluding chorus in conic thamos the simplest and most beautiful of the marches is the third 
twenty-five, which fills a necessary pause in the scenic arrangements, but which is full of beautiful expression. The employment of the violoncellos is very original. They go, for the most part, with the double basses, but two octaves higher, which produces an excellent effect. The music to the ballet may most fitly be noticed here. It consists of the following numbers. Number 1. Chacon, D major. Pas de deux de Madame Hardy et Monsieur Antoine. Pas de sous de Madame Falguera. An elaborate movement with which is connected an equally elaborate larghetto. B flat major. Pas de seul pour Madame Artigue. To a tolerably long annonce succeeds the chacon pour le ballet, partly repeated and concluding with a crescendo. Number two. Pas de seul de Monsieur le Grand. D major. This begins with a pathetic intrad largo leading to a neat and compact allegretto which was omitted in performance this is followed by a very animated piu allegro and concluded by another piu allegro pour le ballet with a twice repeated triplet passage in long drawn crescendo rising from pianissimo to fortissimo intensified by suspensions and which is enough to make one giddy Number three, pas pied, B flat major, pour Madame Radouin, short and simple, but very neat and graceful, and quite in dance form. Number four, gavotte, G major, not elaborated, delicate and graceful. A very good effect is produced by the simple imitation of the violoncello, which is carried out in harmony in the third part. Number five, Pascai, E flat major. This piece was intended for further elaboration with a pas de seul for Monsieur Antoine, and a pas de deux, Madame Felguera et Monsieur le Grand, but it was considered too long. Mozart only planned two longer portions without completing them, and in performance the whole pas de deux was omitted. The traditional style of the different dances, as they are known to us from the suites of Handel and Bach, has been preserved in their rhythmical structure, and also in other characteristics. The Paspide, for instance, would have its own place in every suite, and so also would the Gavotte. Besides this, the whole of the ballet music in Idomeneo is similar to corresponding movements in the opera fresh melodious and appropriate throughout but it is easy to see that mozart was aware that the delicate details and the orchestral treatment that are present throughout the opera would not be in place here it is true that he has done justice to himself in the free and flowing arrangement of parts and the animated grouping of the instruments and true also that delicate harmonious transitions constantly betray the hand of a master. But he was well aware that he must depend chiefly for light and shade on sharp pregnant rhythm and strong emphasis. With this view, trumpets and drums are not spared. But the orchestra, with the exception of some separate strong strokes, is seldom used en masse. There are few attempts after peculiar effects through unusual instrumental combinations, and only in the gavotte does a solo violoncello occur, and that in very modest fashion. The influence of the ballet master is apparent from the fact that there are many more erasures and alterations in this than in any other part of the opera. In the overture, a magnificent piece, Mozart altogether abandoned the old forms. It is in one lively movement, and maintains its character as an introduction, by not coming to a proper conclusion, but passing immediately into the first scene. A certain typical tone of heroic solemnity is heard in the first bars, and reiterated more than once afterwards 
but the whole is governed by a severe earnestness expressed by the frequent occurrence of the minor key and by the strong but beautiful dissonances the middle subject on the contrary begins a gentle plaint in a minor which is calmed and relieved by the wonderfully beautiful introduction of the key of c major enhanced in effect by variety of tone colouring if we gather together the results of our observations of idomeneo we cannot fail to discern in it the work of a master who has arrived at the maturity of his powers while still in the full bloom of youth it was only his submission to those restraints which seemed unavoidable which prevented his freeing the opera seria from the conventionalities which formed indeed no essential part of its being even had he succeeded in doing so it would have involved no renunciation of its national character which as we have seen in no way fettered mozart's individuality but since in the improvements he made he was indebted to french opera and especially to gluck the question arises how much and in what way mozart had learnt from the great parisian master it is not merely unquestionable that gluck exerted a general influence over mozart's opinions and tendencies but the traces of a close study of his works and especially of alceste may be easily discovered he had been present as a boy at the first representation of alceste its influence is apparent in many details such as the harmonic treatment of the oracle and the use of sustained chords for the horns and trombones in the accompaniment to the appeal of the high priest the march in alceste has served as a model for the style if not for the execution of the last march in idomeneo the high priest's soliloquy is altogether analogous in plan and treatment to that of gluck's high priest again the recurring subject of the interlude page illustrated reminds us of the corresponding one in alceste and other similarities may be detected more important is the similarity of dramatic style which is especially evident in the treatment of the recitatives and in the share taken by the orchestra in the characterization but that mozart learnt from gluck only as one master learns from another and that he turned his borrowed pound to rich account it needs but a closer consideration of these details as well as of the whole work to make plain we must not underrate the wholesome and powerful effect which grand and important works must have made upon him and the enlightenment and correction of his views as to the nature of the opera thereby obtained but we must also remember that mozart received these impressions and this instruction into a nature self-dependent and productive and that his artistic cultivation enabled him to appropriate only what was in accordance with his nature gluck sets aside the fixed expressions of operatic form as far as is practicable in order to gain perfect freedom of dramatic action mozart on the other hand strives to spare these forms and so to mould and develop them that they may themselves serve as vehicles for dramatic expression this he does not because he clings to what is old and established but with the just perception that these forms contain an essential element of artistic construction which is capable of development mozart never seeks as gluck did to forget that he is a musician on the contrary he remembers it at every point of his artistic production and could not ignore the fact if he would in opposition to the one-sided requirements of dramatic characterization he falls back upon the principles of musical construction which are far from contradicting such requirements and are in fact the higher power which establishes them 
on these grounds we assert that mozart's creative power in music to which we must first turn our glance in judging an artist was more universal and deeper than that of gluck that he surpassed him in artistic cultivation and discipline will be doubted by no one who compares the technical work the disposition of the orchestra etc in idomeneo with gluck's operas this judgment does not exclude the fact that some of gluck's performances as an artist are not only grand and striking but surpass kindred works by mozart but if the laws and nature of art are once perceived a more certain rule is provided for the judgment of the work of art as well as of the artist and here mozart may bear away the palm mozart's leave of absence was not extorted from the archbishop without difficulty and it was limited to six weeks the better satisfied he became with his life in munich where he found friends appreciation and enlightenment the more appalling grew the prospect of returning to salzburg and he was in terror lest the archbishop should recall him even before the performance of the opera with this idea he writes to his father december sixteenth seventeen eighty apropos how about the archbishop next monday i shall have been absent from salzburg for six weeks you know my dear father that it is only for love of you that i remain in salzburg for by heaven if it rested with me i would have torn up the agreement and resigned my appointment before i left home this time it is not salzburg but the prince and the proud nobility who become more insupportable to me every day i should hail with delight a letter informing me that he no longer needed my services the patronage i have here would assure me of present and future means of support without taking into account the chances by death which none ought to count upon but which is no bad friend to a man in search of employment but anything in the world to please you and it would come all the easier to me if i could get away now and then for a little to take breath you know how hard it was to get away this time and that without some great cause there is no possibility of it again come to munich and hear my opera and then tell me if i am wrong to feel unhappy when i think of salzburg his father seeks to reassure him as to the leave of absence december twenty fifth seventeen eighty as regards the six weeks i have decided not to take any steps in the matter but if i hear anything on the subject i shall certainly answer that we understood you were to remain in munich six weeks after the composition of the opera for its rehearsal and production but that i could not imagine that his highness would suppose that such an opera could be composed copied and performed in six weeks etc it would not however have been a matter of regret to leopold mozart if wolfgang could have met with a good situation in munich wolfgang himself had been rendered full of hope from the gracious reception of the elector and wrote to his father that if he succeeded in settling in munich he the father must not long remain in salzburg but must follow him thither he was very anxious to demonstrate in munich that he could write other things besides operas and he turned his church music to account with this object he wrote to his father november thirteenth seventeen eighty be so kind as to send me the scores of the two masses that i have at home and also the mass in b flat major two seventy five k for count seo has promised to speak of them to the elector i should like to make myself known in this style i have just heard a mass by grua kapellmeister in seventeen seventy nine died eighteen twenty six it would be easy to compose half a dozen a day of that kind of thing 
Mozart also appears to have tried to win favor with the elector by a new church composition, at least a grand curie in D minor, 341k, judging by the character of the composition and the distribution of the orchestra, can only have been written during this stay in Munich. The orchestra consists of the usual string quartet, and, in addition, two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, two bassoons, four horns, in D and F, two trumpets, and drums. There is no grouping of the kind that is found in Idomeneo. Whether this is a fragment of a mass which was never completed, or whether it was intended for insertion in another work, cannot now be decided. It is tolerably long, but elaborated without much thematic treatment, the elements of the construction and flow being more rhythmical and harmonic, and taking their principal charm from the independent and richly elaborated orchestral accompaniment. Among Mozart's sacred compositions, his curies are specially distinguished by an originality of tone coloring and peculiarly melodious treatment, which are extremely well suited to the melancholy tone of the movement before us. Much of it points to the requiem and opens the door to conjecture as to the path which Mozart would have pursued had he devoted himself specially to church music. Another great work, apparently written for the Munich Kapelle, is a grand serenata for wind instruments, 361k, with the date 1780 which he must have taken with him, since he would hardly have undertaken so important a work while engaged on Idomeneo. The serenata is for two oboes, two clarinets, two viols, four horns, two bassoons, violoncello, and double bass. The instruments and the task appointed for them point rather to the Munich orchestra than to that of Salzburg, Compositions for wind instruments alone, called harmonie musique, were then much in favor, and Mozart may have wished to recommend himself by producing an important piece of the kind, which would place the performances of the band in a brilliant light. In form, the serenata resembles those written for the complete orchestra. It begins with a solemn largo, which serves as introduction to a molto allegro, worked out very like the first movement of a symphony. This is followed by a minuet with two trios, then a broadly planned adagio, and again a minuet with three trios. To this is joined a romanza adagio, simple and lyrical, in two parts, interrupted by an allegretto, leading again to the adagio, which is repeated and concluded by a coda. Then comes an andante with six variations, and the finale, consisting of a cheerful rondo. It is no easy task to write such a succession of pieces for wind instruments, for the tone coloring, although striking and agreeable, must be moderately and carefully treated. People were certainly more accustomed to this kind of music at the time. But even at the present day, the serenata does not produce a sense of fatigue. It has an interest as a proof of the minute study which Mozart bestowed on all instrumental forces, whereby he acquired that complete mastery of the orchestra which is displayed in Idomeneo. But the work has a higher significance than that of a mere study of instrumentation, as is shown by the admiration it has excited in many places quite recently. The charm of the composition depends greatly upon the certainty with which the peculiar style of each instrument is made use of, but this forms only one side of the artistic construction of the idea, and the full force and beauty of the instrumental effects are only perceived when they are considered as a means of representing each part of the whole work in its due proportion. 
great delicacy and diversity are shown in the grouping and treatment of the different instruments the first players naturally undertake the chief parts the accompaniment falling to the secondary players but the disposition of parts is so free and independent that the difference is not always apparent all the movements are well planned and constructed rich in delicate and interesting touches of harmonic or thematic elaboration and in general fresh and tuneful the crown of them is the adagio, in which the musical expression of deep and earnest feeling rises to a purity and height which is impossible to the specified representations of certain frames of mind now in fashion. We here attain, by means of artistic catharsis, as Aristotle calls it, purging, purifying, to an absolute freedom and satisfaction which it is granted to man to feel only in the perfect harmony and beauty of art the means by which this highest of all effects is reached are so simple that a dissection of them would only be a confirmation of the old scripture that the letter killeth and the spirit giveth life as long as mozart was engaged on the composition and study of his opera he had no time for recreation and his visits were confined to the cannabiche family after the performance he refreshed himself by entering with his father and sister into the carnival gaieties and by cheerful intercourse with his friends but the latter did not allow him to remain long in idleness to please his good friend Ram, he wrote a quartet for oboe, violin, tenor, and violoncello, 370K, obligato throughout for the oboe, but otherwise easy and light in design and execution. For his patroness, the Countess Baumgarten, he composed on March 8, 1781, a concert aria, 369K, Misera dove son from Mestasio's Ezio, three twelve, which gives a favorable idea of the vocal performances of this lady. It makes no great demands on the compass of the voice or execution, but the recitative and air are both earnest and serious, and require in every respect an excellent delivery. The instrumentation is simple, only flutes and horns being added to the quartet. Mozart's longer stay in Munich was rendered possible by the archbishop's journey to Vienna, which was probably occasioned by the death of the empress. He wished to appear with all the pomp of a spiritual prince, and took with him a considerable retinue of courtiers and servants as well as some of his most distinguished musicians. Wolfgang rejoiced at this fortunate circumstance, and enjoyed himself so much in Munich that he confessed later to his father, May 26, 1781, In Munich, it is true, I was a little too gay, but I can assure you on my honor that before the opera was on the boards, I went to no theater and visited no one but Cannabiche, I exceeded a little afterwards, I own, but it was through youthful folly. I thought to myself, where are you to go? To Salzburg? Well then, enjoy yourself while you can. His father was full of thought for him even now. He wrote from Munich to Breitkopf, February 12th, 1781. I have long desired that you should publish some work by my son. You will not, I am sure, judge of him now by the clavier sonatas which he wrote while still a child. You cannot have seen a note of what he has written for some years past, unless it may be the six sonatas for clavier and violin, which were engraved at Paris. We have allowed very little to appear. You might make the experiment with a couple of symphonies or clavier sonatas, or else with quartets, trios etc you should only give us a few copies in return as i am anxious that you should see my son's manner of work 
but do not imagine that I wish to over-persuade you. The thought has frequently occurred to me, because I see so much published and in print that moves me to pity. Wolfgang did not return to Salzburg. His gay life in Munich was interrupted by a summons from the Archbishop to Vienna. There he accordingly arrived on March 12th, and there his destiny was to be fulfilled. End of section 12